If you're looking to further understand the mind, consciousness, the occult, symbolism, the ancient Egyptian mythos, philosophy, and truth discovery, make sure to tune in to the Cubbyhole podcast hosted by myself, Nate Cap, and co-hosted by Brandon Martin. The Cubbyhole podcast is a repository of critical knowledge that deals with and covers the many facets of the human condition, especially what causes most of the suffering going on in this world. Make sure to start at podcast number one and work your way forward for maximum value and understanding. The Cubbyhole podcast is found on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, TuneIn Radio, Simplecast, and Cubbyhole.com. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. Morning, people. Welcome to the second day of the Seed for Growth Conference. I'm so excited to have this event um, kicking off with another epic or spectacular day with great presenters, uh, with you know information ranging from knowledge about consciousness, mind control, truth, spirituality, Freemasonry, the Egyptian mythology. Uh, There's just such a plethora of knowledge coming to us from all these great presenters today. And do it live. Go ahead, Doug. Welcome to the second day of the Seed Conference event. We've got a jam packed lineup in store for you today. For you today. Many great speakers. Many great speakers. I'll go ahead and give you the schedule real quick. We got Indica Martin kicking it off. We've got seems like my sound dropped out. Nope, you're good. We can hear you. Keep going. Okay, we've got Indica Martin kicking off the event for today. She's going to do a presentation on her new book, Give to Nature and Nature Will Give to You. 1030, we got Brian Esterday from the Wizard Factory. Short break at 11.30 a.m. And then a musical performance from Ryan Swisher. Uh, Brandon Martin's presentation at 11.45, Sight Beyond Illusions. Nate Capp's presentation, 1 p.m., Reillumination of the Imagination, cubbyhole.com. Regina Zwelling is going to do a 30 minute meditation at 3 p.m. Logan Hart at 3.30 with three ideas that can evolve the natural law perspective, the wizardfactory.com. 4.15, we have Colin Smith. 5.45, we're gonna break. Another musical performance from Ryan Swisher. And then the main event at 6 p.m., Mark Passio with Fake Ass Anarchists, www.whatonearthishappening.com. And then there's a Q&A Seed Conference round table discussion for all to join in at the end of the event today. So stay tuned and put your seat belts on because we're about to start this event today.
Good day to everyone in nature. I am so excited to be doing this children's book reading for you today. My name is Indica Indy Martin, author of this book, Give to Nature and Nature Will Give to You, which is included in the Junebug Nature Book Series, now available in French, Spanish, and Italian. Illustrated and hand-drawn by Aaron Philby. Now after doing some research from many different sources of information, how to best read to a child and keep them engaged because you want them to learn, right? You will see me demonstrate this with you. So for today, we'll have some fun. So number one, I would like to give you an example, is underlying the words with your finger, okay, while you're reading. Number two is commenting and questioning and answering questions, too, while you're reading. It's not just a race to get through. And number three is allowing some time for the children to look at pictures, okay? So they want to be able to look at these images before they hear the words. And that way, that connects them with the words and the images or pictures a little bit easier so they can understand. So, let's get started. Give to nature and nature will give to you. Look! There's the sun, and a moon, and a star in the sky. I wonder why this boy has a bunch of dirt in his hands with a plant growing out of it. Maybe we can find out when we turn the page. Nature's law of mentalism. Mentalism. The all is mind. The universe is mental. Our thoughts and imagination can lead to creating what we get and experience on earth. What is he thinking? Hmm. It looks like he's thinking of a tree house. Manifestation. We can manifest in our minds bad or uncomfortable things into our physical life. Or we can manifest fun things like tree houses. Do you think he wants to find the golden key? I don't know. Let's find out. Reading knowledge helps us find the key which helps unlock, understand information. Do you think this key unlocks this door? Let's keep looking to the next page. Nature's law of correspondence. Correspondence. Everything in nature is a mirror or a reflection of what is going on inside of us. As above, so below. Now these two different pictures are somewhat connected because this tree and the leaves are above the ground and these roots that are connected to the tree are below. As above, so below. Metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly takes 28 to 38 days. Nature's law of correspondence is like a mirror that shows the stages of our human life that are similar to the life of a butterfly. Now metamorphosis is a very big word. It means when something changes into something different in nature. Just like this caterpillar grows into different stages until it's a beautiful butterfly. 
Nature's Law of Vibration Vibration. Everything is in motion and nothing is at rest. The energy we put out is the energy we receive. The little boy beating a drum sends vibrations through the whole universe. Just as the girl that is standing still. I wonder if the neighbors can hear the vibrations of this little boy playing the loud drums in the house next door. <laughs> seed germination. A growing seed. Seed germination is how a seed grows into a plant. The life of a plant can grow and develop just like our consciousness. Here you see the seed in the ground. It turns into a cotyledon. Then roots are over here. And then it grows out of the ground and then leaves start to grow and then flowers and then yummy strawberries. Have you ever been to a garden? My dad used to plant seeds in the garden when I was little and he really smelled. P.U. <laughs> Sharing is caring. Selfish people only care about themselves and what they get. They do not care about the thoughts and feelings of other people or animals. What's going on here? This little girl looks so sad. And all she wants to do is play with this other girl. And she is being selfish. Behavior. Making the conscious choice takes time to learn. You can control your behavior and no one else should be blamed. You and you alone are responsible for your actions. Look, he is holding up his hand because he wants to be fair and give the other people in the class the right to talk and not interrupt them. This page is called Why. What is my purpose? What does love mean? Why am I here? Why do I care? Why am I connected to the whole universe? What is the difference between right and wrong? Why do I need to question things? Why do I need knowledge? I think she just wants the adults in her life to take the time to help her find the answers. What do you think? Good parenting, time and attention. Children learn from the behaviors they see and the attitudes and conversations that they hear. Also, they learn by how they are valued and treated at home. It looks like this girl and boy are listening to her using their, their hearing, and they're listening to the words that she is stating in this book. So they're learning, and they are seeing her care to sit down with them and take some time and give them some attention. Consciousness. It's about knowing what is going on in our minds, our bodies, and our spirit. It's also being aware of what is happening in and around us. See, she is reading to him, learning to be conscious which is helping him probably learn about consciousness. <laughs> Law of rhythm. Rhythm. Everything in nature is always moving like a pendulum. Like the energy of the swing to the left will be the same to will be the same as the energy of the swing to the right. There is always an action and reaction. A rising and a sinking. Night follows day 
and day follows night. This girl, when she is pulling back the ball, the energy will force it to go back and forth. And this is called the law of rhythm. Force of gravity. Nature's law holds everything together and does not require your belief. It just is. You see this apple? It just fell from the tree. Just like this apple that I'm holding in my hand. No matter what, when I let go of this apple, it will fall to the ground. The seasons of the sun, northern hemisphere, the cycle, the circle, or wheel of life is a symbol showing you the seasons of the sun. Spring, summer, fall, winter. In the springtime, the leaves start to come out on the trees. And in the summer, everything blooms. In the fall, the leaves fall to the ground. And in the winter, it gets really cold and almost all the leaves fall off the tree. Ether, energy, invisible. Earth, air, fire, water. Five elements of nature. These symbols show you the energy that relates to each element. Ether is energy invisible. Now, invisible means that there's something there, okay, but you can't see it. And earth is like the ground or grass that you walk on. Air is the air that we breathe. And fire is like a campfire out in the backyard. And water is the same as rain coming from the clouds. Caring. Take care of all things in nature and nature will take care of you. Aw, the cute little doggie is helping this little boy plant a tree. Nature's law of polarity. Polarity. Everything is dual. Everything has poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. For example, light to dark, cold to hot. I wonder why this boy is so sad and this girl is so happy with her doggy. The North Star, Polaris. All stars revolve around this star every night. This is Polaris. Have you ever seen the Little Dipper in the night sky? Maybe you can see it tonight. Bring knowledge to the information to unlock the universe. There's the key and there's the door. Fill in the blanks. Truth is that which is. To be conscious is to be aware of our thoughts, feelings, actions, and surroundings. Don't do to don't do unto others what you don't want done unto you. Golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is an important one to remember. Cause and effect. Nature's law of cause and effect helps us understand and know the world that we create together. There's always a consequence for our behavior. This is sometimes called karma. As you can see, this balloon is about ready to get exploded and make a big noise because this person right here has something very sharp that is going to make a big pop so it's very loud so not only does it bust the balloon or burst the balloon it also 
causes a big sound. So there's many different variables here. Stealing, taking anything that doesn't belong to you is wrong. Look, he thinks that he's going to be really sneaky and not get caught. Lying. It is wrong to let someone else take the blame for your behavior. It is right to admit when we make a mistake and take responsibility for anything that causes harm to someone, even a dog. You can see that he has a bat that he's hiding behind his back because he just broke this window and he is letting his dog get in trouble for something that he did. How would you feel if someone did this to you? Not very good. Violence versus self-defense. Violence causes harm and is never okay. The person who hits first is always wrong. It is our right and our choice to protect ourselves using self-defense. No one has the right to do any harm to anyone. When you play with fire, don't cry when you get burned. Consequences. Every action has a reaction. If you do anything dangerous, don't be surprised if you get hurt. Have you ever been near a hot stove like you see right here? It's probably a good idea to stay away or you may get hurt. Nature's law of gender, male, non-physical, self-spiritual, and female. Gender, everything in the universe has a male and female energy to it. Truth. Truth is that which is, it's what has happened and what is happening. When we don't want to see or hear truth, it is because we are afraid to be responsible for what we know. Oh my goodness, someone is trying to tell this little girl truth and she is pretending like she doesn't hear anything. That's why she's covering her ears. Have you ever seen anyone do this before? The key, you are the key. You are the force that can grow. Look inside the seed of life and you will see the vibrational force that will help you find your true nature. The journey will be measured by how much you care. So the answer is the little boy had to learn that he had to care about everything in nature. The seed of life. The seed of life is formed from a relationship of six circles around one. In fact, six circles are always, will always fit exactly around a seventh circle of the same size. It shows seven days of creation. So everyone, boys and girls, let's count together. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Balance, there's the key again. So after reading this book, hopefully this little girl feels more balanced after an adult reads it to her or she reads it with her mind, her body, and her spirit.
in nature. The end. Now, after reading this book to a child, I would ask them a couple of questions to see what they remember. You know, and as far as their answer back to me, that would be depending on the age, of course. But I would also reaffirm that they did a good job just listening and answering the questions. This is very important because it helps with comprehension and memory skills. So hopefully everybody will do that. There's absolutely no doubt that children need our caring guidance, especially at this time. Also, in addition to knowledge and protection with what they see and hear, and of course their emotions, which is very crucial during the very, very early ages of their life. Now, I know that you've all heard the saying, reading is fundamental and that knowledge is power, right? Next, I would like to share with you some brief but very profound conclusions by Dr. Bruce Lipton who has worked over 30 plus years on an extensive amount of research when it comes to consciousness. Number one is Delta, lowest frequency, first two years of life. Number two is Theta, critical programming years, ages two to six years old. And number three is Alpha, calm consciousness, six to 12 years old. If you wanna learn more, I'm sure that you can find various podcasts and numerous videos and books on this subject. This is a message from Dr. Bruce Lipton. The most influential perceptual programming of the subconscious mind occurs from birth through age six. I'm going to repeat this. The most influential perceptual programming of the subconscious mind occurs from birth through age six. Simultaneously, the child's sensory systems are fully engaged, downloading massive amounts of information about the world and how it works. By observing the behavioral patterns of people in their immediate environment, primarily parents, siblings, and relatives. Children learn to distinguish acceptable and unacceptable social behaviors. So in conclusion, he states, it's important to realize that perceptions acquired before the age of six become the fundamental subconscious programs that shape the character of the individual's life. Thank you to all of you for joining me for my children's book reading and to the other speakers. Also to the people that have helped out with this event and a special thank you to Brandon for putting your time and attention to the great work and for creating this SEED conference.
Well, how wonderful was that? That was such an amazing, heartwarming little presentation by my aunt, Indica Martin. And uh, I thank her for putting that together for the youth because we need more work like that. And sorry about my interruption earlier. I've been having a lot of internet issues on my end. Um, as Doug put it, the internet gremlins are after me for this presentation. Maybe they don't want me on the air. Uh, because of the things that I have to say, but in spite of the tech issues, we cannot get discouraged and we have to continue to persist in the face of that because this is what it's all about is never giving up. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the next presenter, which is Brian Easterday from the Wizard Factory, and he's going to be presenting the Vedic astrology navigating the universe. So I hope you guys really enjoy this one, and I'm looking forward to bringing a lot of great information to the table with this presentation here today, and then also future works of mine and all the people here. So without further ado, let's get right into the next presentation. primary platform for our weekly video podcast, where together we explore deeper understanding of the universe and ourselves. This channel focuses on teaching the foundational spiritual concepts required for accurately perceiving our world through the study of human psychology and cosmic law, the inner and outer worlds of our reality. Our mission is to empower, inspire, and encourage others to heal and transform themselves and the world by aligning our will and our actions with the objective principles of true morality, personal sovereignty, and the immutable laws of nature. And ultimately, we want to assist our human family to remember the tribe by connecting with each other and our ancestors in the spirit of cooperation and community. Join us every week for rich and balanced commentary and engaging interviews with prolific thinkers as we explore a diverse and holistic array of topics related to spirituality and philosophy, esoteric psychology, individual sovereignty and freedom, healing and health, the arts of self-gnosis, paganism, ancient traditions, the occult, and much more. Our content is freely available to those seeking to actualize the full potential of their own personal power, sovereignty, and creativity. Please subscribe to our channel and opt in for notifications so you never miss an episode. And follow our audio podcast, available on Spotify, iTunes, and other major platforms. To find out more about us, our mission, and other products and services, please visit our website at thewizardfactory.com. Hello, everybody, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody, first of all, for uh, tuning into my presentation here. 
Uh, I am Brian Easterday, and uh, you know, I am a husband, a father, a Vedic astrologer, and uh, many of you will also know me as a co-creator of the Wizard Factory podcast, which is probably where most of you will be familiar with me at, um, that I do with my, my dear friend, Logan Hart. Uh, you know, I also want to start by thanking off uh, Brandon Martin and everybody at the Cubbyhole uh, Network uh, for putting on this conference. Uh, I was very excited whenever um, Brandon sent me a message uh, asking me if I wanted to do a presentation. So um, I definitely wanted to bring something exciting to you guys. And uh, for me, you know, the, the subject that I am most passionate about um, easily and one for me, one of the most useful tools for understanding natural law, cosmic law, which, you know, which all, all the presenters here have, have such a passion for. Um, Vedic astrology really is the science and the tool that, that I find most useful for that. So I was really trying to figure out how to uh, set up a presentation that covers such a, a vast and complex subject in, in a, a limited amount of time. So that being said, I made this presentation to kind of work uh, in conjunction with a series that I have on uh, the Wizard Factory YouTube channel that you can find, and you can also find it through the One Great Work Network uh, called Vedic Astrology and Cosmic Law. And it's an entire playlist, uh, an entire series that I'm making uh, going through Vedic Astrology and different aspects of it and how we can use that to understand Cosmic Law. And you know, some of the uh, clips I have up on there already were taken from a recent course uh, I taught teaching how to actually go about doing that. So uh, keep that in mind that this presentation, I am trying to keep it as brief as possible um, to, to cover as much information as possible in a short amount of time. Uh, but if you're, if this does interest you and you're wanting to look into more, that playlist um, is made specifically to kind of go along with this presentation. <clears throat> so uh, that being said, you know, let me go ahead and set this up. So my presentation, I'm calling Vedic Astrology, Navigating the Universe, you know, and this was something I was kind of thinking about a few weeks ago of, you know, the word universe and like, really, you know, what is that? What does it encompass, you know, especially in the context of cosmic law, as we see, you know, with the principle of mentalism, we see that the mind is all, you know, so everything in the universe is including the mind of the all and, and is a part of that. So to really dive into what that is and what that means, I, I just kind of started following this train of thought that I'm going to lead, lead you guys along with me here. Uh, so first, let's look at our terminology. Let's, let's look at what is the universe. On to my next uh, slide here. Okay, so etymology is always a great place to start with when we're wanting to look at the meaning of words, right? So the etymology uh, comes from the Latin unis, meaning one, and then versus, which is the past participle of vertere, which means to, to turn, to turn back, be turned, to convert, to transform, to translate, or to be changed. It's very interesting to think about that. Uh, in the Vedic texts, you know, some of the things Vishnu uh, says is that, you know, he's constantly turning back in on himself. And from the Vedic or the Hindu perspective, uh, the universe, everything is Vishnu, right? And then there's just many different forms or avatars of Vishnu, which we're all a form of Vishnu, if you're looking at it through from that perspective. Um, but it's a cycle of turning in on itself. We're the all experiencing itself. Well, in order to do that, you have to, you have to have reflection. You know, we have to have an experience and then to reflect. So everybody is a different manifestation, a different fractal of the all, you know, and it's just creating and turning back in on itself. It's this cycle. <clears throat> and the other thing here to look at, you know, <clears throat> is green language that, you know, sometimes it's very fun to take a word and to just kind of play with it a little bit and see what you come up with. And with universe, I found there was kind of a couple different ways you could, you could break it down uh, phonetically. Um, and each one kind of has its own uh, meaning or connotation here. So first one is just breaking mark uni and then verse. So you could look at that as like the one, uh, you could think of it as in verse of like with music is the one song right? It's kind of an interesting 
way to think about it because when we're looking at cosmic law, obviously we have the uh, the law of vibration. We see that everything is moving. You know, everything at some level is, is all part of this one giant song. Then you could look at it as the you and I verse. So it's not just the one song, but it, it's it's our song. It's a song that is made for, of you and I and every little fractal. We all make up a part of this whole. Then you could think about it, the you in verse, so, you know, where is your place in the song? So as I was thinking about this, I, I was seeing, you know, uh, just kind of thinking about this theme of music, right? The idea that everything is just a song, you know, everything's vibration and then tying that back to, uh, you know, uh, natural law. And then in relating that to astrology, I, I kind of started thinking about how astrology really allows me to become a conscious creator, to then move, move into more awareness. And, and that then dawned on me that just in the way, like if we want to take the same theme of, of music, right? You can think of there being two different kinds of people when it comes to interacting with music, right? You have people that they don't understand uh, music theory or how to play an instrument or anything, and they can enjoy the experience. You know, they could be out in a crowd at a concert and enjoying it, but they're not necessarily contributing to the song. You know, they might be contributing some noise to the atmosphere, right? They're screaming or they're clapping, they're applauding, you know, whatever it may be. Like, we're always creating, but are we consciously creating? But then you have the musicians, right? They're the ones that probably understand music theory, or they at least understand how to play their instrument, you know, at an efficient level in order to create what most people would consider music versus just senseless noise, right? And the difference between those people is what that knowledge, that awareness of the fundamental laws of how that, how music theory works, how, how you actually use this instrument to create patterns that people then find, uh, enjoyable versus someone who's just taking it and just like I said making a bunch of senseless noise so that really leads us to seeing that there are two kinds of people there's those who think they are playing and those who know they are and if we're thinking about the song called life if we're thinking of everything is this great song then we can see that each of us has a, a responsibility that we all are creating, but are we unconsciously creating chaos or are we pretending like we know everything and then and creating a bunch of chaos because our, our knowledge is actually based in truth. It's not based on cosmic law or there's people, like I said, you can step into the role of knowing at a fundamental level what these laws are how they actually apply in every single situation and every area of your life. And they are always present and always in effect. Because when you can understand the fundamentals and you make those your foundation, then what you can, you can go and then create and work within that. Just like a musician can understand the fundamentals of music theory. And, you know, they all, you know, you could give a bunch of different musicians the same piano and they're all working within the same thing, but they all come up with creating something very different, right? A different song, a different piece, and they can all be equally as beautiful. That's just like it is with life. E each one of our life is a, it, our lives is a song that when we can start to integrate at a foundational level, the knowledge of cosmic law, of how our reality actually works, we can choose to become conscious creators with that. So for me, one of the best ways to, uh, that I have discovered to gain self-awareness and, and also awareness of others is through the science of Vedic astrology. So as I mentioned with cosmic law, it's best to start with the basics, you know, that sometimes, uh, the basics in astrology, like you get down to say the elements. And so I'm going to kind of 
set this all up. I'll try to make it really, really brief because it's something I can I can get going on e easily enough. Um, but this is a great place for, to start in order to start seeing how astrology is a really good tool for observing cosmic law. And, and so we'll get into this here. So first off to explain what you see here on the right is known as a North Indian style chart. So in Vedic astrology, there's multiple style charts. Uh, each one has its kind of pros and cons and are used for different things. But the North Indian style is great for beginners. And uh, it is also uh, really good for displaying the, the concept that I'm trying to, to show here. So with this style of chart, this very first box up here in the center where, it's, where I have it saying fire, that is what is known as the first house. And in this style chart, that is always going to be the first house. So if you're starting from the natural zodiac with the natural progression of the zodiac, this would be Aries, which and Aries is associated with fire, which is which is why I have that element there. And then in this chart, you count counterclockwise, and then that would be the second house, third house, fourth. So it'd go, you know, you have fire, earth, air, water, fire, earth, air, water. And you have this same, you know, pattern repeated over and over again. So the first thing to understand is with elements, those are a great foundational thing to start to really look at because everything in our universe is made of a combination of them. Like we're, we're all a mixture of these things. Then you want to understand that the different elements are associated with different genders. So we're bringing in the law of gender here, right? Cosmic law. So air and fire are associated with the masculine. Water and earth are associated with the feminine different uh, expressions of the same gender. So air, again, air and fire being masculine, water and earth being feminine. So as you can see here, there's a few things that we can start to, to look at if we look at this chart. Well, if you're starting with, you know, fire, earth, air, water, well, what's the first thing we can see there? It's masculine, feminine, masculine, feminine, masculine, feminine, this balance back and forth, just you know, it's the progression, it's the walk of consciousness, this play between masculine and feminine. When you start to really understand the essence of masculine and feminine, you, so much in the world becomes clear. And these elements are a great way for explaining it because it's that you break it down into the different expressions of the same gender, right? Uh, so different expressions of the masculine, different expressions of the feminine, and that allows you to see different polarities within that gender. Um, so we see that there. Then you can also look at, if you're looking at the direct reflection of any element in the chart. So if you're looking at fire here in the first house, and then if you go to the bottom, that center box where there's air, that would be the seventh house. Those are both what? Masculine, uh, the masculine uh, gender, but they're different elements, different expressions of that, the different polarities of that. Um, and when you start to really understand what the first house and seventh house are about, the first house is your sense of self. It's your fire. That's why when you see someone and they're kind of down out at you, what's an expression? Oh, they've lost their fire. They're down on themselves, right? So you can see that there. The seventh house is our relationships. It's air. So that's associated with communication and the intellect and connecting with other people. But what happens in our life? You know, our relationships you know, will very much feed our sense of self. You know, that air element can feed that fire. If you have a lot of people like really, you know, approving of that sense of self, you know, or giving you a lot of feedback, what's that going to do? That's going to grow that fire and play that sense of self. So you can see that this, you know, this playback forth between the different polarities, you know, and again, you know, the law of polarity. We're, ta we're talking about cosmic law here and just different expressions. And, you know, understanding elements and seeing how they're set up in the chart are very useful for that because what you're keeping in mind what you're looking at here is just a map of the sky so you're you're looking at the physical manifestation of the thought patterns of the mind of the all and then you're looking at the natural zodiac here and the elements associated with each zodiac sign so this balance no matter which sign is in the ascendant is always there there's always going to be the pattern of fire earth air water of ma masculine, feminine, masculine, feminine. It's always present. That perfect balance is always there. It doesn't matter which way you slice this chart, 
you're going to be able to find all four of those elements. You know, uh, you know like with water here, we have, you know, uh, earth on the other side. So both expressions of the feminine. The earth element is the feminine that is is steady. It's grounded. It can it can always be there and, and be firm and be, you know, a support, right? Like with, you think of uh, women in the family traditionally, that that maternal nature, that grandmother, that mother, they're really that that kind of person that really brings and binds the whole family together. But then we also look at water. Well, water is associated with the emotions, with movement, with flowing. They're both the feminine, right? But they're at diff different polarities. One is being able to be solid and move and be firm. The other is being able to flow. With fire and air, you can associate fire with our actions, with taking initiative, moving on things, creating things. With air, it's the thought process. It's the intellect. It's our communication. So when you start seeing how these work together, you can start to observe some interesting lessons. For example, anytime you're wanting to study one placement in the chart or you're thinking about one element, study its opposite. Study the polarity because that's going to give you the full spectrum of the picture. And I'll give an example of how this can play out. Imagine a person is very stuck in the air element. They're, they're really in their head. You know, they might have a lot of heavy air, air placements and energy in their chart. So it keeps them in their head. They're always talking about different ideas. They're coming up with brainstorms. And that's great unless you never put it into action. So if you're thinking about things all the time, but you're not actually creating something, how do you balance that back out? Well, you lean into the other polarity of the masculine. You lean into fire. You take action on those thoughts. You take action on those goals. And then when you're using both of those together, that's how you're truly creating with the masculine. The same with the feminine. So if you get, you know, uh, the earth element, one of the like maybe downsides to it, if you're in an imbalance with an earth energy within the feminine is that the feminine can get stuck. You know, you can be stuck in the past. So how can you sometimes get yourself unstuck? Well, lean into water, lean into the motion. You have to care enough to get yourself unstuck. There has to be some kind of an emotional uh need that you need to that you have to go and fulfill that actually motivates you enough to change whatever circumstance you're in in order to get unstuck in order to create a flow in your life what happens if a person is too stuck too uh too wrapped up in their emotions they're too watery well lean into the opposite lean into earth become more grounded try to become more stable Look at things from a, a down-to-earth perspective. Try not to get swept away by all the circumstances. You can see how these work back and forth, but you have to understand each one. And a, a huge thing for me for understanding the law of gender is really understanding that there are different expressions even of the same, the same gender, whereas, you know, air and fire, they're both masculine. Like I said, they're just on different sides of the, of the pole. So you start to then observe the law of polarity. And this is a theme with natural law, cosmic law, that you'll see is that each and every one of these laws are integrated. They're working together. Where you look for one, you'll see the others. If you look for the others, you'll see the one. They're all there. And this is a chart you can study again more and more. I actually have a short little episode on that, on that series that I'll be putting out that I, you know, I took this chart from uh, my course that I was teaching. Uh, but, but this is definitely one that you could study and look at quite a bit, you know, um, and keep observing cosmic law in there. But again, I want to keep it to, uh, you know, I want to keep within my time here. So I'll, I'll move on from this. Um, so now that we kind of have some basics, you know, we can move into, well, what are areas of focus that we need to look at in the chart? Well, one of the things that we can uh, start, you know, to look at first when we're thinking of a chart is realizing that when you're looking at a chart, essentially what that is, is you take a person's, you know, uh, if you don't know how to create a chart, there, there's lots of different uh, free ones that you can do. And again, if you're wanting to use Vedic astrology, it's a, it's a different zodiac than the tropical or typical Western astrology. And 
I don't have time to get into all that in this presentation, but I, I have other work out there explaining that. But what you're what you're understanding is you're taking, you know, your your exact, you know, the place you were born, the time you're, you know, the date you're born and the exact time you're born. And in order to see where all the planets and the constellations and everything in the sky was in relation to your position on Earth at the moment of your birth, that then you take essentially like a, a screenshot or a snapshot of that. And then that is the chart, right? But what's really important, and always keep this in the back of your mind, is when you're understanding if everything in the physical reality is a manifestation of the mind of all, it's a physical manifestation through the law of correspondence. What we're looking at with astrology is we're looking at the physical manifestation of the mind of all in order to also through the law of correspondence, look at the energetic uh, frequencies and like what, what, it, what is going on there. So you're observing the thought patterns of the mind and all and being able to understand all these different energies, all these parts, and then how they come together then allows you to analyze and look at the general overall kind of uh, theme in a situation. So that then applies on the macrocosm of looking at the collective consciousness or just things going on in general, but it also works on the microcosm with you as an individual because you are a fractal of the consciousness of the mind of the all and when you came into manifestation that is the energy that was present when when you came here so that's why it becomes imprinted as a kind of underlying foundational blueprint so we're starting to look at this as like a map of our life a map of our consciousness so then as we become aware of it we can then choose how to work with that I'm not a doom and gloom astrologer. I'm not a fatalistic astrologer. I use it to create awareness because awareness creates choice. So if you're wanting to start learning about yourself, where are some areas that you should start focusing at if you go and create a chart and you want to start studying? Well, I have a few here. And keep in mind with astrology, it is so vast. You could study your chart every day for the rest of your life and you would still have more to learn. There is always something new to be unlocked. This is just a very basic scratching surface where you should kind of start with things and, and why. And also with the purpose of knowing yourself and then learning to also uh, not only have a better relationship with yourself, but then be able to interact with others in a more healthy way. So if you're wanting to do that, the first place that you're always going to want to look is what is known as the logna which means to tighten down in Sanskrit, or it's the, also translated as the self. Um, this is also known as the ascendant, or in the Western, they'll call it the rising. But this is the zodiac sign that was rising in the East at the moment of your birth. That becomes your ascendant, or the, you know, your first house. It becomes a huge pillar of your personality. There's really three big pillars of your personality. And in the Western system, they tend to focus on the sun more, but we focus on the, the logna, the ascendant, and the moon more in the Vedic system. And the reason for that is that everybody born in the same 30-day period is born under the same sun sign. So yes, that does give you some qualities and some perspective, but it's also still a very kind of a broad period of time. Obviously, all those people born in that same period of time aren't going to be exactly the same, right? There's going to be a lot of differences. Well, the moon, it changes signs every two and a half days. It's also our mind and our emotions. So that is, that's a little bit narrower of a period of time. But then we have the logna, the ascendant. Well, that changes every two hours. You have 24 hours a day, 12 signs, two hours per sign. Okay, so that's, that's a narrower period of time. And in the Vedic system, we also have lunar constellations known as nakshatras and things like that, but, but I'm not going to get that far into it today. So that's why we start with the logness because it's that narrowest period of time so it's going to give us the most accurate glimpse of that person as an individual that's why it becomes one of these pillars so that logna is always going to be that first house so in this north indian style chart that's always going to be this big box in the top center here so in this chart as the example i have this person is a gemini ascendant so being that they're a gemini ascendant and it's in their first house their sense of self you can see that you know, this would be your typical, your Gemini person. They, for them, you know, Gemini is 
It's ruled by the planet Mercury, which is our intellect and communication, things like that. And it's, it's associated with the element of air, which is again, associated with the intellect, communication, relationships, connecting with people, technology, all, all these types of things. So for a Gemini person, a huge part of their sense of self is they'll, they'll really appreciate the intellect. They'll be able to be left brain people. They'll have a sense of duality to them though, because Gemini is the twins. They're going to uh, enjoy communication, connecting with others, having friendships. They'll enjoy comedy, you know, because Mercury, you know, is, is a, uh, notice the young prince, it's a, a very kind of fun planet. So Gemini's will have that, that kind of Mercurian quality, but there's also that slight trickster kind of energy there. Um, you know, so they'll probably have a good sense of humor. All those kind of qualities you would see now become a major part of this person. And this is a huge position chart because from here, everything else is then read in the chart from, from that ascendant. So really digging into that and understanding those qualities will help you understand a lot about the person. Like uh, the first house is always the truest reflection of, of a person. And then each of the other houses are different areas of our life. So there's different aspects and uh, energies in our life and they all they come together in different combinations so you have you know the energy of the planets that have all their own qualities the signs and then the houses are like areas of life so it's like you're taking the the qualities and the tendencies of the planets and the signs combining those and then bringing that into different areas of your life into the different houses if that makes sense so the next place we would want to look at would be our moon because as I mentioned before, our moon is associated with our mind. And this is not our intellect. This is the higher mind, the unified mind. It's also associated with our emotions. You know, the moon is a feminine planet. Um, so here to identify this person, the moon, you would look at on the chart and you can see here, MO, that stands for moon. And in different charts, they'll, they'll have, you know, different programs will show things different ways. But you can see here that the moon is in the sign of cancer and it's sitting in the second house because, you know, as I explained earlier, the center box is always the first house and then you count counterclockwise. So you start, you start where, where you're at. So you start in the first house. So one and then counterclockwise two. So that's the second house. Um, and in this North Indian style chart, that will always be the second house. If you go counterclockwise to where Leo is, that's always going to be the third, so on and so forth. So this person has their moon and cancer in the second house. Well, the second house is known as the house of beliefs, the house of values. So, you know, uh, here we have the person who's, you know, moon, you know, and it's in cancer. Well, cancer is a sign that's ruled by the moon. You know, so in Vedic astrology, that's what's known as Mulu Trakona. Uh, so the, both the karmas and the qualities of both the moon and that sign of cancer, which are, you know, very emotional qualities, those kind of things, those really will become very prominent with this person. So there'll be a person that they feel their emotions very deeply. They value those very deeply. They'll probably be a very nurturing person towards others because cancer people, especially with that moon there, will want to give to others and nurture others. And they'll, they'll care about how other people feel. Um, but they also might be a little bit guarded, just like a crab has a shell to protect all its soft insides. A cancer person can have an appearance of a shell but really on the inside, they're very soft. They're a very caring type of person, you know? And again, not all cancer people are the same because we also have the lunar constellations known as nakshatras behind that. Um, and each one of those will kind of have a different quality of can that cancer energy that gets brought out. But that's where you start to look at the finer detail. But, you know, this is the first place that you start. You want to start at looking at the planet, you know, if there's any other planet sitting with it, what sign they're sitting in and what house they're sitting in. That's your foundational level that you start assessing things off of. And then you can, you can dive into it deeper from there. So, you know, after we, you identify where the moon is, you know, you, you then want to look at where the sun is. So we've looked at, you know, our sense of self, our ascendant, you're looking at your mind and your emotions. And then the sun is associated with your soul on the higher level, but also your ego, right? <clears throat> So we can see that each of these is a different part of ourself. They're all part of us, but they're, they are slightly different things. So, and when you're looking at each one, it's you're looking at the different details, the finer details of yourself. 
So in looking at the sun, we could see that this person's sun is sitting in their seventh house here, the house of relationships, and it's sitting with the planet Mercury, and they're in the sign of Sagittarius. Well, definitely some interesting stuff I, I can see here. Uh, the first thing I would note would be that like Mercury is the ruler of Gemini. So this is the planet that's rule is the ruler of the first house for this person. And it's in their seventh house of relationships. And Gemini is a sign that is all about relationships. So what you can see here is this theme of the importance of relationships, the importance of communication, of connecting with people on a deeper level, on a soul level would be really important for this person. They wouldn't want to just connect with anybody for the sake of connecting with them. They'd want to connect with this person on a soul level because their, their soul, their ego sitting here, it's with Mercury, a planet of communication. And it's in a sign of like Sagittarius, which is all about finding the higher truth. You know, it's, it's a sign that's ruled by Jupiter. So finding that higher truth, finding cosmic law, natural law, what, what is real and what's practical in order to be able to change my life. So this person would want to connect in relationships that were very practical, that they had a fire to them because Sagittarius is a fire sign. So there was a spark there. They, they were relationships that uh, inspired action, those type of things. So you could really see that, you know, that first house and the seventh house, again, are reflections of each other. So if you're ever wanting to study one part of the chart, be sure to always look at its opposite look at that polarity look at the you know you could look at it through polarity you could look at it as the law of correspondence you know in the first house as above so below in the seventh so you know all these cosmic laws can be observed through observing you know the science uh you know and i i could go much deeper into each of these but again i'm just trying to hit on it very brief so i i stay within my time period the next little thing that i'm going to look at here are Rahu and Ketu, which are the nodes of the moon, uh, the north and south node of the moon. So these are not actual planets. They're what are known as shadow planets. So because we can't actually, they're not planets we can see with our visible eye. They're, they work on a unconscious or a subconscious level, right? They're not in the conscious mind, they're in the subconscious and the unconscious mind. <clears throat> but these are two mathematical points that are calculated by seeing the place along the solar and lunar ecliptics where they cross on each side of the planet there those become the north and south node of the moon and in vedic astrology there's a very rich mythology with these and uh i, I don't have time to get into that because it is a bit a little bit of a longer one but in short rahu represents our desires and what we're pulled towards in life like the things we really want to achieve k2 represents kind of our foundational or our formatted programming from early childhood or things that we're really familiar with. And the way there's always a dance between Rahu and Ketu. And the way this works out is if you can, if you're thinking about Rahu as things you're going after and Ketu is a place that you're familiar with, you're comfortable. When people get, you know, they've been in a place too long, say, you know, they grew up in like a small town or something. They're like, Oh, I just can't wait to get out. I just want to get out of here. Well, that feeling is K2. You're familiar with it. You know what's going on. It feels safe, but it can be frustrating if you spend too much time there. And Rahu is that foreign place. It's that new adventure. It's that new desire, that new experience. So there's always a, this play back and forth between, you know, what we're comfortable with and what our new desires are and where we want to move to. But sometimes if people go out and they're, they're trying to go after a new experience and it may not necessarily go the way they want, well, what do they do? They fall back on what they're familiar with and then after a while they'll get okay well maybe i'm ready to go try this again or i want to try a different thing so there's this dance back and forth and in the chart rahu and k2 are always extremely important to look at because it every any chart i've ever looked at they will always play a very prominent role in a theme in someone's life of this energy and this dance this dance back and forth so not only the signs that are in there or planets that are sitting with them but the houses those areas of light that rahu and k2 are sitting in you'll see for a person those are really really important to them very prominent there's a lot of karmas a lot of lessons to be experienced uh and knowledge to be gleaned from those experiences wherever they're sitting with so in this person we would see that obviously k2 
uh, we can see KE, that's K2, is sitting in the sign of Leo in the third house of communication. And then their Rahu, because K2 and Rahu are always sitting directly opposite of each other. So, if, you know, one's in the third house, the other's going to be in the ninth. If one's in the first, the other will be in the seventh. If one's in the fourth, the other will be in the tenth. Always going to be opposite of each other. So this person's Rahu is sitting in the sign of Aquarius. It's all about, you know, uh, creating a better world, being a sovereign individual for yourself and for the rest of humanity, wanting to do, you know, incorporate technology, wanting to create a new age, create a, a world that's based on cosmic law, natural law, because Aquarius is ruled by the sign of Saturn, which Saturn governs cosmic law, natural law. So if anybody is out there thinking Saturn is a bad thing, it's quite the opposite. That is actually the archetype that you really need to work with most to truly understand cosmic law. Uh, so we have it here and it's in the ninth house, which is a spirituality of teachers. You know, it's the original home of Sagittarius. So all those Sagittarius type of energies wanting to find that higher truth, wanting to find, you know, have the arrow hit the target. You know, Sagittarius is the archer. When an archer is taking aim, they're not, you know, they're, it's just not a, a uh, spray and pray type of technique like you would use with other types, you know, certain types of weaponry there you have a, a single shot and you're aiming it very directly and very intentionally. But it's the same thing with Sagittarius. They're trying to find that truth that what is what is truth? Where's the bullseye? What's actually practical? So that ninth house deals with this type of energy. So this person, you know, with that Rahu and Aquarius would really then want to have a they'd have a strong desire to want to create a better world to have those tap into those Aquarian type of experiences you know and they would be drawn to the spiritual side of life of wanting to be you know a teacher that is like sharing these type of things you know they might even you know someone like this might even be like a tech teacher or something like that that would be one thing you could see um that k2 and leo would mean like their sense of self well k2 in the mythology is a headless body so this can kind of be an interesting place for uh, to go into Leo because Leo is very much as the sign that's associated with the ego because it's, it's ruled by the sun. So you see these themes that like repeat both through the planet and the sign and the house. There's the same general energy and there's just different areas that shows up. And then depending on the combination of those, you can, you can see like the same expression expressed in, or, you know, the same thing expressed in a lot of different ways in a chart. But when you get K2 and Leo, it becomes a person that they, they don't really tap into that Leo energy or they're familiar with it. They can have a strong sense of self, but they don't, they don't feel stuck to it. They're more interested in looking towards the collective, looking towards Aquarius because that's where Rahu is sitting. Um, so, you know, that can, that could definitely be a very interesting thing to analyze here. And that, that would be a big area because you could see that play between what the self and society, the self and others, they're reflections of each other. You know, and I, I could go on and on about this, but again, I'm, I'm trying to keep it quick. Um, the next big area you want to look at in the chart is, are conjunctions. So conjunctions are areas where you have two or more planets all coming together in the same sign in the same house. Uh, the reason that is, is because it's, it's kind of like a melting pot. You know, you're thinking of, uh, you know, or imagine like a chart, like you're, you know, uh, like a song, right? So to continue with this theme. You know, each of the planets and the signs, they're all just different instruments that they all have kind of their own, their own uh, sound that they do in their own role within the band. Well, if you can see, there's like an area of the song, like an area of life, a house where there's different instruments coming together all together. Well, you could see that would be an area of the song where there'd be more sound concentrated. Well, it's the same thing with like when planets are coming together in conjunction, there's more energy, there's more qualities being brought together there. So then it kind of becomes like you're mixing these together. So you're looking at the qualities of both. In this case, their only conjunction is Sun and Mercury in Sagittarius. So you'd have the, you know, the fiery quality of the Sun, the air quality of Mercury, of that intellect, that communication, that fiery quality of Sagittarius. You know, you're seeing how these like different, you know, a lot of masculine energy in this uh, kind of thing. So. Uh, this person would have, you know, and again, back to the basics of, of gender and things, analyze the masculine and the feminine and things. So, so that could become a very uh, 
a very fiery placement in their chart. And it's again, in their house of relationships, which obviously our relationships in life are always going to be a big area for us because they're, they're a reflection of ourself. So anywhere you see a, a little pile up of planets, that's what's known as a conjunction. And that obviously is going to be important to look at because there's a reason that soul chose to have that karmic experience. And if there's an area of the life where there's a lot of things going on, a lot of karmas and experiences being brought there, it's because there's lessons to be learned there. So that's obviously an area you want to focus on. And then for understanding ourselves, we also need to understand our relationships and how we are with others. So that's that seventh house, which we've talked about a little bit here because this person happened to have their conjunction and sun and stuff in that seventh house. But your house of relationships is always going to be important for you to study. So what did I mention earlier? If you're ever wanting to study one area of the chart, say the sense of self, study the opposite, study the polarity, the, your relationships. You know, looking at your relationships in life and how healthy they are is going to tell you a whole lot about yourself. Well, the same thing like applies in the chart and can be observed here. So those are just areas that we want to focus on in the chart. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide here. So I try to stay on time. So the next little interesting thing to observe here is what is known as the Aruda Lagna. So the Aruda Lagna uh, comes from two words, Aruda, which means reflection, and Lagna, as I before, means self, if that is in it. So the Aruda Lagna is a reflection of ourself. And to me in Vedic astrology, this is, this is one of the most interesting uh, areas to focus on. So this is kind of based on the concept that as you come here as a soul, there are not only certain things that you want to achieve, certain karmas, experiences you want to have so you can learn lessons from that and develop as a soul. But there's also a role, a gift that you have to give to others by embodying a certain type of energy, a certain archetype that you naturally have an ability that it's in you. It's part of your sense of self. And, and as you embody that sense of self, as you embody that role, it, it really is a gift to others. So by embodying this, you help them out, which then also helps lead to your success. And we all want to be successful in different areas of life. And this doesn't, this doesn't just apply to say like money or business or anything like this. This helps you be successful in your relationships, just in general in life. This is a really good tool for being able to help create that. You could think of it like, Imagine you going to a play. Someone that, you know, an actor is coming out on stage and they're embodying a certain role, a certain character. Now, you know, that's not them in like real life necessarily. It's a costume that they're putting on, but you're, that's what you're expecting because them, you know, playing that role is then what? Giving you entertainment, getting to enjoy the crowd. Well, in that same kind of way, as we embody our Ruta Lagna, it's kind of us embodying that costume that actually then is a sense of service to others. And this is a concept that you can spend, I'll, I'll be teaching an entire course on it and stuff, and you can spend years and years studying on it, but it's, it's something that is great after you've looked at those other things in the chart and you wanna start diving deeper. This is a really interesting thing to look at. And uh, you know, for those who aren't aware, I, I also do offer like consultations and things like that that you can always check out on my website. And, this happens to be one of my consultations that I, that I do offer. But I'm going to tell you how to calculate this yourself. That way you can go ahead and start doing that study you know, for, for your own. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the chart and you're going to find the ruler of the first house. Okay, so like in our example chart where we had Gemini as, uh, as the, the sign that is ruling the first house, the, the ruler of Gemini is Mercury, which was sitting in the seventh house of that chart. And I'll, I'll go back to it here and, and show as an example. So you find, find the ruler of the first house. Then from the first house, you count to that ruler. So we would count from Gemini in the first house all the way to the seventh house to where Mercury is. And then you count that same number of places again. So wherever that lands is your Aruda, unless that happens to fall into the first house or seventh house. And then if you, if that's the case, then you count 10 houses from that. So in short, if it was to fall into the first house, that would end up in the 10th house. 
If it was to fall into the seventh, it would then end up in the fourth. Because as you're counting, remember, you always start from the place that you're at. So let me go back one slide here just to demonstrate here. So in this chart, we can see that we find you know, the first house and find the ruler of it. So as I said, we have Gemini, which is ruled by Mercury. So you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you count that number again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So because that landed back in the first house, we would go 10 houses from that. And the 10th house is right over here. So this person's Aruta Lagna would be Jupiter and Pisces in their 10th house of career. So you can see a person obviously being a very spiritual person, someone who's supposed to be a teacher, teach about deep emotional things. And that's very reflective if you look at that Rahu and Aquarius and that Mercury, Sun and Sagittarius, Venus and Scorpio, they have a lot of placements that would really indicate a person that would have a lot of uh, discipline as a spiritual teacher. They'd be a very intelligent person, a very good orator, and they'd be able to communicate those type of things. Uh, so that's how you would calculate that. Um, you know, so now say if it was like something, uh, something different, like the planet would landed in uh, like the fifth house. So you would go to like one, two, three, four, five, and then you would count again, and then you would end up in the ninth house if, it, if this was like a different chart, just as an example. So, you know, find the ruler, count to it, then count to that number again. And that's going to allow you to calculate your Aruda. And again, as you start to study this, this archetype, that's how you want to think of it as an archetype or a costume. You look at that energy and then as you can start to tap into that area of yourself, because it is, it's in your chart, it's part of you. As you start to tap into that and learn to embody that, you'll notice people respond to you better and better. And it's something that, again, it takes takes years of really studying to develop and get to going, but it is a good place to, to look. The next little area I want to focus on is, you know, if we've looked at astrology for learning more about ourselves, you know, it's the blueprint, it's the roadmap for understanding how we operate as an individual. The other way we can then apply that in our life is, by using it in our relationships. Just like I said, with that first house and seventh house, you know, our self and our relationships, they're reflections of each other. So by using it in your relationships, not only do you learn more about the people you're forming those relationships with, you learn more about yourself. So again, it's, it allows us to not only create more self-awareness, but awareness of others. So you know, when we're dealing with uh, people, we can look at them as an individual, like how they really are on a, a soul level, on an energetic level. You can start to see all their dispositions and the lessons and the karmas and things that they're going through as a soul and, and see them on that level. And it kind of allows you to step back and have a bigger perspective and not get so caught up in the little things, or at least that's what I found in my experience. You know, and, you know, another bit of it is, again, when we start to learn, uh, when we start to understand more about people in our lives that are important to us, we learn more about ourselves, you know, whether that's your spouse or your children or your friends, your business partners, whatever the relationship is, those are all reflections of you. And in each one of those, there's many, many lessons contained that can teach you more about yourself as well as others. You know, it, it's a twofold thing. This is where we see that, that law of correspondence, as within, so without. You know, bringing it back to cosmic law. Keep, always keep that in mind when you're studying astrology. That's the foundational, that's the base, the first thought you should always have in your mind is that I, what I'm looking at is I'm studying cosmic law. Start looking at it through that lens when you're understanding things and you will pull so much more from it. Another really good reason why astrology benefits our relationships is that it is literally, it's an act of respect to learn another person's chart. And when we act from a place of respect, you know, we're, we're building our relationships based on that. And what is respect? Well, it comes from the Latin re and then spectare. It means to look again. So when you're taking the time to actually like not only look at your, your own chart, that's an act of self-respect to take the time to learn more about yourself in that kind of an intimate way, but to look at someone else's 
in that kind of an intimate way and to keep coming back to it and to keep looking at it and to keep looking at uh, learning more and looking at it from different perspectives. That, that is an act of respect every time because every single time you are reflecting on that more. And the more you reflect on yourself and the more you reflect on your relationships, the more awareness you're going to have. And awareness creates choice. So then you can choose to continue to embody relationships that become more and more healthy. Another really useful thing here is, as I was saying, when you look at someone very intimately, you're, what you're looking at is someone's soul. You're you know, really looking at their energetic body. You're, you're understanding their karmic lessons and experiences that they wanna have. You're looking at their dis dispositions. And by doing that, that helps you have acceptance of a person. Just because a person uh, wants to have different experiences in you, or you know, uh, they're an extra, more of an extroverted person, you're more of an introverted person, that doesn't mean that their karmic lessons or goals are any less than yours, just like yours aren't any less than theirs. So when you see that we're, we're all souls on our journey, we're all on our path, you can see where someone's path is. And that like, okay, so they have a slightly different path than me and you can respect their right to be on that. So long as again, they're not, they're not then going and violating others and things, right? Obviously we don't tolerate someone doing wrongdoing, but again, applying this in our personal relationships and things, you know, for example, like uh, with my child as a father, you know, astrology is such a useful tool for me as a father is that if one of my kids is doing something you know, certain behavior that I'll just notice in their chart, rather than thinking of it of like, oh, they're doing this bad thing, I could, you know, if there's maybe some kind of an issue, I can look at it like, oh, okay, so this is a karmic lesson. They were meant to have an experience like this, so they can learn a certain type of lesson. And you can't go learn those lessons unless you have that experience. So that allows me to respect them as, as a as soul, just as equal as mine that has just of important lessons to learn. And just because those might be slightly different than mine doesn't make them any, any less important. And that applies to whether it's your children or your spouse or anyone else in your life. Another really useful thing is uh, with astrology, you can get into what's known as like relationship astrology or like uh, synastry astrology. So you can take multi different people's charts and then by observing uh, where planets and things line up that those are what are known as synastry points. So say if one person has like their Mars and Venus in Scorpio and another person has like their Saturn in Scorpio, well, that would then become a synastry point. So when you're seeing how in that relationship, uh, it's like each person kind of has their own flavor, their own qualities, right? And then when you're bringing those together, well, all those energies, all those qualities and things are then coming together. So if you kind of want to look at the overall theme of the relationship or areas of the relationship that are going to be important, that there's going to be karmic connection points of, this is where these synastry points come into play. And these are extremely useful for looking at an understanding of relationship. And, you know, this alone is, this one point alone is a huge subject that I could teach a course that's days and days long on just this one thing of using astrology and relationships. And I, I also offer consultations for things like that. But this can be applied in your friendships, you know, as a parent, at, you know, with your spouse, in your business relationship. Because any person you interact with, there's going to be some kind of synastry, some kind of energetic or karmic overlap. And that is why you as souls are coming together to have that experience. So this is like, what you're doing is you're looking at the roadmap of each individual and then what happens when those come together. It's a, it's a very, very useful thing to be able to build your relationships. Um, a very useful tool. So those are some ways that astrology can very much benefit our relationships. So to try to, try to keep in time here, because I, I do think I already went over, but uh, just a quick summary of everything so again th this is just scratching the surface of astrology i was just trying to give a general overview because to go into any kind of a detail an hour is just not enough time there's just not really any kind of way to do it because it's such a massive subject so again 
that's why I made that playlist called uh, Vedic Astrology and Cosmic Law. You know, please check that out on my YouTube channel because that, that will give you a lot more information to go along with this presentation so you can get more out of it. But the first little, you know, summary point here is that awareness creates choice. And, you know, uh, for those who have watched, you know, if you watch that little segment that I did for my course on cosmic law, I, I consider that statement a cosmic law, just as much as any of the seven hermetic principles. Awareness creates choice. You, you have knowledge and free will, the fundamental building blocks of our universe. Everything that is going on that we're experiencing can be summed up in that awareness creates choice. And this is why knowledge of cosmic law, of natural law is so important, because then you have the choice to exercise your free will. And this science of astrology helps create, you know, it brings more awareness. So then we have more choice, both with how we interact with ourselves as an individual, with our relationship with ourselves, but relationships with others. When we're using astrology to learn more about ourselves and others, it is an act of respect. Again, that, that's so important to take that time to have self-respect and respect for others. Because when you take the time to reflect on others, you know, you're a lot less likely to be seeing them as something less than you, to be violating them their rights. You know, a, a world of freedom is built on both first self-respect and respect of others. You have to have it twofold. Again, that, that law of correspondence coming in. When observing astrology, you're observing the physical manifestation and the thought patterns of the mind of the all. And though you're looking at one person's chart, yes, you're looking at them as an individual, but remember, they're a fractal of the mind of the all, that they were just one little fractal of all that energy being manifested that you could use, you could go to any kind of a historic event, create a chart from that, and be able to look at what was kind of going on energetically more on a, a macrocosm kind of perspective, just like you can take it all the way down to the microcosm at the level of the individual. It is a science that can be used to understand everything. It's, it's the study of the law of correspondence, as above, so below. You're using the sky to study the, the in, inside of the individual, You're using the outer world to, to study the inner, and the inner to study the outer, because they are reflections of each other. So really look at that. Like, when you think of a chart, it's not just a chart. You're, you're looking at, like a, a, like, a little snapshot of, like, a moment in the mind of the all, and then being able to analyze that. And the last little thing is to remember that, you know, you can create senseless noise or you can become a conscious creator. And astrology is just a tool that helps us play in the band to where we can consciously create something that is beautiful, something that we, a world that we all want to listen to versus, you know, a lot of the senseless noise that, you know, we will see that people have if they don't actually have the fundamental knowledge of how to step into a role as a conscious creator. So that's uh, going to summarize my presentation uh, for the conference. So again, you know, definitely want to thank Brandon and everybody at uh, the Cubbyhole Network for uh, having me do this. Uh, I want to thank you guys for taking your time and your attention to pay to to learn this. And uh, if you want to learn more, if this is something that interests you, you can go to thewizardfactory.com. Check out the website where I have all my uh, consultations I offer, courses that I teach, or you can also visit, you know, be sure to check out the Wizard Factory YouTube channel. We have a lot of uh, great information on there about different subjects, not obviously not just Vedic astrology. We expand much beyond that, but this is kind of my little mission and my passion. And check out that playlist because I, I did create this presentation to go along with that. Um, so you'll get a lot more from it by being able to also take in that information. So that's going to wrap everything up. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. You know, enjoy listening to the rest of the, the amazing speakers.
Hey, Brandon, thanks for having me, man. Um, this song is for you and Nathan by me and Doug. <laughs> Take a trip into the mind Leave the flesh and bones behind Go as far as you are inclined Where the dream and reality seem to be intertwined The simple truth you long to see From the deep dark depths of the memory and the peace you're dying to find everything combined it's all in the mind they don't know what you're talking about they don't care so they shut you out of an alternate route and the light to begin shining in on the shadow of doubt The brain will remain confined till the extinction of mankind but the keys to the hidden realm of the undefined are all in the mind Thank you. Thank you, Ryan Swisher, for that wonderful musical performance. We got a lot more coming up here for you today. Up next, we got Brandon Martin giving his presentation, Sight Beyond Illusions. And you can find Brandon's work at cubbyhole.com. And at 1 p.m. after Brandon, we got Nate Cap with his presentation, Re-illumina Re-illumination, The Reillumination of the Imagination, also cubbyhole.com. Uh, following that, 3.30, we got Logan Hart with his presentation, Three Ideas That Can Evolve the Natural Law. And just before Logan, uh, at 3, Regina is willing is going to give a guided meditation and if I didn't say Logan Hart's presentation three ideas that can evolve the natural law perspective 
And then following that, 4.15 p.m., we got Colin Smith. We got a short break at 5.45, and then another musical performance from Ryan Swisher. And then the main event at 6 p.m. with Mark Passio and Fake Ass Anarchists. And you can find Mark's work at whatonearthishappening.com. Also, the one great network.com. And then to wrap the event at 8.15 tonight, we will have a Q&A seed conference round table discussion. So I'd like to get a lot of as much participation in that as we can get. Get some feedback from the listeners and the viewers. So I hope everybody is enjoying the content that we're presenting here at this Seed 4 growth event. We've got lots more in store for you. So stick around. It should be an exciting day. <clears throat> lots of good information coming your way. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> yesterday was just amazing, I got to say. So a lot of great information presented yesterday. And um, things seem to have gone smoothly overall. When we made it through the first day. And we've reached cruising altitude here for the second day. So things are going well. I hope everybody is enjoying the material. Anybody wants to make a donation, you can make donations at cubbyhole.com. You can also find it, the individual content creators at the one great work network.com and make donations there. You can also donate at what on earth is happening.com and check out the gift sections there. We've got t-shirts available. I believe I, I mean, yeah, you can find um, all of Mark Passio's merchandise on his website. And we have seed merchandise available. I believe the links are in the chat. And if anybody needs the links to purchase any of the seed merchandise and can't find the link, um, just mention it somewhere in the chat and we'll try to find that and make sure that you're provided with the link. And I, you know, I just want to say on a personal note, I, I've I've seen a lot of events and and attended a lot of events and uh, never really seen an event with a lineup as as you know a powerhouse lineup like we have here at Seed Four. So it's really great to be a part of it, and I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. It's really. A, it's really a great conference event and and we were originally supposed to do this live at the baker university and uh, i was really looking forward to sharing the stage with these gentlemen but the fact that we've that we're doing it virtual it, it has its pluses too and uh, it's a great experience for all of us we're all learning a great deal and things seem to be going very smoothly smoothly like to thank Tyler Bloyer and Lawrence there in the control room for all their help. Lawrence Griggs, thank you for all your help and Tyler and Brandon Martin for hosting the event and helping put the event together for all of us and bring all of these wonderful speakers into the same place so we can access information for the cause of ending human slavery and bringing freedom here onto this wonderful planet for progeny and posterity. So I hope you're enjoying the material. I hope you will donate or at least indulge in some of the wonderful merchandising that's available. And uh, your support is much appreciated. These speakers are very giving of their time and, and their efforts and their research to bring us this kind of information. So anything that you can do to help them out is always greatly appreciated. And our, our common goal is human freedom. And anything that you can do to help to support that is always greatly appreciated. 
So stay tuned. We've got a lot more coming your way. Up next, we got Brandon Martin with his presentation, Sight Beyond Illusions. And that's Brandon Martin at cubbyhole.com. And there's a lot of other great information there, including some of my work and Nate Cap's work you can find at the Cubby Hole as well. And um, I'm just amazed by all the great content we've seen so far. Looking forward to more jam-packed information. And hope you'll stick around and enjoy the rest of the conference. I uh, I just you know I'm I'm really grateful to be here speaking with you today and um, guess a little you know anxious to see what's coming up next myself so I'm getting excited I've been excited you know and I'm going to stay excited until we get through this but. Uh, you know, ha hang on for the ride because I, I promise you it will be worth your time and, and, and the best is yet to come. So stick around and um, let's see what, what's coming up. If you're looking to further understand the mind, consciousness, the occult, symbolism, the ancient Egyptian mythos, philosophy, and truth discovery, make sure to tune in to the Cubbyhole podcast hosted by myself, Nate Cap, and co-hosted by Brandon Martin. The Cubbyhole podcast is a repository of critical knowledge that deals with and covers the many facets of the human condition, especially what causes most of the suffering going on in this world. Make sure to start at podcast number one and work your way forward for maximum value and understanding. The Cubbyhole podcast is found on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, TuneIn Radio, Simplecast, and Cubbyhole.com. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. Hello and welcome one and all. My name is Brandon Martin. I am the primary curator of the Seed for Growth Conference. Well, actually, I'm the primary curator of the Seed Conference itself. Um, I'm also the primary host of this conference. So I would like to give my personal appreciation to all the guests and attendees for uh, taking time out of their daily lives to watch these presentations that these amazing lightworkers have brought together 
to help humanity spread freedom and knowledge as far and as wide as possible. I'd also like to thank the presenters themselves for putting in all the hard work because it's not easy to get things like this going. Um, I'd also like to give my personal appreciation and thank you to the tech team, the people who are behind the scenes helping out with this presentation and with this whole entire conference. Without them, this would not be going on. Um, so without further ado, let's get right into my presentation. My presentation is called Sight Beyond Illusions, Building on Firm Foundations. Now, this is going to be a rudimentary presentation. Uh, I kind of sped through this one to try to get it together. It was, it was kind of a rush job for me. Usually, I put in a lot more time, but considering of all the things that was going on, I just didn't have um, as much time to put into this presentation. But I made it pretty uh, basic for individuals who are just coming online. So this presentation is about understanding the firm principles and the foundational ideologies that we need to be building off of uh, in order to create a better world by creating a better self, by enhancing our own consciousness to create better behaviors in our world. So the topics we will be talking about is teachability, epistemology, the occult, gnosis, presuppositional worldviews, cognitive dissonance, critical thinking, problem solving, controlled opposition, truth versus falsehood, and morality and freedom. There also will be many, many other topics within this presentation. So let's get right into it. First, I'd like to give a warning and a disclaimer to all those who are new to my work and uh, to those who are new to the SEED conference. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is that this is not all my work. It is an aggregated synthesis of occult knowledge, or knowledge in general, put forward by a vast amount of researchers from a variety of different schools of study. If I happen to have seen further than others, it is only because I have stood upon the shoulders of giants and looked to shoulder others. So I look to be that support pillar for those who are trying to see further. The information contained within this presentation could not possibly accomplish covering all aspects of the topics that I have chosen, nor am I claiming that I have the totality of that knowledge. I am only here to share what I have come to learn and understand as some of the most important hidden knowledge out there. I am not attempting to convince anyone to believe anything that I say or anything contained in this presentation. I only ask you to keep an open mind and seriously consider this information that is being provided. I'm only looking to influence you into doing your due diligence into researching these topics for yourself. The worst thing that you could do is blindly believe what I say and take it without doing your due diligence and doing your own homework. So mainly these three uh, you know, caveats are, hey, this is not all my knowledge. You know, I can't cover all the aspects of all these topics and give you all the answers and nor do I have all those answers. I am still a student as well. And, you know, just don't believe me. Like, look into this information for yourself and decide for yourself. I'm not trying to convince you of this information. You need to do that work for yourself and come to the correct understanding of these topics. Another thing I like to point out is that we find a lot of time that people will attack the messenger. So I made this slide called Some Killing people the may messenger. take offense to some of the information contained within my presentation here today. And if that is the case, so be it. Get as offended as you like. Um, one of the most fallacious things I see happening is people attacking the messenger. So this is the slide called Killing the Messenger. And the truth of the matter is, is that when you first come online, when you first come in contact with the truth, you probably will be uncomfortable because you are awakening to the truth of the current issues that are plaguing your own mind, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, and that which is plaguing the entire world. So it is uncomfortable. 
and depending on how awake you truly are and how balanced your mind is will determine how far your offense may go when it comes to that. So the truth is belligerent in times of mass deceit. This That's just that. It's just belligerent. Thus, it is likely that you could be triggered here today because of the vast amount of lies that you could falsely believe in. When it comes to raising our consciousness, it is of the utmost importance to never crucify the messenger in favor of your own bias. The message is of the most value, not the messenger. When it comes to a message of truth, it has nothing to do with who said it or how it was spoken to you. All that truly is relevant is whether you recognize it as truth or not. It is your responsibility for what you do with the information provided and what you know to be true. There are those who would violently accost the messenger because they find it contradicts their formally held belief systems and even seek vengeance against those who try to help them with their own incorrect ideas. This is because of their own ego attachment and their fallacious, erroneous, axiomatic belief systems. Thus, they would do anything no matter how absurd to defend their falsely held position to take full value from this message lose the ego mindset and you will gain much um i apologize for the typo in that slide i will have that corrected uh when i go to uh, upload this the truth will forever and always remain the truth no matter how many people don't believe in it it doesn't matter if you are the only person that knows the truth in the world and the whole world stands against you it is still the truth as long as you have correctly discerned it to be the truth not because of you but because it is the truth and we're going to get into what is truth so keep calm and don't shoot the messenger you know don't attack the messenger you know uh, this is one of the most uh, horrible things that an individual can do when there's someone trying to send you a message you know these are just words you don't need to attack anybody who is just speaking words to you so discern for yourself find out whether it's true or not and then utilize what is true and get rid of what is not this in no way is a camping zone so even though this is for the initiates and the layman's do not pitch your tent here no camping at this level actually there's no camping when it comes to the truth you have to go all the way and that's it you just have to go all the way the two biggest mistakes for people is not starting and not going all the way they end up pitching their tent somewhere where they feel comfortable this is not a place for you to get comfortable and set up your campfire and sing some songs this is a place that you need to continue to build off of as a stepping stone to move forward across that river and you know it's like trying to pitch a tent right in the middle of you know, the White Rapids or something. You know, you, you don't want to do that. Absolutely not. Um, also, this presentation is not for likes. I don't really care who likes me. I don't care if you like the work I've put together. I don't care what you think about me. I'm not doing this to get likes from people. If you like that, that's great. I'm very happy and I'm very appreciative of that. But that is not my primary intention. My primary intention is to make sure to share this information because it is my moral obligation to do so so we are all going to be initiated now especially those who have not been initiated so the initiation process has begun in the ancient mystery schools the initiation process was held as one of the most sacred acts the truth seeker must pass through a second birth so to say and those who have attained completion in this exalted state were known as the twice born only those who have ascended through the process and have reached the second awakening can start to truly comprehend the mysteries of the self and that's the capital s self the higher case self self the higher self and the realm in which the self operates in the second birth cannot be attained by joining any sect, lodge, or secret order. It must be personally earned through a rigorous and arduous task of regeneration of character and conduct. 
one cannot hope to see this change without the correct understanding of morality and natural law. This is nothing new. This truth has always been with us and will always remain with us. It is a universal requirement for consciousness to expand to new horizons and to experience the depths of the mysteries themselves. There is nothing new here. So there's nothing going to be, you know, profoundly new in this presentation that you probably have never heard before. Actually, a lot of this stuff you've probably heard before, especially if you are familiar with my work or other presenters' works, such as um, Mark Passio's work, because I was directly influenced by his work. And some people may take, um, you know, they may have issues that they see that, oh, some of this work looks just like Mark's work. Well, I was a student of Mark. So, of course, I would take that which I learned and utilize it. When somebody says 2 plus 2 equals 4, and then you learn that from a teacher, and then you go out and say 2 plus 2 equals 4, well, it doesn't matter if you learned it from the teacher. What matters is that it's true. Okay, it doesn't matter. There's nothing new here. That's not what we're trying to do. And I mean, there, you know, it's good to bring in new knowledge, obviously, and new discoveries. I'm not saying that there won't be new discoveries ever, but this is a foundational presentation, meaning you're going to find that it's just the basics of this information. So you've probably heard it over and over and over. But for the initiates, maybe they have not heard it, and maybe their taste is not, um, um, as you know suited for somebody like Mark Passio's work so that's why it's important to have a variety of individuals who can um, really you know give their own flavor to the work and give their own style to the work uh, so that we can really reach other people who do not prefer to listen to certain types of speakers that's one of the greatest things about having um, many people coming together you know many hands make light work and we all add our own personal, you know, uh, consciousness to it, our own style, our own aesthetic styles and our own personal creativity, our choices and our creative uh, applications. So it's very important. So I chose the tarot card of the fool, the card, the fool, because this is the initiation. This is where we all begin. The beginning of the journey starts here. This is a very well-known and renowned um, researcher, esoteric researcher and scholar. In the mystery dramas, the central character was ever the sun god, the role being enacted by the candidate for initiation in person. He went through several initiations as himself the type and representative of the solar divinity in the field of human experience, Alvin Boyd Kuhn. So that's what this is about. We are all archetypally looked at as sons, sons of the divinity, sons of God, sons of creation. We are the light that must shine bright in our world. And this is why in the mystery schools, each individual would be looked at and appointed um, an archetypal position as a son. And, you know, this is about rising out of the depths of darkness into light and we're going to see and that here is another forward. amazing excerpt from the secret teachings of all ages by manly p hall who is probably one of the most amazing and well-researched esotericists and light occultists that has ever existed the criers of the mysteries speak again bidding all men welcome to the house of light the great institution of materiality has failed. The false civilization built by man has turned, and like the monster of Frankenstein, is destroying its creator. Religion wanders aimlessly in the maze of theological speculation. Science batters itself impotently against the barriers of the unknown. Only transcendental philosophy knows the path. Only the illumined reason can carry the understanding part of man upward to the light. Only philosophy can teach man to be born well, to live well, to die well, and in perfect measure be born again. Into this band of the elect, 
those who have chosen the life of knowledge, of virtue, and of unity, the philosophers of the age, invite you. So this is about an invitation to you to become initiated, to turn yourself online, to do your due diligence and ascend up Jacob's ladder, up the stairway of heaven. Metaphor. One of the speak. major problems in our world today is that of censorship. And I mean, this is so heavily, blatantly, and brazenly destroying our liberties left and right. Censorship by the mass corporations, by the mass tech industry, and by government specifically, by these military operations within government itself to make sure that people do not have this information. It is the most devastating thing that we are seeing happen. Well, one of the most devastating things. There are quite a few devastating things obviously happening. But I look at it as a return to the Dark Ages or a place of anti-intelligence. Not just anti-intellectualism, but anti-intelligencism, if that's even a word. But um, anti-intelligence. We are currently in the age of anti-intelligence by way of blatant ignorance and emotional mind control. People have been programmed to be oversensitized to the wrong things and desensitized to the important things. This state of collective neurosis is degrading every aspect of our everyday life. This is the dark age of the dogmatic fervor that can only lead us in one direction, which is the destruction of all that which is sacred, freedom and life. When speech is limited by the collective or the few, it is an act of sheer tyranny. We cannot engage in civil discourse anymore due to this overwhelming cult mindset. And what I mean by cult is a grouping or cabal of individuals that espouse a belief system that is a danger to the rights and liberties of other people. It is completely based in fear and will only lead us into a world filled with passivity, anxiety, conformity, mundanity, and will result in unnecessary chaos and is an act against the betterment of humanity. So, you know, as we see in this picture, we have dogmas, protocols, authority, doctrines, orders, code of contact, norm, establishment, um, Everything here is, you know, false principles. Uh, everything here is, you know, looking to censor each and every person through political correctness, through uh, burning out all that information that does not conform with the, um, the uh, default standard of the authoritarian ideologies. So... Anything that does not go with the overall agenda of this new dark world order will be burned out is how they're doing this. So censorship is the pathway to death. So if we look in history, if we look at our history, we can see that anytime censorship has come about, there has been blood shed afterwards. So we need to be very careful because as censorship starts to restrain our ability to express ideologies more and more, Guarantee there will be blood shed because of that. Guarantee that's going to be the result of that. And I don't want that. I'm not saying I want that and I'm not advocating for that. But that is what happens when you restrain people's ability to have civil discourse about ideas. So we need to be very, very careful when it comes to this. And that's what the Seed Conference is about. It's about being egalitarian with this information because for far too long has there been a power differential between those who hold the information and those who do not. So whether that's from religious organizations or cults or, you know, um, secret societies or anything like that, from governments, from intelligent agencies, we need to get this information out far and wide and get it to the people so that they can make their own decisions because they are wise at some level and they are capable of discerning for themselves. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move forward. And one of my favorite founding fathers, Thomas Paine, he who dares not to offend cannot be honest. So, you know, we're in this world where everybody wants to sugarcoat and euphemize everything. Uh, they 
want to not offend you. They're scared to speak certain words. They're scared to look a certain way. They're scared to dress a certain way, to walk a certain way, to move a certain way, to go to a certain place because they might offend somebody. You know, well, he who dares not to offend cannot be honest. You cannot be speaking the truth because guess what? The truth is going to offend you. You know, especially people who are living in a bias or living through cognitive dissonance. You know, that's just the truth of the matter. You can't escape that. People are going to get offended. And just because people get offended does not mean that you should not speak your mind about certain topics. You know, we have to speak up more. Moving right along into some of the main topics. So one of the biggest things here is that we have to understand what it truly means to be teachable. And I have a very simple diagram on the screen here, um, moving from one extreme to the other. We have on the far left, which would be absolute closed-mindedness, a left brain imbalance, which would be arrogant. And then as we move to the right, we have cynical, skeptical, teacher more so in the middle of the bell curve and then student on the other side of that middle point trusting gullible and naivete and that's moving all the way into the right brain imbalance which would be too open-minded so what we need to do here is to strike a balance between being a teacher and a student i am a teacher and a student i'm constantly learning and i'm constantly teaching that's how we do this. That's what we need to do is be in the middle of this bell curve because this is where you're going to get the most learning from. How much do you learn? Um, this is one of the biggest issues I find with people. Most people are rigidly skeptical or arrogant and cynical, and they just do not have an open mind at all. And um, this is especially true with left brain eggheads. And then a lot of the new age community is completely so open-minded that they'll believe anything. They'll take anything into their mind and not filter it. And they tend to be very emotionally mind controlled because of this. They tend to be, um, you know, very, very uh, at risk for dark manipulation. And they just don't see this. They, they just don't care at a certain level, it seems like. Um, so to truly be teachable is to be in the middle of this bell curve. And the way that we do that is by balancing the left and right hemispheres of our neocortex and of our polarities in consciousness. This is an amazing quote by Albert Churchward. Only one has to think and understand that the pursuit and acquisition of truth is of infinite concernment to mankind in the study of the evolution of the human race and the origin and beliefs and meaning of all the doctrines found throughout the world. By the cultivation of our reason, we are better enabled to distinguish good from evil, as well as truth from falsehood. Both these are matters of the highest importance, whether we regard this life or the life to come. Okay, so this is all about being in that, you know, teachability position. Are you the most teachable? Are you the um, individual that will learn the most? Uh, because that's going to play out in how you apply that information. Um, is your discernment. Are you going to discern what is true and what is not? And the way that you have accurate discernment is by cultivating your reason, by exercising your reason, your reasoning skills. Um, reason is a valuable, valuable asset. And I look at reason is um, the middle point between the two hemispheres. It's not solely a left brain um, imbalance. So just to give a little bit here, I think that, um, you know, for those who are not familiar with the left and right hemisphere dynamic and the triune aspect of the brain, you know, you can find that information all over the place. I recommend going to the Cubbyhole, www.cubbyhole.com. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. Uh, we go over the triune aspect of the brain very thoroughly. And that's also a great place for the initiate. So, you know, some of this is pertaining to um, 
more of uh, someone who has already been initiated and is still looking for um, you know more answers so this presentation is not solely pointed at those who have not been initiated and I should have clarified that at the beginning but to move right along I think this is a great great uh, you know little excerpt from one of his books I can't remember which book it came out of but you know it, it is saying that truth is of the most important and we have to cultivate our reasoning so that we can discern um, truth from falsehood so that we can discern good from evil morality from immorality um, an action based in as a right an action based as a right or an action based as a wrong so what is the occult what is occult knowledge most people when they hear this word and i still get it to this day i ask people constantly what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word occult and immediately people say evil they say satanism they say um you know people sitting out in the woods doing rituals when it has nothing to do with things like this i mean it it can have some to do with some of that but that's not what the word actually means the word occult is derived from the latin adjective occultus which means hidden from sight which comes from the latin verb oclatare to hide to conceal to keep secret both are in turn derived from the latin noun oculus which means eye so this is hidden from the eye hidden from sight and it could be looked at as the third eye as well the spiritual knowledge that is hidden from us so um, the, the whole truth is often hidden out of plain sight. And just like this iceberg, most of it is underneath that level point of the water. Um, just a little bit is peeking out above the water, but the majority of the mass of the iceberg is underneath. And that's how occult knowledge is. That is the occult knowledge, that which is hidden underneath that, you know, that threshold of water. C.W. Leadbeater says, how shall we define occultism? The word is derived from the Latin oculus, hidden, so that it is the study of the hidden laws of nature. Since all the great laws of nature are in fact working in the invisible world far more than the visible, occultism involves the acceptance of a much wider view of nature than that which is ordinarily taken. The occultist then is a man who studies all the laws of nature that he can reach or of which he can hear and as a result of his study identifies himself with these laws and devotes his life to the service of evolution very profound quote so here is a working definition for the word occult occult knowledge constitutes both the knowledge of the workings of the human psyche consciousness and the knowledge of natural law both the seen physical laws and the unseen spiritual or metaphysical laws occult knowledge is a tool the level of consciousness of its wielder determines whether or not the result is good or evil so just like in this image here you can have a positive result with occult knowledge where you're like cutting these vegetables and you have hidden information uh, about the secret technique of cutting, for example. That can be a form of occult knowledge. Um, or a negative result, such as violating somebody by assaulting them with a knife and like murdering them. You know, taking that which does not belong to you, taking their life, taking their right to physical safety. So it all depends upon the level of consciousness that is wielding that knowledge and how they choose to wield that knowledge. So what is the difference between dark occultism and light occultism? Well, dark occultism is an inductive model intended to hide and conceal mostly the invisible spiritual, but also the visible physical sciences and laws, which are not widely known to the general population. In order for them to create and maintain a power differential between those who have this knowledge and those who do not have such knowledge. This is used to ensure humanity's enslavement 
and to ensure that the dark occultists remain in power for all time and humanity remains enslaved for all time. So a dark occultist and a dark occult group seeks to create this power differential by concealing this knowledge so that they can keep it compartmentalized and away from those who might challenge their false authority and challenge their immoral behaviors. The dark occultists of our time are not, you know, people out in the woods practicing, uh, you know, witchcraft or something like that. They are people in uh, a multitude of institutions from government to science to the medical industry to you know, the big tech industries to the media. Oh God, media is a big one. You know, th there are top level dark occultists that are working through all of these um, interconnect interconnected networks of global um, institutionalized systems that ensure that we remain at this low level of consciousness. And trust me, they are utilizing all the tools they have to make sure that we are suppressed and to make sure that we remain mentally enslaved, emotionally enslaved, and physically enslaved so that they can continue to grow their benefits and grow you know, their little bits of freedom. Uh, at the expense of other people. It's absolute Darwinism taken to the extreme. It's the it's the idea of the survival of the most ruthless, or really the survival of the people who know the most, really. You know, that's what this comes down to. So it's also religious institutions. You know, you're going to find that religion has some of the darkest dark occultists in existence. And, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people here are pretty familiar with how dark our world is and how um, dark these individuals are and how immoral they are for what they are doing. Um, so, you know, I just want to make it clear, like, this is not something to be romanticized or sugarcoated. These people are evil. They are the evil incarnate. They are absolute evil incarnate. And they are doing the most horrific deeds onto our planet and onto the people of this planet, onto the animals of this planet. Uh, and we need to put an end to that. And this is what this is about, is by leveling the playing field, by getting this information out to the people. This is what they do not want. They do not want people to be well-educated when it comes to the sciences, especially the sciences of natural law. So vice versa, what is light occultism? Light occultism is an educative model intended to preserve and protect the invisible spiritual and visible physical sciences which are not widely known to the general population in order for them to be utilized and applied when the initiate is ready for the ascension and evolution of their consciousness. It is important to know that they are not withholding the knowledge to create a power differential. They understand that the knowledge comes with a heavy load of responsibility and needs to be treated as sacred, otherwise it will be lost. And that's one of the things that the dark occultists want to do. They want to make sure that this knowledge is either assimilated into their own perverted and sick and twisted ideology so that they can use it, or they want it gone. Because anything that threatens their control and their power, they don't want out there. So they'll do whatever it takes, you know. Um, I mean, they, they'll burn it out of existence and it will be gone. So a light occultist will, you know, seek to protect that information by whatever means necessary. And this is done by a state of unity. This is done collectively with the people who are light occultists. And we're going to talk about that. Um, at the end of this presentation a little bit more. So the true light occultist is really a de-occultist in the modern era. They are those who are trying to level the playing field by spreading the information as wide and as far as possible. The de-occultist is an individual motivated by an intense intuitive drive and care about discovering the hidden knowledge of the self and the realm in which the self exists and operates in. Observing the world around them and within them, they gain critical and valuable hidden information, then process that information to come to the correct understanding of the truth, and then act upon that understanding to manifest true wisdom. 
with their great and fine-tuned ability to discern quickly and efficiently reality from illusion. They work courageously and vigorously to advise, assist, and support those who are in need of such aid and knowledge. Through their excellent deductive and contemplation skills, they seek to shine light upon the deceit, corruption, and lies of the world in order to serve truth and a higher cause than themselves. They leave no stone unturned in their arduous task for truth. They are always seeking to apply solutions within their capability for real and positive change. They are in complete service to truth, love, and freedom, and will always act as the defenders of them. The light work is the right work. So as deocultists and as initiates, we must understand what the truth actually is, which leads me to my next slide. Truth versus perception. What is truth? We need to have a firm foundation and a simplistic, grounded, epistemological basis for the definition of truth. So here's a working definition for truth. Truth is that which absolutely is. It is objective, meaning it is not based upon the perceptions of any sentient beings, which are capable of wavering dramatically away from that which is truth. The truth is unwavering. It is immutable. It is that which has occurred in the past and that which is currently occurring in the present. The truth is singular, meaning that there is only one way things have actually happened. That which is truth will forever and always remain the truth. And a lot of people have issues with this definition. Get over it. That's what it is. It is simply that which is, or that which absolutely is. And I picked this image of Ma'at, the judge of morality in the Egyptian tradition. She's an Egyptian goddess, and you weigh the heart against a feather on the scales of justice, and if your heart weigh, is as light as a feather and comes out balanced on the scales, then it means you have been a moral being. And I highly recommend that people check out my first presentation, uh, an occult synthesis or a synthesis of occult knowledge, part one, an introduction to natural law. To understand more about Ma'at, where I define her much deeper. Truth versus perception. What is perception? Etymologically, the word perceive is derived from the Latin verb percipere, which is in turn derived from the Latin prefix per, which means through, and the Latin verb sapere or capere, take in, to seize, to understand. So a working definition for perception is to become aware or conscious of that which is, to discover, recognize, discern, and or understand with clarity, direct or indirect intuitive cognition and awareness of elements of the environment through physical and spiritual sensation interpreted in the light of experience. So if we take this picture, this is a illusion of perception. Is that person actually as tall as that church? Is that person actually grabbing the peak of that church? No, absolutely not. It's an illusion of perception, meaning that it is not true. It is an illusion. And this is how illusions work. From a certain point of view, they look real. But once you broaden your point of view and you change your perspective, then you understand that that is actually not the truth. So perception is a tool, like a lens. Our work is to focus our perception to see reality with clarity, to see clearly. So perception is like a lens. So to see more clearly, sometimes we put on glasses to see words and shapes and forms more clearly. Perception is our glasses for consciousness. And depending on how well your prescription of glasses are, 
will determine how well you can see with clarity. So let's uh, look at this graph here. Let's take this straight line, this um, dark blue straight line as the plane of truth and these wave lines, these sine wave lines as our frequency of perception and consciousness. A higher frequency, mean a, meaning a more clear perception, means a, a uh, more frequent interaction with that flat line. A lower frequency means less interaction with that flat line. So let's just say that top light blue um, frequency is a frequency of love, and that bottom red frequency is a frequency of fear, which is the case. Fear tends to be a low, elongated frequency, meaning you're interacting with that which is less frequently. So what we want to do is raise our consciousness to a higher frequency so that we can align ourselves with the truth. If we raise the frequency to such a degree, it would be indistinguishable from that line of truth. So a higher frequency of alignment with that which is reality and truth, or more frequent interaction, contact with reality, truth, and natural law. So this is how perception works. We have a choice to enhance our frequency, to amplify it, and it is our responsibility to do so. As George Orwell said, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. So this really goes with what I was talking about earlier, with those who are harassed and ridiculed for speaking the truth, those who are censored. Everybody hates people who are speaking the truth. It's because they don't understand the importance and the power of the truth. They don't really understand what truth actually is, and they are in a subjective point of view where they want to play God over what truth actually is. People want to claim that they're God over truth, that they get to deem what is true and what is not true. Not that the actual results or the elements in reality show us that, or the, um, um, the experience, the consequences of those things show us the truth, what has actually happened. It's that they think that they get to claim that they have a monopoly over what truth actually is. And I'm not saying that this is true because I say it's true. It is true beyond whether I say it or not. It has nothing to do with me. So in alignment with this conference, this is the Seed Truth Method. The Seed Truth Method is the arduous task of planting seeds of truth into the minds of those who are sorely lacking in that knowledge and hope that they may fertilize those seeds to reap the fruits of that knowledge. The seed truth method has been used throughout all of human history as a means of preservation for the sacred knowledge that helps to evolve the species into a higher type. It is the most important when it comes to planting the seeds of truth in progeny for posterity. We must not let our expectations of what others will do with the seed to prevent us from planting the seed. Never underestimate the power of planting a seed of truth in a fertile mind. I see this far too often with people where they get very discouraged from planting seeds of truth because some people just don't fertilize those seeds. They don't take care of them. And you just can't have that expectation of like, what people are going to do with what you tell them with those seeds. You got to give it to them and then let it be. You know, you can't get into the, the emotional idea of, you know, oh, they didn't do anything with it. Why am I doing this? You just got to plant it and then let it be. Some will, some will sprout and some won't. And you will see that. And the ones who sprout, you'll be very thankful for seeing that. And the ones who don't, well, just let it go. Don't get all caught up in the emotional drama of that. So education versus indoctrination. 
Obviously, we are living in a world right now filled with indoctrination, with mind control. Indoctrination means to conform a person or group to not challenge and accept as truth a set of beliefs, axioms that are fundamentally dogmatic. The idea here is to make sure that nobody challenges the dogma of the state or of religious institutionalized belief systems so that those can continue to go on. So indoctrination is about getting you to conform to a set of ideas that are dogmatic so that you do not challenge it, that you do not seek the actual truth. You just blindly believe it. A working definition for indoctrination is a mind control technique to condition a person to only repeat the information provided to them by authority figures, to be molded into a person who cannot critically think and challenge the state-approved dogma, one who does not think outside prescribed consensus of authority and government-funded science or scientism. And as the great George Carlin, Carlin said, as the great George Carlin said, excuse me, when your education limits your imagination, it's called indoctrination. So literally, it is the death of imagination. You can't think. You can't imagine anything else besides what they've given you. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And as one of our other founding fathers said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. So what's true education? A lot of people don't understand what true education actually is. So what is true education? A lot of people confuse indoctrination with actual education. It has nothing to do with your degrees or any papers that you have to prove that you've been educated by the state. That's not true education. I mean, you can get some education there, but most of it is, you know, government funded uh, indoctrination to make you believe in a set of dogmatic ideas. So let's look at the word education. The etymological definition of the word education is derived from the Latin presupposition e or e, meaning out of, and the Latin verb ducere. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I could be wrong. Meaning to lead. So it means to lead out of. To lead somebody out of what? The process of education is an alchemical transformation of one's own ignorance, meaning darkness, into knowledge, meaning light. True education is that of a process of illumination. It is the ever-progressive journey of raising one's own consciousness into a higher state so that they can make better use of their psyche and the tools in which they were gifted with from creation. So it literally means out of darkness into light. Education means coming out of darkness of ignorance and into the light of knowledge. And I used here the Freemasonic First Degree Tracing Board. And for those who have been initiated, especially into Freemasonry, they will understand why I have used this degree and this tracing board, because it literally is an allegorical artistic statement of the alchemical transformation of one coming out of darkness into light, coming off the checkered board floor of ignorance and internal duality up to the light of knowledge. So, what is one of the main problems with education? Well, obviously, it is the blind belief in authority. And, you know, obviously, another reason why is because these 1% uh, ruling class have control over all the apparatuses of education. But let's just say even in homeschooling, what is another problem with the educational um, method that we have? Well, one reason that it fails so much is because it does not delve or dive deeply into the mystery tr traditions. It does not take us through the initiation process into the ancient mystery schools and into the true knowledge of things like natural law, morality, 
and the other amazing, you know, uh, mysteries and the plethora of knowledge um, that has been laid down by the great, great researchers that have come before us. So the mystery schools were in a set of seven um, at, at later on, and but at first there was only a set of three. These are the three primary ones that I chose to go with. Um, Kabbalah, which is on the far left with the Tree of Life, um, and then you have Freemasonry in the middle, and then you have the Tarot, the Book of the Tarot. Um, all these are archetypal, allegorical representations of the journey of the self. And this is about symbolic literacy. And that's one of the major things that modern education tries to eradicate from an individual's mind. They want to make you symbol illiterate rather than make you symbol literate. And they want to push you into a left brain imbalance mainly become a, a uh, drone, you know, make you a dunce, really. So Kabbalah is an amazing tradition, and I highly recommend that each person study all three of these in conjunction. You cannot understand these without studying all three of these together. But if you notice here that you have very similar archetypal representations, you have the three columns in the Tree of Life of the Kabbalah. You have the three pillars in the first degree tracing board. And then you also have two pillars and then a third, which could be looked at as a pillar, the sacred feminine goddess in the middle of the high priestess card of the tarot. But if you look behind her, there is also a Tree of Life, which represents the Kabbalistic tree. These are all saying the same thing. These are all ubiquitous within their symbolism at the allegorical level. I'm not going to explain all these because this presentation is supposed to be pretty short, but I guarantee that when you start to open these up, you will understand why it is so important to integrate the mystery schools and mystery traditions into the educational method. Without these, we are just going to continue to do the same things over and over in our society and continue to get the same results. This is why these traditions have been so um, eradicated and frowned upon by religious institutions and by, um, you know, dogmatic belief systems and dogmatic people of this world. But yes, one of the biggest issues is that we do not integrate a symbolic um, archetypal progressive initiation for the students to come out of darkness into light. And that's what the mystery schools were about. They were about bringing an individual out of darkness and into the light of knowledge, into the light of understanding themselves and understanding the environment that they are in. And there are many rites and rituals that one must go through to understand these things. And they are very important. What is a mystery school? By definition, a mystery school is a body of initiates who have dedicated themselves to preserving, protecting, and perpetuating the mystery teachings, especially that of natural law. Throughout the ages, the mystery schools have hidden in plain sight the most important and crucial information for the uplift of human consciousness and the evolution of the species. They have built sacred temples all over the world and provided services both to the public and behind closed doors for only those who have eyes to see and those who have ears to hear. The initiates are those who are known as the guardians, the protectors, the light bearers, the teachers, the healers, the record keepers, the magicians, and the watchers, among many other names. The modern mystery school is an international community of light workers initiated into the ancient tradition of service to truth, compassion, and empowerment. They believe in the axiom of, or maxim of know thyself and you will know the universe. To know yourself is to know others. To know the universe is to know God. By whichever name you choose to use, being whether you want to use God or you know, you can use whatever. I'm sure there's quite a few atheists that will have an issue with my presentation. Um, 
But yes, I am not an atheist by any means, and atheism is a failure in consciousness. And um, I will be explaining that in the future, in a future presentation. Each mystery school's primary duty is to protect the ancient system of enlightenment, healing, manifestation, and transformation so that they can continue to be practiced and shared today, specifically for progeny and posterity. These ancient brotherhoods and sisterhoods serve the truth and the one great spirit by offering their services from the gnosis of their own experiences to all those who wish to broaden their understanding of themselves in the realm in which they operate. So it's very important to understand that if you come to them and ask specifically with the light occultists and light occultism uh, schools, uh, you will be granted that knowledge you will have access to that knowledge, unlike the dark occult. The dark occultists will not grant you the highest levels of the mystery schools. They will not give you access to that. Without injecting the mystery teachings into a newly emergent educational model, we will not see any type of true paradigm shift. That's what all the light workers are trying to truly do, is bring all this knowledge into a synthesis so that we can really you know preserve protect and perpetuate this knowledge out especially to the youth and that is for all of progeny and for the betterment of posterity obviously so i don't believe uh, we will have any great change until we see the mystery schools reemerge in a very healthy fashion uh, especially when it comes to homeschooling and uh, obviously when it comes to modern education we need to get far and far very far away from that, obviously. We need to get very, very far away from the modern indoctrinational system, which is just nothing but a bunch of mind control. And we need to decentralize this information. So as Manly P. Hall put it, the preeminence of any philosophical system can be determined only by the excellence of its products. The mysteries have demonstrated the superiority of their culture by giving to the world minds of such overwhelming greatness, souls of such beatific vision, and lives of such outstanding impeccability that even after a lapse of ages, the teachings of these individuals constitute the present spiritual, intellectual, and ethical standards of the race. And it's also true, vice versa, that the present ethical standards or, or moral standards of our race has come from the, you know, the uh, minds of dogma from the past. So what happened to the mysteries? Well, one reason is the mob destroyed the mysteries. This is not the totality of the reasons that the mysteries have been pretty much obliterated. Obviously, there's a lot to this, and it's very sophisticated. But this is one reason that I'm going to point out. One reason is because it was due to the mob that the mysteries were mishandled and ripped out of the temples by force. Of course, we should all have access to this knowledge, but with this knowledge comes great responsibility to treat it with care and ensure that it is not destroyed for future generations. Unfortunately, this was not the case when it was taken from the temples, and due to this lack of responsibility, we are now worse off, in my opinion, than we were when it was kept in the hands of the occultists and the esoteric teachers. in neurology, and then without ever learning how to handle that knowledge or learning the knowledge itself, started to do neurosurgery on people using their papers as credentials to boast that they know what they are doing. What would unfold from this? Undoubtedly, it would lead to lots of death and suffering onto the people that they practice neurology onto. Or neurosurgery onto. I'm not saying that the knowledge should be withheld, but I am saying there is a reason for an intuitive structure to teach us the knowledge and how to be responsible with it. The knowledge belongs to all of humanity, and it is our personal responsibility to keep it intact for the well-being of all life. The knowledge has to be completely distributed freely to the masses, including those who may use it for negative purposes, to help balance out the equation of the extreme power differential between those who hold the knowledge and those who do not. 
Unlike the past like light occultists, our job is now to ensure that the knowledge is preserved by decentralization. The knowledge belongs to all of humanity, not one group or individual. So my point with this slide is that with this knowledge, we have to understand there was a means for a hierarchical structure to teach individuals how to preserve and how to distribute the knowledge properly. And that's what we need to do. We need to understand how to handle the knowledge so that it is not misused by ourselves. It is our responsibility to not misuse the knowledge. And we really need to fully grasp what that means and take full accountability for what we are doing with what we know. So the next part of the presentation is called axiomatic premises. So what is an axiom? An axiom comes from the Latin word axioma, which means authority, literally, that which is thought worthy or fit. Axiom, a fundamental belief that is widely accepted as true because it is perceived to either be self-evident or particularly useful to those who accept it. So when it comes to axioms, they can be in alignment with truth or they could be far out of alignment with truth. So we need to understand that this is a fundamental part of you know, our belief systems. It's like a belief that has been firmly calcified in the mind that we are absolutely going to behave off of. So what we need to do is we need to align our axioms, our belief systems, completely with objective truth for us to create that which we say we want. And to do that, our axiom should be based upon four basic, fundamental, philosophical concepts. And these are the four branches of philosophy. So the word philosophy literally means love for wisdom. Philos means love, and then Sophia means wisdom. So we have these four branches of philosophy, and people who have studied philosophy should readily know these branches. We have epistemology, we have logic and reasoning, we have metaphysics or ontology, we have ethics and axiology. So these are the four basic branches of philosophy. Now I'm not going to explain all of these, we will cover epistemology a little bit in this one. Um, but when I do an, a, an extended presentation on this on the Cubbyhole website, I will be going and breaking all four of these down. So the role of epistemology. Well, what does the word epistemology mean? Epistemology is from Greek, episteme which means knowledge, and in ology, it means the study of. So it's the study of knowledge. Epistemology is the study of the nature and grounds of knowledge, especially with reference to its limits, validity, and scope. Epistemology is an investigation of what distinguishes justified knowledge from opinion. So what it is, is it shows how much can we really know, uh, whether knowledge actually exists or not, and can we share knowledge? So having a firm basis in epistemology gets us out of the psychopathology of solipsism. Solipsism being uh, the idea that you are alone by yourself and you cannot share any knowledge and everything is a figment of your own mind. Uh, solus ipse, meaning alone by the self, and everything is you know, created from your monad mind, that you pretty much are God of all things, and that all other things are an illusion of your mind. And if you shared anything that you knew, you're just sharing it to yourself. So why even do that? Why do anything? Because, you know, there, there's no point in doing anything. So um, for more information on this, you can go to my first presentation. But a great allegory for understanding the basis of epistemology is Plato's Allegory of the Cave, where we have individuals trapped in a cave, and you have a, a depiction of this on the right-hand side of the screen here, um, and they are locked in chains looking at a wall, and there's a fire, and then they have these um, these shapes being 
projected on the wall from objects behind them and they don't know that these objects are there. Um, they think that the actual shadows on the walls, the shapes that the shadows are taking, are literally reality. And that's what they believe that reality actually is, uh, when in fact they are believing in an illusion. So one of these individuals actually gets out and realizes that this is an illusion. And on his escape from this cave, he comes to the light and at first he's blinded and it hurts because the truth hurts when you first see the light. It, it blinds you for a moment, you know, you, um, you're in shock because of that. And then he proceeds to try to go and awaken the other people in the cave and get them out of this madness that they're in. And just like it happens with us as, uh, you know, the great workers, as light builders, um, people think you're crazy. They're like, no, that's not true. You know, this is reality. These shadows on the wall are reality. So I highly recommend any individual uh, studying philosophy to look in the allegory of the cave. There's a lot more to it, but that's just a simple version of that. And obviously I'm skimming through this stuff pretty quickly because, you know, I can make this four hours long, but I have a short time period to be able to get through all these. So the role of epistemology is crucial for those who seek to understand truth and natural law, law for it deals with the fundamental justifications for the objective nature of reality. It is the basis of our temple of knowledge from which all of our assertions are built upon. Thus, why the dark occult and those who are the victims perpetuate a false ideological idea about epistem epistemology. The main purpose of epistemology is to understand whether or not knowledge of the physical world and the metaphysical spiritual world, world can be held as a firm basis for our worldviews. It is intended to educate us of the truth and to dissolve our solipsistic illusions and ego illusions of the way we want things to be compared to how they actually are. This line of thought deals with questions such as, what is knowledge? How can it be justified? How can we actually know? Can knowledge be shared? What is the purpose of knowledge and why do we know? So a great allegory that's very similar to the allegory of the cave is the matrix. And when he first is logged out of the matrix and they're doing um, rehabilitation on his muscles and on his body and on his mind, uh, he wakes and he opens his eyes and he says, why do my eyes hurt so much? Uh, Neo wakes up and says that. And Morpheus says, because you've never used them before. This is how most people are. Their eyes are atrophied. They've never used them before. Before we can break out of prison, we must first realize that we are caged. Okay? So, you know, that's the whole thing here. If you don't realize you're in a cage, if you've been so conditioned that you think that the condition of slavery is actually freedom, then why would you ever fight for freedom? You think you are free. You don't know any better. You've never used your eyes. You think what you see is the reality of the situation. One of the problems with epistemology, especially when it pertains to modern philosophy, is that it has been balkanized. So this is called balkanization of epistemology. Balkanization means to take a geographical region and split it up into... Uh, fractures, like fracture it into uh, different components. Pretty much it's a divide and conquer method. So you fracture a geographical region, a country, um, into smaller states, and then they fight amongst each other because they all have different moral codes based upon moral relativity or different um, you know, uh, standards for their laws and their belief systems. So this is a great divide and conquer methodology. But how does this apply to epistemology? Well, the knowledge itself of philosophy has been balkanized across the world. It has been fractured. This is one way that um, the dark occultists keep themselves in power by keeping the knowledge divided in our minds. So this is why we must create a synthesis with all this knowledge, especially when it pertains to the mystery schools and our origins. 
Due to the balkanization of epistemology, humanity has been led into a position where synthesizing the fragmented pieces of true knowledge is, moral, is our moral responsibility and one of the most arduous tasks that we must undertake. This process was done intentionally by those who hold this knowledge in order to keep humanity in a state of ignorance that it is currently in. It is literally the divide and conquer strategy through the level of information we have access to. By keeping the information divided and fractured, it ensures that humanity will be in a cycle of bickering over the trivialities while the dark occult continue to push forward with their agenda and of world domination. This is one of the biggest issues in philosophy is that modern circles of philosophical dis discussion, nobody ever comes to the objective truth or conclusion or a conclusive place of understanding. Rather, this incorrect approach to philosophy is simply empty rhetorical or rhetoric that does not get us the answers that we need. Apologize for not getting through that very well but the point is is that you know in modern philosophy we just see these never ending debates about specifically about whether god exists or not um but they do have never ending debates about ethical theories about ontology about the nature of reason about the nature of knowledge and you know these debates have led us um, to come to an under, understanding of quite a few things, but it's simply a lot of rhetoric, empty rhetoric specifically now, because all the answers that to these questions have already been answered for thousands of years, and we're still asking the same questions. We've never grown beyond this stuff, and why is that? Well, it's because these things have never been fully flushed out and fully integrated into a um, world philosophy because it's all fractured it's all been divided and it has never been used to create a a fundamental uh, worldview for all of humanity uh, that is the truth within these debates or these discussions about these ideas so yeah sometimes you do come to the truth and you do find some people in philosophical circles that actually do have some real knowledge because they finally have you know opened their eyes and their their eyes have uh, turned on their third eye specifically has turned on and they understand these things but most of them still dabble in the idea of whether reality actually exists or not you know and it's just absolutely ridiculous um so it's very important to study these things especially when it comes to trying to make a change in the world because without tackling these ideas then we really aren't going to change anything because what we're changing is truly in the mind that's what we have to change is the mind to change the physical reality and we have to get our epistemology straight to change the mind and one way of doing that is by synthesizing all the knowledge by reconstruct reconstructing all the knowledge back into one tapestry and that's kind of what we're all doing here today And some of this is done through Gnosis. So what is the role of Gnosis? Well, what is Gnosis? Gnosis means direct knowledge through personal experience as opposed to knowledge that we are told or believe in through other people's experiences or things that we read in books and stuff like that. Gnosis is conscious experiential knowledge, not merely intellectual data or conceptual ideas, beliefs, or theories. The role of Gnosis is an evolutionary process of ascension and consciousness. It helps us to shape our character and our overall moral integrity. Gnosis is not only an intellectual experience, but also an intuitive experience, which both must strike a balance with each other in harmony with nature itself to receive the full benefits and gifts from the divine. So gnosis literally means knowledge, but it's a specific type of knowledge. It is direct knowledge. It's knowledge that you have experienced for yourself. It's like you putting your hand on a stove that's hot and understanding that 
it burns. You have direct knowledge of that now. Now you absolutely know. The thing with Gnosis is that this is why I added the intuitive part of the experience in here. Um, there's a part of consciousness that doesn't want us to constantly repeat the same mistakes over and over and over. And there's an intuitive part of us that allows us to know, hey, we shouldn't do that. And the reason why is because humanity has experienced this at a certain level, and it's been epigenetically written into our being um, to a level that we can access that experience at a certain level. Um, and this is so we don't constantly repeat the same things over and over for all of time, for all of eternity. Um, to gain access to this, though, some call it the Akashic Records. Um, some call it the, the, uh, the field or the ether. Um, there's many different names for it. Uh, the quintessence. Uh, but some people um, can access this. We all can access this. It's a part of our fundamental being. But we have to fully awaken. We have to align our chakras. We have to balance our hemispheres. We really have to get in alignment uh, with ourselves and with nature itself. And then we can access this deeper part of the experiences that our ancestors had and that way we don't have to suffer the same things over and over and over for all eternity. Um, yeah, there's a point for going through trial and error as a child, but at a certain level, once you've grown out of that, um, you know, for the betterment of the all, for the, for the ascension of the entire species, there's also a part of us that gives us access to that file set of, of data from our history, our ancestral history of experiences that allows us to move forward. So that's part of our collective gnosis that we have to tap into. And I really enjoy this depiction of a being who is obviously suffering and then his astral spirit or his true being, his higher self is ascending up um, with his wings spread you know, wide. And uh, I, I just really love this depiction because that's what real Gnosis is coming out of that state of being in that lower, lower vibration into that higher vibration and raising up and flying and gliding up high into the light. So as Plato says, ignorance is the root and stem of every evil. So we must get ourselves out of ignorance. We have to stop ignoring the information that is crucial to our benefit um, and to our well-being. So we are in a collective state of cognitive dissonance. And this is something that must be mended. I'm sure that all of us have experienced cognitive dissonance in one way, shape, or form, or another. So what is cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance is a state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude change. Cognitive dissonance occurs when a person holds contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values and is typically experienced as psychological stress when they participate in an action that goes against one or more of them. The discomfort is triggered by the person's belief clashing with the new information perceived, wherein they try to find a way to resolve the contradictory or the contradiction to reduce their discomfort. In this condition, when two actions or ideas are not psychologically consistent with each other, it is the individual's responsibility to become consistent and non-contradictory. So this is when we do things different than how we feel or how we think, or we hold a, an idea and we believe in an idea, but then new information comes to our mind and we know it to be true, but yet we still continue to hold that idea um, as true that we know, which is not true. So we're holding something that is true and not true at the same time and trying to use that as a fundamental ideology to work from. It is literally internal dualism where the mind is in a schism. And from this, we create lots of suffering. So I got this funny 
meme on the right side here. Is your brain uncomfortable? Could you be wrong? Is it is your mind stress? Try cognitive dissonance dissipator. And it's like an ad for um you know some kind of medicine or you know some t type of uh, remedy for your cognitive dissonance. So I thought it was kind of funny. So France Fanon said sometimes people who hold a core belief that is very strong when they are presented with evidence that works against that belief the new evidence cannot be accepted it would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable and called cognitive dissonance and because it is so important to protect the core belief they will rationalize ignore and even deny anything that doesn't fit with the core belief so that's what i'm saying is that you provide new information and let's say like the state is an immoral condition that must be you know done away with because it's based on duress and coercion and somebody holds that fundamentally and emotionally very close um, to their heart and very deeply in their mind and no matter how much evidence you give them to show that that is the truth of the matter they still won't believe it because it contradicts their um, fundamental ideology that is erroneous and dogmatic. Which leads me into the next section, which is critical thinking and feeling. We always hear about critical thinking, but what about critical feeling? We have lost touch with our true care, and due to this, we allow far too much evil to run amok in our world. We have become addicted to apathy and selfishness because it is comfortable for us to stay in those conditions, which in the long run does nothing but cause more suffering. We need to reactivate our conscience and start to critically feel again about the issues taking place in the world. This is the process of awakening, for it is the only path to gaining the emotions that are required to push us into change. So we must balance the cerebral cortex the cerebral part of ourselves the the two hemispheres with the heart and this is known as heart-based consciousness we have to have a balance between the heart and the brain that is what we need so we can't just be you know thinkers we have to be feelers we have to activate our heart-based consciousness and i feel that that is one of the um the failures of a lot of people is that they just don't care. The state of apathy is one of the issues in our world. This is also known as internal opposition. And this is when the heart and the mind are contradictory to each other, or internal dualism, where we feel one thing and we think another. And we need to bring a balance between those two things. A balance must be a balance must be struck between the heart and brain. This is what is known as heart-based consciousness. It is when we have harmonized or resonated our biology with our higher mind. Far too often are we in an internal state of dualism when our heart and brain are having a communication breakdown between the two. So we need communication synthesis or unity between the heart and brain. Non-contradiction between thoughts and emotions is one of the things that we need. Non-contradiction between the sacred masculine thoughts and the sacred feminine emotional sides of our consciousness. So what are the main steps to problem solving? One, we must become conscious that there is a problem. We must be aware and fully recognize that there is an issue taking place. To do this, we must conquer our fear of the negative or the fear-based denial of the problem in order to take the required steps to solving the problem. Two, we must come to the knowledge that the symptoms are just the effect of an underlying root cause. Therefore, we must realize treating the symptoms will never solve the problem. In order to do this, we must make an accurate and efficient diagnosis of the cause of the problem. The implementation of a solution, which is number three, requires a knowledge acquired by an accurate diagnosis. 
we then must take the required action necessary to rectify the causal factor which has led to the manifest result of the problem. So this is very important to understand, and I'm sure a lot of people here do understand this. To actually change the issue, we can never start from the realm of the effect. We have to start from the realm of causality meaning we must first trace it back through the symptoms, through the effects, to the cause, and then work from there. This is a great quote by Travis Walton. I've come to realize that the biggest problem anywhere in the world is that people's perceptions of reality are compulsively filtered through the screening mesh of what they want and do not want to be true. So a lot of people are in a lot of um, deep states of denial when it comes to the current problems of our world. The Law of Manifestation Since human beings do not already have the things they say they want or need, it follows logically and reasonably that the knowledge of the requirements to obtaining those things they say they want or need either must be absent or if present, that knowledge is being ignored. As long as this knowledge continues to remain unknown or ignored, the manifestation of the desired condi conditions will be impossible. We all claim we want certain conditions to be manifested into reality, such as love, peace, health, and freedom. Yet we continuously keep getting the opposite at the aggregate level. This is because we are not united in our task for meeting the specific requirements to manifest those conditions. If those requirements are not met, those conditions will never manifest. So the reason why I titled this the law of manifestation is because it, the true law of manifestation is meeting the requirements to manifest those things. If we do not manifest those things, it means that we have not met the requirements to manifest those things. So here is a simple graph of a law of manifestation. At the bottom, with the red cube, we start with knowledge or lack thereof. This is the level of available information. This constitutes all potential forms of data that may be gathered, processed, understood, and acted upon by individuals. Moving up, we have understanding or lack thereof. We either understand that knowledge or we do not. This is the decision-making processing level. Um, so this is the level of processing all the available information which takes place within the human mind and becomes the life choices of each individual. And then we move into wisdom, the green cube, or lack thereof. Do we actually have wisdom or not? Wisdom is the correct action from correctly understanding the knowledge that we have. And this is the level of human behavior. Each individual's behavior is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes, which in turn are based upon the quality of their available information. And then we move into the manifest reality. This is the condition of society at the aggregate level, the result or consequence from our behavior. Do we have the things we say we want? such as freedom, or not, such as slavery. The quality of the condition which is manifested in any given society is based upon the aggregate quality of behaviors within that society. So, it stands logically that to actually get what we say we want, we have to start at the bottom of these building blocks. We have to start with knowledge, the available information, and that is what the SEED conference is all about, providing the information that is needed for individuals to make a good decision-making process and then correctly understand that and then apply that into reality so that they can create wisdom in their own lives and then create a better outcome in society and in the world. So some people may know this method as the trivium method and this is just a simple breakdown of what the trivium is. I highly recommend that all the students of the mysteries dive deeply into the trivium methodology. Um, trivium 
means the three pathways or the three roads. Um, so you have the classical trivium, which is grammar, logic, and then rhetoric. You have the esoteric trivium, which is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. That's kind of what we just went over. And you have the modern trivium, which is input, processing, and output. And we kind of just went over that as well. So think of it as like a computer. You put the data in, the computer processes it, and then it is projected onto the screen or the output device, such as a printer. And here is a simple breakdown of the way the trivium works. At the top, you have the scene or the effect, what has been manifested. And this is kind of like a strange loop or a feedback loop um, within reality. So you have one, grammar, input, data, knowledge, or reality input, what's coming from reality. And then we have the mind, which is where everything is caused at, because the mind is all. So what generated it? But this is also in the monad mind where we process and understand things. So this is two, logic, the unseen. It's in the unseen realm. And then we have um, back into reality, output into reality, which is three, which is rhetoric, output, action, wisdom, or back to the effect, what has been manifested. So this is the trifold unity of learning. Very simple. And this is a very important quote by Marcus Aurelius. If anyone can show me and prove to me that I am wrong in thought or deed, I will gladly change. I seek the truth, which never yet hurt anybody. It is only persistence in self-delusion and ignorance which does harm. And I tell this to people constantly. If you can prove to me I am wrong, I will gladly change my thoughts and my mindsets. Um, and I think this is, you know, one of the issues with a lot of people is that after they have been proven wrong, they're in that cognitive dissonance and they will not change because they are egoly fixated on um, being emotionally identified with their previous behaviors. So one of the major issues in the world is people are always trying to treat the symptoms of the causal factor rather than getting to the actual root cause. One of the major issues with people when they are trying to create great change in the world is that they lack the understanding of cause and effect. Most are constantly trying to change the causality through the symptoms with the effects. There is absolutely no power to affect change from the level of symptoms, but this is where the aggregate of human consciousness is stuck or imprisoned. To change the symptoms, we must get to the root causality of the problem. All, prob all power to affect change lies in the plane of causality, thus this is where human consciousness must go. The plane of causality constitutes the plane of mentality. It is the plane of mentalism, or the mind. The plane of causality is where all things in which we are speaking are set into motion prior to manifesting as form realities or into the physical world. The plane of causality constitutes the why or the underlying causal factor which precedes all manifested things and events. So it has to do with the why. Why is this taking place? And I think this is a great image of an individual standing um, between a circle of dominoes and he's pushing over the dominoes and eventually that effect will come back and knock him in the back of the head. So cause and effect is separated by time and space. So this is the thing that people don't realize, especially when it comes to karma, is that it takes time for that effect to come back around and then hit us. This is why we are just now experiencing a lot of the aggregate issues that we are because a lot of these causes were set into motion in our past and now we're suffering from that it doesn't happen instantaneously at the aggregate level it takes time to build up before that effect comes back around so we really need to understand that 
let's say if we did a wrongdoing and karma came in and dropped an anvil on somebody's head, usually somebody could correlate that, oh, I did something wrong, I harmed somebody, and then this happened to me because of that, because it happened instantaneously. But since karma doesn't work instantaneously in the majority, it does sometimes, but normally it doesn't, um, especially at the aggregate level, um, people don't connect the, the wrongdoing with the harm that happens to them later on. It's just a, a disconnection or a disassociation of the events. And that's one of the issues when it comes to karma, because they're not understanding and using pattern recognition to see, oh, okay, I did this in the past, and now I'm receiving this in, in the future, in my present. Educate and inform the whole mass of the people. That is the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty, Thomas Jefferson. So that's what this whole presentation and the whole conference is about, is educating the masses. One of the biggest weapons of manipulation that we see in the world is controlled opposition. To understand how mind control works, you must understand the Hegelian dialectic. In today's world, we see an outbreak of infectious geopolitical propaganda that is being used to manipulate consciousness of that society at a collective level. This is the works of the social engineers of our day that purposely create and design the majority of these problems, anticipating in advance the reaction of the people um, that these techniques are used against. This is what is called the problem-reaction-solution scenario. Though the solution presented is always about more control through violence, and it is not intended to solve the root causal factor of the problem, but only to serve as a basis to exacerbate the existing problem. This process is repeated over and over, all the time moving the society towards whatever goal or endpoint the ruling class have as their agenda. So, the problem-reaction-solution scenario is simply the thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, and then synthesis idea. They create a problem, let's say like a false flag or a terror event, fake or real, because we have a lot of those right now where it is blurring the lines between fiction and reality when it comes to false flags. And then we have the antithesis of that, which would be the reaction from the people to that problem, and then the people who created that problem come in and say, here is the solution to that problem. But that solution is an artificial synthesis because it is something that they have already predetermined and preplanned to be, um, you know, something that's going to help their agenda. It might resolve a little bit of the issue, but ultimately it just leads to more control. Just like all these new draconian laws that we see being set into place every single day, especially through the past couple years. There's a problem like with gun control, right? People, there's mass shootings and they created these issues and then they come in and say more gun laws, more gun control. And this is a problem reaction scenario. And it's also a form of emotional mind control because they're trying to play off of the sympathy of the people. Um, their emotions so that they can emotionally manipulate the individuals into thinking that this is going to be a real solution by coming in and taking individuals' guns. And absolutely it's not. It just makes everything far worse. And I'm sure everybody here who's listening knows this as a fact. So Hegelian dialectic. This is a George... Frederick Hegel, and I do recommend looking into his work. Um, there is a, a proper use for the Hegelian dialectic. Um, it is something that we should have our, under our belts as a means for learning. But uh, as a means of manipulation, it is an amazing tool for the dark occultists to get done what they want to get done, and we see this all over the board. So here's a good definition for the Hegelian dialectic. The framework for guiding our thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to a predetermined solution. This is accomplished by manipulating consciousness into a circular pattern of thought and action which never lead to true solution, to a true solution. 
the synthetic solution to these conflicts can't be introduced unless those being manipulated take sides that will advance the predetermined agenda. This is about the political party um, taking sides, the left versus the right, or any of these small political ideologies and groupings that are taking place on the left and right that have been fractured and divided to such a degree that they just constantly bicker and fight with each other and you know, violently attack each other. Um, and none of these people understand natural law. None of these people truly understand what a right actually is, which is an action that does not cause harm to a sentient being. To effectively control a nation and its people, allow them a little hope by offering them a choice of two parties that they would like to submit their will to, encouraging debate only within a limited scope of the two-party illusion. They will keep going around in circles, arguing between themselves, while the hidden controllers implement their agendas regardless of which party is in power. Truly, both politics are two wings of the same body. It is a place that looks like you have two different options, like two hallways to choose from, but in truth, it leads you to the same destination, which is the slaughterhouse, which is more slavery and more control. So it's political polarization. <clears throat> it's the illusion of free choice. And people who still believe in government or believe in either party are still under mind control. That's just all there is to it. There is no other way around it. If you believe that these parties are actually different at some level, then you still are under some form of mind control. They act like they are their, their enemies. They act like they're enemies of each other. But in truth, they are just buddy-buddy behind the scenes shaking hands, making money. And really, the real money for them is the control of population. And really, they're just the puppets on the state craft, you know, the, the stage craft. They are <clears throat> the people weaving the magic and the sorcery over the other individuals who blindly believe what is being fed to them through the mass media uh, on television, um, you know, the, the biggest lie box that has ever been created. So the two-party illusion is one of the biggest issues that we see. And, you know, just to add in a little extra here, you know, the idea of voting is actually not a right when it comes to voting for things that violate other people's liberties. And the word vote literally means to pledge allegiance um, to a deity or to a god, to make a promise to a deity or a god. Uh, so we can see that, you know, the whole idea of the state is actually a religion, a false dogmatic religion there to bind us and thwart us from forward progression in consciousness and as a society to make sure that the people in power at the top of the pyramid continue to be in power and they continue to remain in that position um, so that they can have what they want and keep us, you know, subservient to their draconian ways. The blind co-creators of reality. The mass majority of the people in the world are blind to the overarching agenda of the dark occult. At this stage, since the information is widely available, the mass majority of individuals have willfully kept their blindfolds on in a sheer act of ignorance in order for them to stay comfortably numb and to accept the default condition of suffering and slavery. The problem with this is that the society and culture is directed by the masses, and since they are not capable of seeing, they are blindly co-creating a reality that is in opposition to what they say they want. When the blind lead the blind, the world is filled with casualties. So this is really what we have right now. Uh, this is how groupthink works. And it's very easy to control groups. All you have to do is give them a little nudge with a certain idea, and then it spreads like wildfire in these people's minds, and then they start leading other people and convincing other people, and people just don't do their due diligence, and they don't have a high enough reason uh, or reasoning skills to be able to discern 
um, the difference between truth and falsehood, and they get caught up in this political fervor or emotional fervor, and they want to create change. People have a, um, an idea of wanting to do good things in the world, but in truth, they're not doing anything good because they're being led by, by people who are blinded, and they're going to walk straight off a cliff into you know, uh, jagged rocks at the bottom, and they're leading other people, including their own children, off that cliff because they don't know what they're doing. But in truth, they do have uh, a responsibility for this because they are willfully keeping the blindfolds on at this point. The knowledge is widespread now. There is no reason for the masses of humanity to not have uh, this knowledge and to not know what is truly happening. They literally have blindfolded themselves at this point because of their cognitive dissonance and because they want to remain comfortably numb in this state of, you know, conformity because it's painful because when you look at the truth of what's going on in the condition of humanity, it means that you have to actually do something. You actually have to take responsibility for where you're contributing to that and then you also have to realize your moral obligation to change yourself and to admit to yourself that you're wrong and to help change the world because of that. One of the other major problems that I see is that people just don't read. And if they are reading, they're absolutely reading the wrong things and they're not using their reasoning to discern and filter through the inaccuracies or do comparative research. Comparative research is one of the most important things to do when you're, you know, looking up stuff on the internet or reading blogs or even reading books. But one thing I, I like to say is that you need to read the books from the dark occultists themselves. You need to read the uh, publications from the enemies because then you'll get an idea about their mindset. Um, and a lot of people do not read those things. They do not uh, put their time into that, and they probably don't even know where to look for that. But trust me, they're out there, and the dark occultists rely upon people not reading those things. Um, that's why they can just publish them freely. You know, It doesn't matter to them because they put the agendas right out in the open for people to see. So why read? This question is like asking why we should breathe or drink water. Reading is the nutrition of the mind. It expands our consciousness to new dimensions that we could have never seen without them, without reading. We can experience the vastness of minds of the minds of humanity through reading and thus, in doing so, gain more understanding about ourselves and the world. Books are not absolutely dead things. They contain a potency of life in them to be as activated as the or to be as active as the soul that wrote them. They preserve, as in a vial, the purest efficacy and extraction of that human intelligence and experience that bred them. Only the very weak-minded refuse to be influenced by literature and poetry, and those minds are easily manipulated. If anything, the main reason to read is so that you are not controlled. You do not have to burn books to destroy a culture. Just get people to stop reading them. Through this, you can control the masses without, without ever understanding how and why they are in the condition that they are in. Think before you speak. Read before you think. Read, 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 read everything. Trash, classics, good and bad, and see how they do it. Just like the carpenter who, carpenter who works as an apprentice and studies the master you just need to start filtering through it all you know like i i do recommend to be careful about your sources but at the same time you know as long as you have a high enough um discernment faculty and um your ability to do comparative research then read it all you know read as much as possible and you will gain the benefits from that no matter what but we definitely do need to understand that we don't have a lot of time. So, you know, reading the correct things will definitely help uh, put you on the fast track to understanding what's going on in the world. But yeah, reading is one of the most crucial things and people do not read anymore. And it's absolutely insane. I, I think it's one of the most insane things ever in, the, in this world. 
A capacity and taste for reading gives access to whatever has already been discovered by others. It is the key, or one of those keys, to the already solved problems. And not only so, it gives a relish, a facility for successfully pursuing the yet unsolved ones. Abraham Lincoln Presuppositional Worldviews So, when it comes to presuppositional worldviews, what do I mean? I mean the presupposed ideas that our worldviews have. Um, so, whenever we're dealing with a lot of our assertions about the nature and grounds of reality, knowledge, the self, the ontological questions about the nature of who we are, our purpose, etc. There are foundational presupposed ideas that we build upon that we are not normally conscious of. They are stored within the subconscious mind and they help to guide us with our actions. And one thing that I see is that this also plays into that cognitive dissonance role where we are saying and doing things contradictory to, you know, specifically saying things contradictory to our presuppositional worldviews. Presuppositional worldviews are the precognitive assumptions that are part of the programming of our subconscious mind that guide our behaviors normally without us being aware of them. The most simple example of this is to show it in an apophatic method, which means a method of negation. When one states there is no such thing as truth, the presuppositional idea underlying the statement is that, there, that it is true, there is no such thing as truth, thus dismantling the entire conclusion based upon the presupposition and the inherent reality of the objectivity of that truth. If it is true, there is no such thing as truth, then there is such a thing as truth, making the argument or assertion self-defeating. If the statement is false, then there is also such a thing as truth. Either way you go, you end up back that there is an objective truth. These types of presuppositions go unrecognized when most people assert certain concepts. It is very important and crucial for one to take a step backwards in their conceptual ideas to understand the firm basis of the idea or the concept being proposed. We can go on and on with numerous examples of these types of fallacies or fallacious dogmatic assertions that do nothing but hold us back and impede the reasoning and logical skills of humanity. So there are all kinds of these examples, such as, let's say, an atheist uses logic to come to, well, I wouldn't really call it logic, it's not real logic, but they assume that they're using logic to come to the idea that there is no such thing as God, or here's a better one, that um, that all of creation is in a chaotic state, that nothing can be orderly, that everything is based off chaos, right? And, you know, there's arguments against what I'm going to say here, because this isn't the absolute of all atheism, but this is one thing that I've dealt with and debated many atheists on. So they are using the idea that they can come to an orderly conclusion through logic to say that all things are non-orderly, which is a contradiction in their presuppositional ideas, and it's a contradiction of the object objective truth of the matter. So, you know, we could go on and on, like I said, about these presuppositional worldviews. Um, but, you know, whenever somebody says there's no such thing as truth, this, just ask them, is that true that there's no such thing as truth? And if so, then it is self-defeating. And if not, then it, there is such a thing as truth either way that you go down that path. You cannot escape that. Breaking through the illusions. It is our personal responsibility to break through the illusions of the ego barriers in order to see the objective truth of reality. Shattering the illusions of our programming that has been laid as the foundation of our characters from childbirth forward is of the utmost importance to our change. We have, been, we have to have the audacity to admit to ourselves that we have been wrong about certain ideas and concepts when the evidence shows us that. 
one of the biggest things about the ego is that it never wants to admit that it is wrong. To break through these barriers of illusions, we must acknowledge where we have been wrong and admit to ourselves and stop lying to ourselves in order for us to progress into a higher state of consciousness. Contrary to what most people erroneously believe, the ego is not solely a negative aspect of our consciousness. There is a direct evolutionary importance to the ego. The ego allows us to distinguish one, fr one thing from another, and without this capability, one would not be able to distinguish their own experience from the experience of other beings. If one was standing under a tree, a tree branch broke, and then a tree branch broke, and came flying towards their face, it is the ego that allows the individual to be able to distinguish that they need to move in order to protect themselves from being smashed by the tree branch. It allows them to tell the difference between the tree branch and themselves. Because if they didn't have the ego, then they would think they literally are the tree branch. And yes, we are all connected, even us and that tree. But we also need a portion of our consciousness so that we can individualate ourselves to be able to have a unique experience here for the betterment of the all. Every man's true teacher is his own higher self, and when the life is brought under the control of reason, this higher self is released from bondage to appetites and impulses, and becomes priest, sage, and illuminator. Manly P. Hall. Emancipation from bondage. And I'd like to say here that I'm sorry for moving through these so quickly, but I have a narrow time frame to be able to get through all this. Honestly, this presentation should be about four hours long, and it was a rush job. Um, so, you know, bear with me with what I put together here. We are currently being held under duress by the governments of our world and their enforcers, a.k.a. order followers. Duress is the condition of coercion of an individual or groups of individuals by other individuals or groups, and through threats of violence, we are prevented from exercising our free will to engage in rights which we actually possess if those are who are being coerced do not comply with the demands or the commands they are given. They are accosted with violence until they do comply up to death. This is by de facto a system of slavery. That's what statism truly is. You know, and on the right here we have the great meme, statism, the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, steal from, and kill us so that we can be protected from people who kidnap, steal from, and kill us. When in fact, that is not a right. You can't give that right. That's trying to delegate wrongs to people, and you can't do that. Those forms of behaviors are all forms of violence, which means that you cannot grant that to any other being. You can't say, oh, you can go steal from these people. That's an illusion. That's ego. That is um, moral relativity is what it is. Slavery is the claim of ownership over your body, your product of labor, or your possessions in whole or in part. All innate rights are property rights. Without understanding this, one cannot comprehend what slavery truly is and is not, meaning we can't truly understand what freedom is. We all must have the ability to exercise our natural rights. We never have the right to infringe upon another person's rights. Thus, any action that does so is not a right and is an action that leads to theft and harm. It's not just leads to theft. It is theft and it is harmful. It's a form of violence, which means to violate somebody else or some other sentient being. Anybody who violently prevents a person or persons from exercising these rights is making a claim over what they can rightfully do with their body. Thus is a claim that they own those people's bodies, which is ver the very definition of slavery. To claim that you own the product of labor over somebody's body is an extension to claim to own somebody's body which is why taxation is a form of slavery. It is not consentful. It is not voluntary. It is literally theft, and it's a claim of ownership over a percentage of your product of labor, which in extension is a claim of ownership over your body and what you do with your body. 
those who do this or condone this can never be holistically a good person, and this should never be seen as an acceptable behavior or behaviors. None of these should ever be seen as behaviors that are acceptable in society. Absolutely not. Ever. Never, ever. And here is an amazing quote by Max Heindel. It should not be too difficult for any person of average intelligence to acquire a knowledge of at least the outlines of the scheme of evolution. That such a knowledge is of the utmost importance will, we think, be conceded by every intelligent individual. We live in this world, governed by the laws of nature. Under these laws we must live and work, and we are powerless to change them. If we know them and intelligently cooperate with them, these nature forces become most valuable servants. If, on the other hand, we do not understand them, and in our ignorance we're contrary to them, they become most dangerous enemies, capable of terrible destruction. Therefore, the more we know of the working methods of nature, which later is but the visible symbol of the invisible God, the better able we shall be to take advantage of the opportunities it offers for growth and power, for emancipation from bondage, and for elevation to self-mastery. This is one of my favorite quotes, and obviously he's speaking about natural law and the ascension process and us living in harmony with natural law principles. The Sacred Gift of Anger this section of the presentation is directly inspired by Mark Passio's The Sacred Gift of Anger presentation. I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. That's the type of resolve we have to have when facing the current iniquities and inequities that humankind is suffering from. The concept of anger has been demonized in human society as only a negative emotion. The expression of rightful anger or righteous anger is discouraged and is perceived to be solely wrong or bad. This idea that anger is solely a negative emotion comes from the lack of understanding about the valid purposes for all the emotions that we experience, especially anger. It is very clear that in our modern culture, this is deliberately propagated through society as part of the agenda to create docile and obedient slaves. Anger itself is neither good nor evil until wielded. What determines its result is the level of consciousness that is wielding that emotion. It is very common that those who express, express anger are highly shunned and shamed for doing so, without ever asking the most critical question regarding why the person is expressing, is expressing such an emotion. Why is this person angry? So that's one of the major issues. Like, are you angry for a legitimate reason, for a true good cause or are you just anger angry over some triviality you know oh i spilt my or oh you spilt coffee on the table today so i'm extremely upset or you didn't text me back in time i'm you know extremely upset about that or are you angry about the condition of slavery you know there is a justifiable reason to express righteous anger and we need to understand that but anger is a double-edged sword, so we have to be very cautious with it. It's a very powerful sword. Very, very powerful sword. Anger is an emergent property of our consciousness that is much more than a simple emotion. Anger is a sacred gift from creation and has an evolutionary purpose and reason for existing. Anger can be a transformative force when it is used for the right reasons and the right circumstances. It is a powerful tool to not only create much-needed change, but also to stand against the injustice in the world. Authentic righteous anger is an expression of true love from the essence of objective morality and goodness. When the condition of immorality arises in our presence, it becomes a moral obligation to activate the heart-based consciousness to create positive change in a world that has been led astray from morality. Righteous anger is the most sharp sword to be wielded against evil, the evil in our world. When our anger is tempered with true courage, it becomes an unstoppable force in the battle for true freedom. And... I really love this picture that I found of the Hulk, you know, uh, protecting the pure sacred feminine goddess from the mob, from the immoral mob that's coming to uh, destroy uh, the sacred goddess. And some people may look at it different a different way, but I look at it as, 
you know, the true heart-based consciousness coming online and him being green correlates to the heart chakra. And this kind of relates back to uh, the sacred mysteries being ripped out of the temples by the mob because you can look at the sacred feminine principle as those mysteries which need to be protected and nurtured. And um, yeah, I mean, that's what we're seeing today is that these things are being burned out by these ignorant dunces that want to, you know, just absolutely destroy all the pure essences of the mystery schools and traditions. Right of free will choice. So a few people may get upset about this one. Contrary to the erroneous modernly held beliefs, we do not have the right to choose whatever actions we want. The notion that we have the right to free will choice is oxymoronic, since a right is an action that does not violate other beings. Then it follows logically that we do not have the right to choose to commit wrongdoings, or in other words, to manifest violence upon other sentient beings. We have the ability or capability to choose whatever we want, but not the right to choose whatever we want. This idea is a moral relativistic notion which obfuscates the definition, the definitive definition of what a right actually is. So yeah, you have the ability to choose whatever you want, but you don't have the right to choose to do wrongdoings. That is completely contradictory and an antithetical concept when it comes to this. So you don't have the right to free will choice. You have the ability to free will choice or the ability of free will choice. And um, we just really need to understand this. I hear this all the time. And what it is is an excuse for people to get away with choosing to do wrongdoings. That's really what this comes down to, is that people want to do whatever they want to do without suffering the consequences. And that's the problem with people, is that they don't care about the consequences of doing harm unto other people, including themselves. Silence as violence. Contrary to the erroneous, modernly held beliefs, we do not have the right to remain silent about whatever we want. We only possess the right to remain silent about things that do not diminish the rights and freedoms of others. In truth, it is not a right to not speak about the current inequities and inequities, such as slavery, because this silence is a form of consent and is a form of violence onto other people. If you sit back and say nothing in the face of violence and evil, you are part of the problem and you are part of the violence and the evil. Silence hides violence. Nothing strengthens authority so much as silence. Da Vinci. When freedom is at stake, your silence is not golden, it is yellow. Tom Anderson. Passivity is a psychopathology that prevents an individual from creating real and positive change in themselves and the world. If we are passively accepting evil and remaining silent when we have the capability to speak up about the iniquities and inequities in our world, this becomes a form of consent to the current condition. Thus, we ourselves are condoning the evil in the world through our silence. Those through their silence allow evil to go unchallenged are equally, if not more, immoral than those who are actually doing it. It's like sitting back and watching somebody rape a child and you doing nothing when you have the capability to stop that or prevent that. You are a coward is what you are, and you are not a moral being for doing that, and you're consenting to that behavior if it is going on in your presence and you're not stopping it. We must seek the truth and speak the truth. It is our moral obligation to seek the truth and speak the truth as wide and far as possible by using the tools that we have available to our consciousness. These tools include many forms of media publication platforms in which one must learn the ins and outs of how to use these tools to ensure quality content is produced. Even though this is a daunting task to some, it is an absolute requirement in the increasing technological advancements of our society. We must be the beacons of truth a bonfire shining so bright that all those in the pits of suffering and agony can see the light and have a guiding force to help them pull themselves up out of the darkness. Words are not enough, though. We cannot just rely upon words. 
I do, I don't trust words, I trust actions. People can tell you anything, but actions tell you everything, especially about their moral character. So we need actions. So yes, at a certain level, words are a form of behaviors to a certain degree, but it's a very, very low degree. We actually have to take the willpower. Well, we have to enact the willpower to actually act and do something about this. And that's what this conference is about. The, these are actual actions. So um, even though there's a lot of words being spoken here, uh, this is also a big form of action. Um, but it goes back to, you know, we, we just have to know when to act and when not to act. We have to have the wisdom to distinguish what actions we need to take in these current situations and which ones that we should not, depending on the risk versus reward scenario and the um, um, ultimately, you know, where we're at in this condition. The last aphorism. What is an aphorism? An aphorism is a conscious statement of a principle. Well, what is a principle? A principle is that which comes first, which ultimately is the objective truth and morality. All other things must be built upon the first principle. With our principles, we must care enough to consciously state them in a well-formatted and composed way so that other beings of creation can come to understand them without needing to filter through the ambiguity and dogma. It is crucial as a great worker to ensure that their aphorisms are composed to a degree that matches the level of consciousness of the listener. Revelations through the occult. The epiphanic nature of the revelations from the study of the occult mysteries is of the utmost importance for real change to occur in ourselves and the world. The gnosis of our spiritual nature and the edification of natural law principles of the universe is absolutely required for human evolution and ascension to take place. This is the painstaking path of truth, for it is the only way to long-term freedom and growth. So what is natural law? Well, this is a very basic definition of natural law, and in no way am I going to explain all the ins and outs of natural law here to get today. I'm just going to give you a very you know, simplistic understanding of it, just to whet your appetite and push you through the door. Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal, and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of behaviors of beings with the capacity for holistic intelligence, or in other words, the ability to understand the difference between a violent action that destroys freedom and a nonviolent action that expands and expresses freedom. The understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing our conscience into alignment with objective morality. This means definitively knowing which behaviors are rights because they do not violate other sentient beings and which behaviors are wrongs because they do violate other sentient beings. When human beings in the aggregate live in harmony with natural law and therefore are objectively moral, they become and will remain free as long as they continue to remain objectively moral at the aggregate level. When human beings in the aggregate live in opposition to natural law and therefore are objectively immoral, they become and remain enslaved. This is the law of freedom. No being with the capacity for holistic intelligence can escape this universal law. And this is another way to put it. As the aggregate morality increases, aggregate freedom increases. As aggregate morality declines, aggregate freedom declines. And I use the card of justice here to give an example of true natural law, of true balance of justice in the universe. The Banes of Change the most devastating enemies of change are ignorance, self-loathing, and apathy. Contrary to the erroneous, modernly held dogmatic beliefs, we do not have the right to be apathetic or to not care about whatever we want. We only possess the right to be apathetic about things that do not encroach upon or diminish the rights and freedoms of others. In truth, it is not a right to not care about the current condition of slavery. So do whatever it takes to find your true care, because most people just don't care at all in this world anymore. 
Contrary to the erroneously modernly held dogmatic beliefs, we do not have the right to be ignorant about whatever we want. We only possess the right to be ignorant about things that do not encroach upon or diminish the rights and freedoms of others. In truth, it is not a right to ignore the current condition of slavery. Yet again, not your right, because if your ignorance is leading to and consenting and perpetuating that system of slavery, then you are diminishing and encroaching upon other people's rights to live free. And you do not have that right. Contrary to the erroneous, modernly held dogmatic beliefs, we do not have the right to be self-loathing. We only possess the right to be self-loathing when it does not encroach upon or diminish the rights and freedoms of others. In truth, self-loathing leads us into accepting the current condition of slavery because if we, if we or you do not care about your own enslavement, why would you care about other people's enslavements? If you hate yourself, then why would you care about other people? If you're in a uh, you know, self-loathing condition, then being enslaved isn't going to matter to you. If you're apathetic, if you're ignorant, or if you're self-loathing. And these are all directly related. These are the you know, internal trinity of evil within ourselves that, that perpetuate um, this system of slavery and actually leads to immense suffering all across the board. So like I said, do whatever it takes to find your true care. All three of which are an abdication of personal responsibility to the process of generating true healthy change in one's own life and the world. These are all forms of incompetence used to build monuments of stagnation through the lack of purpose and drive. These psychopathologies need to be healed at the root causal factor in order for us to manifest what we say we want in our world. And the way that we heal these things is by, you know, finding true self-respect, by remembering who we truly are, by getting in contact with our higher self, by getting out of the abuse victim cycle. So we have to stop making excuses and start making change. Stop saying I can't, I won't, I might later or tomorrow. Start saying I can and I will. I will make a change. I will do this. I will do what is right no matter what is going on. No matter how big the tsunami of ignorance is around me or how, how much peer pressure I have that's you know, telling me to not do that. I will be that change. And then I used here, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. This is an occult tradition, and I'm sure most of us are familiar with this. But the main part of this is, love is the law, love under will. Change is required. This society does not want you to become wise. If people are wise, they cannot be controlled, subjugated, and exploited. The truly intelligent cannot be forced to live like robots. In fact, they will have the fragrance of rebellion all around them. The condition of humanity is built upon the fundamental power differential between those who hold this knowledge and those who do not. A truly conscious act of change against the current condition is the only way to truly grow. We must reject all illusory worldviews that have been grafted onto our subconscious mind from birth by the social engineers. The study of the components of consciousness is of all importance to the initiate and to those who want to create real and positive change. Each step towards higher consciousness is a journey made by following the heart-based consciousness and heart-based intelligence instead of following the crowd and by choosing knowledge over the veils of ignorance. A wise man is a fire, alive, a flame. He would rather die than to be enslaved, but he knows that if he dies, he cannot share the warmth of his flame with others. So we must be conscious about our decisions in these draconian times. Another key component to this journey is positive thinking. 
Positive thinking is crucial for self-change, for it holds the key to reprogramming our subconscious mind. Using a daily routine of repetition and positive affirmation can help to retrain one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions, which leads to tremendous improvements in one's own life. Most people are dwelling in the negative aspects of our mind, and these thoughts and emotions become habitually hardwired into our subconscious mind. Knowing this, we can reverse its negative effects and rewire ourselves by repetitively thinking in the most optimal fashion, which includes facing the negative in order to transmute it into a positive, but not dwelling upon it. Until, the ch until you change your thinking, you will always recycle your experiences. Responsibility and due diligence. Freedom takes 100% responsibility for one's own personal consciousness and the manifested results of their consciousness. It also means being personally responsible for doing your own due diligence and becoming aware of the requirements for the conditions that we say we want to manifest in society. We have a responsibility to learning and reconstructing the occult sciences that have been irrefutably destroyed and fragmented down the ages. It is only in our current times that we have the capability of doing this process. This is not a game, and it means the difference between the survival of principles that enshrine freedom versus the perpetuation of the moral relativistic ideas that enshrine slavery. To be lazy in our current condition is a sheer act of willful ignorance that does nothing but perpetuate and fuels the monstrous system of slavery in our world. Learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and diligence. That's a quote by Abigail Adams. Courage and persistence. Just like any muscle, courage must be exercised to ensure that we have the willpower to act in the face of fear. The individual's liberties are worth defending at all hazards. It is our moral obligation to defend them against all forms of violence. In order to do this, we must have the courage to respect ourselves, to speak the truth, and to defend what is right in spite of fear. It is only through the courage to challenge the default conditions of society and culture that have ever brought about great change. The over-romanticized tranquility of servitude and conformity must be resisted, for... If it is not, we will find we will be at the whims of those who do not have the best interests at heart or do have the will to act. I think I misspoke on that one. Let me rephrase that. For if it is not, we will find that we will be at the whims of those who do not have our best interests at heart but do have the will to act. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Winston Churchill. So this is something I find that is very important in our current day. Being in the real. We have here a graph of extreme pessimism on the far left, realism in the middle, and extreme optimism on the far right. And for those who understand the left brain, right brain polarization and imbalance, they can understand why I've associated it this way. So extreme pessimism is associated with a left brain imbalance. This is a tendency to see and imagine the worst aspects of things or believe that the worst will happen. A lack of hope or confidence in the future and in yourself to create change. Extreme optimism is associated with the right brain imbalance. An unrealistic hopefulness and overconfidence about the future or the successful outcome of something when in fact there is no way things will change. And what we need is to be in realism, to be a realist, which is associated with the balance of the two hemispheres. The pragmatic approach to the current situation or things that an individual must both be willing to face the consequences of those things and the potentials of those things to change if the requirements are met. Changing the things that you can change and accepting the things that you cannot change. Many people assume that pointing out the current condition of humanity and its state of consciousness is pessimistic, such as the truth that all of humanity is currently being held under duress and is currently enslaved by a hidden ruling class. 
A person who is not willing to face the realism of the situation is in a state of denial and under a form of emotional mind control. Nothing will change this truth, no matter how it is euphemized or romanticized. Realism incorporates both pessimism and optimism and balances it with objective truth and reality. It is important to not confuse a realistic approach to the condition of humanity with either an extreme optimistic or a pessimistic one. Those who are in the real will be the most beneficial to create the most powerful change in the world. Being in the real is the most optimal way of functioning and is the only state of consciousness that will lead us to true solutions. Who is behind the curtain? This is something that we all get asked so much. Who are they? Who are these people in control? And I'm here to tell you, you can find out a lot of the people in control, but does it really matter? When everyone first comes online or starts to awaken to the current condition of humanity, they always run directly to who is in control, looking to place blame on a small select few individuals for the overwhelming immoral condition of society. It is true that a small cabal or group of dark occultists have dictated and directed the masses into the current condition uh, to a certain degree. but. Ultimately, we must stop abdicating our own personal responsibility and thinking that we are not at some level morally culpable for complying and consenting to this condition. If you were to know these individuals and we decided to remove them, there is more than 500,000 plus people that would willfully take up that position to control humanity, and that is a low estimate. In truth, those who are the most sophisticated dark occultists do not have traceable family names, and they are far more strategic when it comes to protecting who they actually are, knowing the high risk and potential that humanity would awaken to this condition to a certain degree and start to hunt them down. These people do not keep family bloodline names, they do not shop at your local supermarket, and they do not they are not the politicians on the world stage, nor are they even the world bankers. They are the ones that control these groups of people from the shadows. You will never know who these people are. And good luck trying. Because, you know, if I was that type of dark occultist, I would make sure to cover my ass with that. I would make sure that nobody would ever be able to trace who I am. And I would have a firewall of you know different types of groups and different types of people to protect me from being outed and um, this is how the mafia works you know you have these these types of firewalls and I'm not saying it's impossible to really know who these people are I'm sure we could find out eventually to flush them out and we'd have to trace it back through these you know these types of groups that are being controlled but by the real dark occultists but it doesn't really matter because what matters is that the masses of humanity still believe in these erroneous dogmatic ideologies and that's truly what's perpetuating this type of system it's not just because the you know the dark occultists and what they've been doing yeah they have a big you know uh, part to play in that but if we all get our minds awakened and really start to fight back um, and recondition our subconscious minds then they won't have any control over us. It is only because we've been duped into believing these things and into believing things like moral relativity um, that this system is continuing to perpetuate itself. The proper role of the ego. So this is something I mentioned earlier. Even though the ego is mainly talked about in modern culture as solely a negative attribute of the human psyche, contrary to the assumption, the ego actually has a proper positive role in our life. The idea of ego death is simply a metaphor for ensuring that the ego is not in the throne of the self, or in other words, is not controlling every part of our everyday thoughts, emotions, and behaviors and lives. The proper role of the ego is the individualization process. It is the part of us that allows ourselves to distinguish different characteristics to the degree that we have our own unique experiences in this realm. A healthy ego mind is one of the most powerful tools an individual could utilize in their everyday life which can ensure them that they have the willpower to push forward in the face of these troubled times. It is a self-defense for the human psyche and helps to prevent and keep us away from 
institutionalized belief systems and group thinks when it comes to when it is in balance, when it comes to it being in balance. So truly, when you have a true raised ego into the higher self, you become a true sovereign. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure I sound kind of repetitive with a lot of the things I'm saying here. Like I said, you know, this was a rush presentation, but um, these things need to be brought to the table. You know, because the new age communities, they want to teach you that the ego is completely all negative. And we need to know that the ego just means I. It's about the individual. And just like I said earlier, it's about you having a unique experience that, um, and that's why the ego, you know, is born into our psyche is so that we can actually have a unique experience. But we must not, you know, falter on the understanding that we're connected to the all at our essence and at many different levels of our existence. So we have to have a balance between the I and the many, the one and the all. The heart of darkness. The path of true change lies in facing the pain of reality. Most people are wandering in darkness, seeking the light outside of the darkness, failing to realize that the light is in the heart of darkness. Without brazenly facing our own inner darkness, it will always come back to haunt us in the end, or it will be used by those who know the deeper aspects of psychology to gain power over us and manipulate us into actions that we normally would not manifest by our own correct judgment. So The Heart of Darkness is a book by Joseph Conrad, and there's an amazing movie that adapts this book called um, Apocalypse Now, which is about the spiritual journey of the self, and I highly recommend looking into that book. But this leads me into the integration of the shadow. And a lot of us here should understand, you know, what the shadow work is. And if not, you need to fully study it and start to really comprehend how important it is. The shadow self is described as the undealt with dark or negative parts of our subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is connected to our true essence and knows and perceives all. If the shadow self is not worked with and integrated into our personality, it will be expressed in very imbalanced and negative ways. This is especially true when it comes to our repression of our healthy emotional dynamics. Under such conditions, the imbalance amplifies at the subconscious level and then it manifests in negative ways such as disassociation, unbalanced anger, unjustified reactivity, depression, apathy, self-loathing, ignorance, and many, many others. And any of these negative emotions that they will thwart our forward progress towards our higher self and ascension. The shadow self will always be present within ourselves. It is up to us to acknowledge it and work with it. If we choose not to work with it, we will suffer the dire consequences and inflict suffering upon others. Various forms of social engineering and mind control te techniques and tactics intended to convince us and program us to suppress our shadow self, which in turn creates a buildup in the subconscious mind of negative emotions that turn into depression and eventually into shame. Shame is one of the most destructive and lowest levels of consciousness a human being can exist in. So in Jungian psychology, the shadow or the shadow aspect is a part of the unconscious mind uh, consisting of repressed weaknesses, shortcomings, and instincts. Everyone carries a shadow, Jung wrote, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and deeper it is. It may be, in part, one's link to more primitive animal instincts, which are superseded during early childhood and by, conscious, by the conscious mind. Elevation to Self-Mastery you will never have a greater or lesser dominion than that over yourself. The height of a man's success in ascension is gauged by his self-mastery. He who does not control his own mind will be controlled by those who seek to control. To be a master on a specific skill, practice one thing 10,000 times rather than practicing 10,000 things one time. You can't master who and how you are in the world without becoming mindful of your innate, infinite value and the way the human mind operates. Without mindfulness, we are susceptible to becoming passive spectators of life and potentially victims of circumstance, 
but most importantly, we become mental slaves to the external sorcery and internal incompetence and self-abandonment. A true master is not one with the most students, but one who creates the most masters. The secret of freedom lies in the education of the people, whereas the secret of tyranny is in keeping them ignorant. Maximilien Robespierre. Everything. When it comes to applying this knowledge, we must be well composed and understand that timing is of crucial importance. Just like any form of the great work, such as a musical symphony, timing plays a huge factor in how the results will play out and how they are perceived by the audience of the world. Most people want everything to be done instantaneously, but the true great work is that of educating the masses, which will not happen in a single lifetime. When we fall into the modality of ego fixation, Onto wanting the results to be done now, we end up doing more harm to the great work and to ourselves. We have reached a point where we do have to act immediately to educate and ensure that we do not get pummeled by the oncoming onslaught of tyranny and the new world disorder. We must fully recognize that the work that we have been generating is still in its ad still in its adolescence phase and we must have the patience to see where the actions we have put into manifestation will take us go back to cause and effect it takes time for the effect to come back around a well composed tactical strategy is needed to counteract the social engineering of our time just like martial arts we must learn to use the enemy's movement and energy against them and this can only be done by understanding the mindset of the enemy. This is why it is of crucial importance to study the dark occult and their techniques of manipulation. And there's no other time than to do that now. So get in the work. Start studying these things, especially within yourself. Study your own darkness and you will understand the darkness of others. Because honestly, all the evil deeds that are being done are we are all capable of doing at some level we might be less um you know inclined to do those things but we are capable of doing those things doesn't mean we will do those things but we all have it within us to do those things at some level because the same darkness that's within me is the same darkness that's within the dark occultists of the world it's the same darkness that's within you it's all part of the same archetypal part of our psyche Nothing great is created suddenly, any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig. If you tell me that you desire a fig, I answer you that there must be a time. Let it first blossom, then bear fruit, then ripen. Epictetus. So we need to be united in our task. One of the biggest failures I see in the freedom and truth communities is that we are not strongly bounded together and united in our task for ending slavery. One of the main reasons for this is that the mass majority of people still do not understand the requirements for manifesting freedom. They still lack the in-depth knowledge of natural law and the application of that knowledge to generate a different result. It is important that we understand that the union of our consciousness and the efforts must be brought together in order to create a different outcome. We must have the resolve to never give up and never surrender, but also organize ourselves and work with others who are like-minded individuals to ensure that we are amplifying our efforts into manifestation. We have to come together. That's what the Seed Conference is about, is coming together, bringing like-minded individuals together so that we can amplify this work out into creation, to amplify it and put it into the field of creation. The true one great work. The magnum opus of humanity is that of true freedom. The great work is not the easy way out. It is the arduous task of dissolving your ego illusions to help raise yourself and others up into a higher level of consciousness. The process means that we each must abandon our dogmatic beliefs which are binding and impeding our progress as a species. The widespread ignorance of natural law and truth has led to the ultimate forms of suffering here on earth. It is the highest responsibility of each and every individual to stand firmly against the current state of slavery and live in harmony with natural law, love, and truth. To be awake means you cannot, by definition, support or condone any forms of violence, which include all violence from authority and government. The truly awakened 
one resists and confronts the evil that most people refuse to acknowledge. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority keen to set brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. Samuel Adams, one of my favorite founding fathers. And here are three quotes for the ending of this presentation. Most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility and most people are frightened of responsibility. Sigmund Freud. Better to die fighting for freedom than to be a prisoner all the days of your life. Bob Marley. He who has overcome his fears will truly be free. Aristotle. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that you have found value in this presentation today. And as a final statement, all beings have infinite value. Love is freedom. Fear is an illusion. All rights are innate. Truth can never be destroyed. Let us come together in this task to help end the suffering of humanity. Thank you. If you're looking to further understand the mind, consciousness, the occult, symbolism, the ancient Egyptian mythos, philosophy, and truth discovery, make sure to tune in to the Cubbyhole podcast hosted by myself, Nate Cap, and co-hosted by Brandon Martin. The Cubbyhole podcast is a repository of critical knowledge that deals with and covers the many facets of the human condition, especially what causes most of the suffering going on in this world. Make sure to start at podcast number one and work your way forward for maximum value and understanding. The Cubbyhole podcast is found on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, TuneIn Radio, Simplecast, and Cubbyhole.com. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. The intention of Natural Freedom League is to expand the understanding of natural law, which is based on objective morality, and to expose the illegitimacy of the belief in authority, and thus the inherent immorality of all government. We be the Natural Freedom League, cause we become no longer unvegan, we seek in the wisdom, and that's why we did come to this prison of prism, and that's why the beat thumps, and that's why we speak up, we be the Natural Freedom League, cause we
Hello, hive mind. My name is Nathaniel Kapnicki, but many of you may know me as Nate Cap. I want to thank you for tuning in to this presentation titled Relumination of the Imagination. I want to make it clear that this is definitely not some magic show where everybody gets a better imagination, and if it does, that's awesome. In short, this presentation explores the inherent cosmic tools that the imagination uses in conjunction with the knowledge of the mystery traditions in order to better learn and restore what got misplaced in ancient Egypt. It's an attempt to inspire or rekindle the inner sacred flame of care back into aggregate consciousness. We've been dismembered from principles and much of our past. We've been scattered from our purity. And we must remember or bind ourselves back to the universal non-man made law where our connection to nature is pure. Relumination of the imagination symbolically but not literally means to reignite the holy fire that has been systematically blown out. It's about the beginning process of mastering the self and the start of the great work. It's about allowing the unfoldment of the open mind and kicking all the planted programs completely out. Breaking free from, you know, the many millenniums of man-made mind cages we've been perpetuated into. By the end of this presentation, I hope that I've made it clear to the viewer what the title truly means. And just to be clear, this presentation isn't just going to magically heighten or, you know, illuminate anyone either. I mean, I hope it does. Just make sure to listen all the way through. And this presentation might seem out there at times because many of the topics are abstract because we're simply dealing with the imagination. And if or when a moment of doubt arises, I assure you there will be some sort of logical explanation that eventually follows. Believe me, I'm not here to, you know, waste some anybody's time with, you know, made up, you know, non-science, non-logical jargon. We're, we're going to, you know, take a really beneficial journey into and out of the mind here today. I'm going to cover many key components regarding the imagination and how it has become stagnant in our modern world. But before I begin, I'd like to thank Brandon Martin and the whole crew at One Great Work Network for helping get the Seed for Growth conference put together. It has been a lot of work and we are really excited that we can make this event happen. It's an honor to be in this lineup of such caring and hard-working adults with a similar ambition to do the right thing. Because this presentation is only around an hour and 45 minutes, I'd like to say if by the end you find value and want to know more regarding the topics I've covered, you can listen to the Cubbyhole podcasts in order through cubbyhole.com slash podcast. And some of the content found in this presentation is a lot more defined there. And also I'll be defining and expanding more on these topics in the future shows. So stay tuned for that. I'm only going to touch on many key topics to make my points because this is a very condensed presentation. The topics I'm going to cover are so extremely important for human progress and evolution and it needs to be learned if we wish to understand the hidden realm of the universe. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because it is one of the most powerful keys towards achieving freedom. How do I know this? Well, because freedom doesn't involve man's authority, which is holding most people back from evolution and aggregate consciousness. So this is about helping that evolution to advance collectively. And maybe, you know, that's not what you want. But if you know deep down that working towards freedom is the right thing to do, then you're right where you need to be. 
There really are only two types of minds, and one is self-omniscient, believing that one's one knows everything, which is you know really unhealthy, unhealthy, and it's closed-minded skepticism, which only leads to stagnation, not to mention other horrific atrocities. Or the other mind, which is the Shoshin, or the beginner's mind, the mind that is always learning and open to all possibilities. And I'm assuming the listeners here are ready with their Shoshin and ready to learn something, ready to learn something valuable. The topics for this presentation are, number one, imagination. What is it? Where is it? How is it used? And then the division, which is the division within and the symbolic journey of self. And then number three is inherent spiritual tools. What are they? Wh you know, where are, what are, where are they? What are they used for? How are they discovered? Number four, understanding. What truly defines understanding? How does understanding help find truth? Number five, the temple within. What can help us understand our journey within? Number six, the destructive causation of imagination. How the imagination, imagination is being destroyed and by what and by who? Number seven, intelligent measurement of human behavior. What governs behavior and how do we become conscious of this? Number eight, relumination. What is relumination, really? How much do we care to know how things really are? Number nine, authority. Who is true authority of you? Who's the true authority of you? Who writes your life? Are you willing to realize your responsibility in nature? Okay, so what is imagination and it's a huge question and i'd say it's one of the most perplexing questions because it's not immediately clear what it is and of course i'm sure we can all agree that deep down we all intimately know what it is but when we find we find it difficult to explain it we, we find it difficult to explain imagination in a precise way. It's like trying to explain, you know, what the creator is or the universe is. So to define this word imagination requires imagination, which really can't be well defined, especially with the limitations of logic only. I see the word imagination as an umbrella term, as we'll see throughout this presentation. There's so many ways to understand this unfoldment of a concept. Eight, <clears throat> sorry, many people tend to believe what imagination solely is or solely means is creating or making up random things or recreating events in certain redefined ways or you know weird theories or abstract or exaggerated expressions in art or pretending like the act of role playing random use of the imagination is imagination without knowledge or science or reasoning but is mostly from experience and the subconscious looking at the etymology of imagination we see it's from the latin imago which means image and the noun imaginaria uh, sorry imaginari which means picture to oneself and i like the idea of the imagination as the act of seeing and testing ideas within or orienting the mind in any possible position of seeing so how do we orient with the imagination? We do this by aligning and positioning the mind, whether microcosmic or macrocosmic, into relative points of time and space. The etymology of orient 
actually means the direction east, the part of the horizon where the sun first appears. And this is about realizing where your position is because you know where the sun is or where it will rise with respect to your coordinates. It is one of the most pure, unambiguous ways to orient or to know where we are and what time of the day it is in relation to the sun. This is key to understanding the tools that guides imagination. What happens when you close your eyes and envision or think of something like an evergreen tree? I'd assume an image of what you understand to be an evergreen tree pops up in your mind, right? You're literally imagining probably a faint to possibly clear idea of what an evergreen tree is or that it isn't really there. Um, but you know or you can feel its essence or idea, right? Now, there's a reason we have this tool. It's to give us power to see verbal stories and potentialities, to focus on or manifest ideas. And these images might not come through clear, but we know what they are and can kind of, you know, see into the future based on the knowledge and experiences we have regarding these ideas or images. When it comes to the organ that is most associated with these abilities of imagining is the pineal gland, which is the pine cone shaped tissue located in the middle part of the brain between the two hemispheres. And it is in conjunction with the imagination as the eye that processes and joins knowledge. It joins creativity and, and, and experience to generate vision that has the potential to decode the mysteries of ourselves and the universe. It's also what we use to empathize with, to try and think what others think, to orient ourselves to feel what other sentient beings feel or experience. For this next slide, I just, I want to mention that the higher imagination is a term I'm going to use to help me make some important hard points. Higher imagination is the ability to orient one's mind anywhere in the universe combined with higher knowledge to intelligently envision beyond the logical threshold, to think, entertain, and visualize dualistically, literally, and symbolically above what could ever be taught. When higher knowledge, a.k.a. knowledge of the self, origins, principles, and or the esoteric mystery traditions is taken in, imagination applies to the processing and understanding of that knowledge, which then can generate many intelligent ideas and help solve many equations of life that come up as a result. Higher imagination is the generated capacity to push beyond the limitations of logic, especially because knowledge can only take us so far. It is imagination applied with and transcending higher knowledge of self. And the higher knowledge of self has been recorded and stored for hundreds of thousands of years. It's about evolving consciousness towards freedom. That's what imagination can do and it does. It's about overcoming the five sense illusion. Much of the higher knowledge of self is abstract, which requires imagination in order to decode and unveil the mysteries and secrets that are hidden all around us and in us. It's all about the requirement of having an adult vision along with the key of patience, patience with the ego. We have to be able to keep our patience with the ego because it wants to dismiss what it fears and doesn't understand. 
And this is why those who are more left-brained have a harder time with abstract concepts like this, like what I'm sharing. Skepticism ruled by ego will never pierce the veil to see beyond the material realm. That's really important to understand. And Gary Lockman, the author of Lost Knowledge of the Imagination, said, True imagination has a transformative power. It can alchemically transmute information from the senses into symbols to be deciphered or language to be translated. In essence, it turns facts into meaning by linking parts into holes. It does not con construct something unreal, that is the business of fantasy, but unveils the hidden reality. So now on to D vision let's talk about the division taking place within i'm going to speak phonetically a lot during this presentation because it's one really important way we can see or read between the lines between the dialects actually the dialects or prisons most people are comfortable in the left or the right and this stifles our vision to see truth because it's division it keeps us one-sided within and outwardly as a result learning this great divide helps us see the illusions now I'm in no way trying to tell anyone that this is a hundred percent how the hero's journey goes not at all um, I'm, I'm just focusing on the, the sciences found in it and what it is, what it's being, you know, what is being said symbolically and phonetically, which I'm going to try to explain in a very simple way. This is about seeing where each one of us may be in consciousness and where we may go and why. So looking at this equilateral triangle... I want you to think of something basic. I want you to think of the very fact that it took a mother and father to take part in your physical generated conception. So mom and dad had intercourse and you came out, right? Okay, so you can look at it you can look at this as a physical manifested trinity, a solid mathematical triangle, right? And let me ask, do the perfect symbols such as the equilateral triangle just solely exist for, you know, making pretty art patterns or solving basic public school geometry math problems? Of course not. They are also discovered inwardly by man, individually, in order to help scientifically orient the self within. To understand the self better, that's what it's about. We can't be co-created without mother and father without male and female. So the, the symbol of this equilateral triangle is about understanding the number three. It's about understanding anything spiritual has to do with the number three. Looking at the bottom right angle of the triangle, we see the right brain symbol, okay? Upon birth and up until around seven years, of age children have a lower vibration than consciousness which is which is called the stage of theta which is part of the imagination it's the age when children act like they're you know riding a, a horse when really it's a broomstick or playing with you know action figures and pretending to be a giant action figure the idea is during this time there are no programs to be conscious of Therefore, the first seven years are when children are most programmable. 
We start out in right brain infant mind. We start out with observation, intuition, theta, or imagination. The reason for this is it's impossible to start out with logical thought, analytical thought, science, math, or reasoning, which are all left brain aspects. We are born with the sacred feminine way of absorbing what we experience as babies, as children. We are born with intuition. We're born with absorption and observation, which are sacred feminine aspects. This is, this is also where art, openness, and creativity are gained and acted out. So when we start out in right brain, we typically leave the right brain and go towards and into the left brain symbolically, which means that we have left the right brain, like leaving the nest. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, we have left all the right brain aspects behind. We definitely take much of that with us. So we have gone from the right brain to the left brain because we leave the right to evolve. In ancient Egyptian sign language, it is understood that left foot forward symbolically means evolution, which means that the right brain controls the left side. So it is a right brained evolution to go left because you have left the right brain to evolve, to go from east to west. So westing. And here we gain the left brained aspects of logic, math, science, being analytical, and so on. These are obviously important aspects for holistic thinking. Now the way the term Westing is understood is it is the way towards sp uh, spiritual bereavement, which is not good. Basically, we have completely left the right, which is also phonetically and symbolically about leaving rights or connection to nature. That's really important to understand. In my experience, it's a rebellious act to go completely left due to the push of institutionalized religion, having it, you know, shoved down your throat. And one thing to keep in mind is many, you know, don't even leave the nest. They stay home in a right-brained trap, giving authority over to institutionalized religion with their faith. And this truly means that the mind stays stagnant and never truly grows. It's a mind that never really questions reality and remains an infant and gullible to man's authority, especially through institutionalized authority or religion. This is also what leads to pseudo spirituality. It also leads to, it also leads to religious extremism and unworthiness. Without elders or parents who are versed in the science of morality, it becomes really difficult to go into the right direction, and we have trouble understanding objective right from wrong, which is why we go westing or you know drift far into the left into the left brain. It's almost inevitable that we do this. And it's, you know, it's healthy as long as we don't get stuck in the left brain. Many of us become more, you know, logical, mathematical, analytical, and scientific, which are, you know, really strong aspects of the sacred masculine left brain. And this is where we, you know, begin to evolve. But the problem, <clears throat> the problem is, this becomes a cul-de-sac. It's a trap. We aren't supposed to stay solely in left brain. This is, you know, this is what can and does generate a patriarchal world. It also generates materialism, scientism, atheism, rigid skepticism, and nihilism. And it has immensely throughout our world for, you know, the better part of the last thousand years 
And just to be clear, scientism is an excessive trust or belief in modern scientific institutions, especially, you know, government grant funded institutions, you know, to, to such a high level that the individual bearing the trust believes that these institutions are the only source of credible or verifiable truth. It's just another religion that, you know, needs to be overcome for further evolution. This is the ultimate Westing, which if not transcended, transcended, does and will lead to more government, aka more enslavement. And the same is for the right-brained imbalance. You know, staying here will only cause more stagnation, thus more enslavement. And it creates the illusion of right versus left. So, what generally comes next in the hero's journey? Well, we individually have to transcend dogma, aka learn the traps that hold us back and then overcome them and move on from them, from the religions. It's about understanding that we cannot understand the one without the two. We can't understand both hemispheres without understanding each one. And we can't understand the whole brain without both. We can't understand light without understanding dark. We can't understand right without left or right without wrong. It's about learning dualistically to be able to see separation and then understanding why it's an illusion as one is never truly separate from the self in the first place. So, to leave or to have left is to go on the journey to separate and learn why one must unite the hemispheres and return home to nature, which is right. This is why there are only two mistakes one can make on the path to truth. Not starting and not going all the way. Which in this case translates to the first mistake being, you know, not starting or to not have left from the right brain on the journey to have knowledge, science, arithmetic, and the important facets of the left-brained modes of consciousness. The second mistake is learning all these things and not uniting both hemispheres and coming back home to nature, to the right place, which is all about finding your care and going all the way. So once one gains the courage to go up and reach the, the, in a, in a, the, uh, sorry, the apex of higher knowledge, where an alchemical symbolic wedding takes place between the sacred feminine right brain and sacred masculine left brain where one aligns in natural law being reconnected with nature but also you know bringing the science back to nature then comes illumination of care, to be illuminated of care, and we fall in love back to home, back to the right place, which is down the mountain, to help others who are ready to learn. It's about giving back. This is part of the unfoldment of spirituality. You're the true hero on your unique journey. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more to this concept, and I hope this symbolic expression helps the viewer understand consciousness more holistically. We are all visitors to this time, this place. We are all just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. And that is an Australian Aboriginal proverb. On to the inherent 
cosmic or spiritual tools and what they're used for. Well, first, what does inherent mean? It means built in, fixed or permanent. And this spiritual being, the growth and unfoldment, sorry, <clears throat> and spiritual being the growth and unfoldment of the human soul and the tools are the instruments, the implements, which are built in for the navigation and growth within. These discoverable tools are what we use to search with, to see with, to decode with, to help us understand what we can and cannot see or address with language fully. We use spiritual tools to build a strong foundation within. And, you know, because these tools are inherent, they can't be and never have been granted by man. They are discovered. The individual wielder of these tools is the only authority of how and when they are used. These specific tools I'm speaking of are the hermetic principles, green language, retrospect, and pattern recognition. You know, and there's many other tools as well. In short, hermetic principles help one to discover the inner workings of the cosmic law. Green language helps us discover the mysteries hidden within language. Retrospect helps us go back into the past self to face the illusions we've bought into along with facing past traumas. Pattern recognition grants us the ability of awareness to understand our surroundings clearer through inductive and deductive thinking. Now I'm only going to briefly cover these tools, but we'll be using and demonstrating their uses as I move forward through the presentation. These tools are 100% understood by the science of their workings and the imagination as their driver. This is about expanding the higher imagination because it's about the pursuit of gnosis, meaning the pursuit of empirical knowledge pertaining to the spiritual mysteries. So starting with the seven hermetic principles, we have the first principle, which is mentalism, which means the all is mind. The universe is mental. Everything first starts in the mind. Mind allows imagination, imagination to travel infinitely. Mentalism is the key to imagining, which leads to manifestation of things and events. The second principle is correspondence, what I refer to as nature's spiritual mirror. And this principle is all about imagining, like that which is below is likened to that which is above. And that which is above is likened to that which is below. It's a reflection tool. We can look at and observe a thing or idea and then use imagination to see that thing or idea in relation with something else, whether micro or macrocosmic, like a walnut resembling a brain or a hurricane resembling a galaxy. The third principle is vibration, which states that nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. If we orient our mind in understanding that the earth is moving at all times in space, the planets and the stars are all in motion. The space in between is constantly taking a different form, like water. When we can understand how this operates, we can see that even though a desk appears still it's still in motion whether you know the rest of the world uh, sorry it's still in motion with the rest of the world and the universe and even at the molecular level of that desk there is vibration taking place the fourth principle which is polarity tells us Everything is dual. 
everything has its poles. Everything has its pair of opposites. Imagining absolute hot and cold as absolute polar opposites won't reveal the absolutes, but will reveal that there are degrees in between that can be recognized like light and dark or, you know, like hot and cold or, you know, small or large. The fifth principle is rhythm. The pendulum swing manifests in everything. The measure, the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left. Rhythm compensates. Consciousness rises and falls, empires rise and fall, and something as simple as a wave rises and falls. Imagining the repeated historical stories helps us see what state of consciousness we were in, what we're in now, and where we're headed. The sixth principle, which is cause and effect, states every cause has its effect. Every effect has its cause. So imagine a guy robbing an old lady. He steals her purse. But weeks before that, that same old lady stole that same purse from a local store. The cause started at her act of stealing, which led to the effect of getting a similar behavior brought back unto her. And the same is true in the collective consciousness of humanity, which, you know, actually really needs to be understood a lot more. And the seventh and final hermetic principle is gender, which is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. Gender, gender manifests on all planes. If we imagine the penetrative force of the sacred masculine energy and the submissive receptive energy of the sacred feminine, we can apply this great understanding to all that is. A simple example would be the inside of a cup is submissive to the penetrative liquid poured in it, but the table holding the cup submits to the penetrative weight and setting of the the cup, which makes the surface of the table feminine because it's submissive. Okay, so I'm going to briefly cover retrospect, pattern recognition, and then on to green language. Retrospect comes from the Latin retro speciere. So retro meaning back and speciere meaning look at. So, to look back at, to survey past events. This is, a, this is the part of the imagination that orients the mind into the past to reflect on as much as one can remember. A lot of people tend to unconsciously abuse this tool and get stuck in the past. It is the spiritual tool that finds the illusions and causes of traumas that you know, never were dealt with, and then being able to face them and come to terms with them in order to generate healthy growth. So looking at pattern recognition, this is, this is the special ability to not only notice a connection in things, but then logically imagine what those connection, connections suggest about what may happen next. It's about consciously catching consistence, consistencies and inconsistencies in things like dialogue, math, science, symbols, behaviors, and so on. Pattern recognition works un, uh, subconsciously as well, which can you know spark a surprising conscious reaction when somebody finally picks up on or recognizes the pattern or patterns in things. So another spiritual tool that is key to using while in search for truth is the highly dismissed and totally overlooked language of calibration, which is green language. This tool, like many tools, 
can be improperly used. And of course, that can and has turned many skeptics away from further investigation of this tool. This language is a phonetic principle. Green language is more than just a wordplay or a pun language. It is an intelligent alignment to balance within and without, especially for those who are ready to hear and see. For those who can imagine at eye on. And, you know, there's the first example. Imagination is imagine at eye on. The I is the E Y E I because the imagination used is the I on. Green language is one of man's oldest spiritual technologies and part of understanding the alchemical wedding. This green language is a balanced frequency that allows one to see and hear phonetically, acronymically, allegorically, symbolically, anagrammatically, etymologically, and morally. Green because green is the middle frequency of the visible spectrum of color, which is about understanding electromagnetism and the wavelengths of visible light. Green is also the healthiest foods to eat. Green is the color of a healthy visible nature, and it's the middle Anahata heart chakra color in the Vedic uh, chakra system. It's a universal tongue where all language potentially meets in the middle for a higher understanding and communication. Most people in the West or, you know, someone coming from a left brain viewpoint tend to think mostly or solely in terms of, you know, literal words only, which causes a limitation in thinking. It limits our ability to see and understand abstract concepts like what I'm sharing. When it comes to understanding green language, pattern recognition is part of understanding the process of language acquisition, which is about gaining the ability to understand how certain words and letters can speak beyond the literacy or what is taught. It goes beyond the appeal to authority. That's really important to understand. And this is where the higher imagination comes in here into use. I believe it's healthy to exercise this tool of green language freely, but, you know, to not get too caught up in trying to make every word seem like it has a deeper meaning or, you know, you'll miss the point of its purpose. The main thing to keep in mind is this isn't a tool to play with when in search for truth. It's a spiritual tool for the serious student who's ready to receive clarity of that which isn't available in the common vernacular. It's about being open to the universe at all times. And the last thing I want to share under spiritual tools is what I refer to as the hermetically versatile mind, which is the ability to orient, recognize, envision, manifest, flip, reverse, cycle, mirror, measure, modify, rearrange any shape, symbol, word, idea, or archetype based on higher knowledge experience and the util utilization of the imagination in order to understand something with full clarity. So let's look at the word understanding. How do we come to truly understand a thing or a principle or an idea or something like a historical fact? I think we can all agree intuition plays a small part, but how do we come to understand, to an understanding? A couple of the methods we can use are the trivium and quadrivium methods, but first it's important that we break the word understand down. The word understand can be broken down into two compounds, which is the under and stand. 
So it literally means to stand under or to stand over. From the Greek etymology, understanding is epistemi, which means to know how I know. Either way, in order to understand a thing, you must see it in connection with some bigger subject or bigger whole and the possible consequences of this connection. Understanding is always the understanding of a smaller picture in relation to a bigger picture or a smaller problem in relation to a bigger problem. People learn to understand things by measuring everything in relation to the very thing they are wanting to know. To understand basically means to agree upon. People who truly understand each other are those who are principled and equal in their knowledge. And only then is mutual understanding really possible. We can only be one, there, sorry, there can only be one understanding. The rest is either incomplete understanding or unprocessed knowledge. It's easy to say, I understand, but can it be demonstrated? That's the honest question we should all be asking ourselves. Something I find really important when listening to other researchers is when in search for an understanding, it becomes necessary to compare other descriptions we read and hear with the knowledge and experience we ourselves have collected. What you read and hear from other resources may in fact be the same thing you know, but expressed in a different way with different words in a different dialect. So the description is really what needs to be focused on because that's worth more than the words and the dialects. We have to be able to take words and or phrases and see the differences and similarities between them. And, you know, we may be seeing the same thing, but described in different ways. It's a form of hermeneutics. It's, it's a, you know, it's like the movies Avatar, Pocahontas, or Dances with Wolves. They are all basically describing the same thing, the same story, but are expressed in different ways. And that's the same with our language. So now that we have a better understanding of the word understand, we can now look at the trivium or the threefold path to help guide us in the truth discovery process, which I'm only going to briefly cover in this presentation. When taking in information, whether knowledge from books or people directly, the first Initial step of the esoteric variant of the trivium is the input of knowledge. This is what the imagination needs in order to build and expand consciousness. So we gather lots of information from multiple sources while simultaneously entertaining that information without dismissing or accepting it as truth right away. This is the raw info regarding the who, what, when, and the where. Then comes the process, which is about how we come to understand what we know by filtering through the knowledge to see what its purpose is, to better, you know, realize why or you know, you know what realize the the why or you know, meaning behind it. The, <clears throat> when we, sorry, when we bring logic to the knowledge and test it to see where there are consistencies and inconsistent consistencies, imagination tries to fill in the blanks that the knowledge might be lacking. And then once one understands what one knows, then one can take action by expressing that knowledge, whether through speech, writings, or art. And this is where real and positive changes can and does occur from. So again, this is the trivium. 
It is the esoteric method of finding truth. So you have the input, processing, and then the output. So input, the knowledge, process towards an understanding of that knowledge, and then the rhetoric, the sharing, the speaking, the writing, and output of that knowledge, which is the act of wisdom. So now we're moving on to the temple within. Heed these words, you who wish to probe the depths of nature. If you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders like the universe? In you is hidden the treasure of the treasures. Know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. The ancient Egyptians saw the world symbolically, which is a lot of what this whole presentation is really hoping to inspire. They were able to read the world in this way with the ability to hold different, sometimes contradictory ideas together simultaneously. On the literal side, the hieroglyph of a hawk stood for the animal, representing its outer meaning. But it also had another meaning an inner or spiritual meaning, which is the cosmic function or the, you know, the cosmic function of the flight corresponding to the inner rise and fall of consciousness. Because of this, the hawk itself was a living hieroglyph. The symbol evokes this cosmic function and one who reads it properly, can participate in it or experience the forces behind its existence at work. This is about looking at and into the world, into the self. We have to real, really, really think and see symbolically to go back in history to see the answers that have been coded and preserved for progeny and prosperity. Through symbolism, we communicate with all that is, all forms of life, the divine creator, the universe. And this cosmic creation is filled with hidden intelligent fixed codes or scripts for us to discover, which ranges from something simple like jumping up and feeling the force of gravity pull you back down or something advanced like understanding what the great pyramids can do for our evolution and consciousness. And the reason we have the reason we have to go in or out to to discover these codes in the first place is because that's where we learn the depths of appreciation. Appreciation is one of the most ultimate gifts or forms of respect we can give to the artist who created this whole universe. And it's by doing the great work and aligning with the universal law. The way, I t the way I look at it is it's almost as if we were created for a purpose of potentially showing the creator what appreciation feels like. So putting the time into ourselves and appreciating is an ultimate form of respect of the higher self. A great philosopher by the name of Owen Barfield said that asking about the origin of language is like asking about the origin of origin. So in order to speak about the imagination, we must use our imagination. And in order to talk about language, we must use language. We can't stand apart from either one of them as detached observers as we can with something in the physical world. So we need to understand them from within. 
from, from the inside. I think many people can grasp the idea of the temple within, but have never been shown or guided to the discoverable beauty that's truly found there. This ability to look in the inner part of the world, to see it from the inside, is a central theme in the knowledge of the imagination. It reoccurs repeatedly throughout its history, appearing in many different expressions. This is important to understand because it's about orienting the mind and expanding in the, in the expanded range of consciousness to work with and then build off of. This is really how we deeply come to know who we truly are and why we're here. So using the spiritual tools, we can learn to unveil the mysteries, the my stories within, the realm of the esoteric, a few really important sacred sciences or archetypes that have been created to help man see the reflection of self are the esoteric mystery traditions such as esoteric tarot, the Kabbalistic tree of life, esoteric Freemasonry, and astrotheology, aka science of the solar mythos. I'm only going to cover some science from both astrotheology and Freemasonry in this presentation. So first I'd like you, the observer, to try a little experiment out. I want you to look at these two pillars. Now if you can, I want you to cross your eyes until you see one really highly defined pillar in the middle. Take your time and make sure your head and eyes are level so that both pictures create, you know, one solid image in the middle. <clears throat> now, you should be seeing a way more defined pillar than what you see when looking at each pillar regularly. Maybe, you, maybe you've tried this technique out before, but if you haven't, this experiment is actually called stereoscopy, which is a technique for creating or enhancing the illusion of depth in an image by means of stereopsis for binocular vision, 3D vision. The word stereoscopy derives from Greek stereos, which means firm or solid, and Scopio, to look, to see. It's a way of seeing three-dimensional. But the reason I'm having you try this idea, this, this, um, uh, this technique, is to help your imagination get the idea of two eyes or pillars coming together in order to have a higher resolution of seeing. Both hemispheres of the brain working in unison to gain a fuller clarity of understanding knowledge inwardly. So it's a reflection. It's a it's like an old 1990 box TV compared to a new, you know, 2021 4K flat screen. Right? The the definition is way better. And the reason for this is because technology advanced. Well, the same is true for our mind in evolution. As we individually advance inwardly, we evolve spiritually. We're able to see the unseen realm clearer. This is also about rising out of our sleep state to our awakened state. So, with that experiment, we are looking outwardly with eyes crossed, you know, to, to cause high definition of, of one pillar made by two. Now imagine with the tool of correspondence, imagine that experiment reflected inwardly. This is the spiritual reflection. So instead of both eyes crossing to find the definition of 
the one pillar, it's the two hemispheres of the brain symbolically coming together inwardly in unison to find clarity in what we know. Now, how is this done? It's done through knowledge, knowledge of the self, knowledge of aspects of both hemispheres, becoming conscious of both, both of our right and left brain. Here's another image to try out just for fun. Yeah, I, I really like this one a lot with the bird. It's got a lot of really cool depth. So to understand this inwardly is to understand spirituality and what is spirituality. In short, it is the science of moral and natural law. It is the quality of seeing dualistically, literally and symbolically. The whole universe is a symbolic unfoldment. Symbolically, spirituality is the ability of one who tears down the dogmatic walls within or who, you know, faces and transcends the illusions within. And this helps us gain higher resolution or wisdom. And higher a higher understanding so to better understand the science of self we have to work with and understand the science of esoteric Freemasonry Freemasonry in short is a system or science of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols the science of Freemasonry traces back its roots to the dawn of the Egyptian mysteries and is at the center of all mystery traditions. This sacred science requires higher knowledge of self brought to it along with the orienting power of imagination in order to render a solid spiritual house within. And as far as I'm concerned, this science allows one to align with the divine in the most conscious, intelligent way imag in imaginable. Freemasonry is really about the discovery of self. And in my opinion, the most beautiful way possible. I'm not going to cover this esoteric science in depth here, but... I'm going to show you this symbolic mirror. It's the spiritually symbolic house within you. It's you. This archetypal image is the esoteric science of self. Now, I know this whole presentation is probably really difficult for many people, especially if you're coming from a purely left brain modality. And believe me, I'm doing my best to really point everything out as logical as possible with the limited time I have. But what I'm going to say is, you know, looking at this image, you know, we see that it's also a carpet. So now bear with me on this next part. That's because it's a magic carpet. And it symbolizes the way we orient our mind or use our imagination to take us anywhere we want to go in, an, in our inward universe or mind. So remember, the universe is mental. The all is mind. So this magic carpet this magic carpet can basically take us anywhere we wish within the limitations of principles, the laws of creation. This image is what's known as a tracing or trestle board, which is the symbol for natural or moral law. Its allegorical name is the Temple of Solomon or, or Solomon's Temple. This is an esoteric reflection that helps us understand our temple within. 
Here we use the principle of correspondence, as within, so without. Left, uh, sorry, sorry, looking at the pillar with the sun on the on the left, and the and the pillar with the moon on the right, we see these are symbols that represent the sacred masculine brain on the left and the sacred feminine brain on the right. And this is where we use the principles of gender and polarity. This is where we bring the knowledge of the aspects of the left and right brain. This science is ultimately to help us find balance within, which is what the masculine blade symbol and the feminine chalice symbol coming together is really all about, which is unity. It's about balance. And when we bring knowledge to the to this image, this archetype, it this symbol, it helps us understand something deeply important about ourselves. You can look at it as a reflective esoteric encyclopedia. So the, the more you understand about the aspects of the sacred masculine and sacred uh, feminine pillars, the more you can pull from this image and the more your middle pillar of wisdom becomes defined with higher resolution, like the stereoscopic or stereoscopic, the stereoscopic 3D experiment I just had you try uh, a little bit ago. If you look at the the cube looking the cube looking stone between the middle and left pillar, that's equivalent to the old. 1990 TV and the goal is to evolve towards the 4k resolution TV which is about perfecting the ashlar like you see on the right between the right and middle pillar the ashlar being the cube this symbolizes our ability to refine what we know to visualize inwardly with a higher resolution. So now we're moving on to the destructive causation of the imagination. Our imaginations have been hacked <laughs> and it's our individual moral obligation to take it back. What disrupts and gets in the way of the imagination is ego. It's emotion and its belief. And what happens when ego gets in the way? The mind lives in the R complex of the brain. So survival mode, which is the perfect way for others to easily manipulate that kind of a mind. And the elitists or dark occult ruling class are professional psychologists who gladly fill most people's imagination with their mindset and their ideologies that keep us in this low egoic frequency. Much of humanity has become their conductors who unconsciously carry out their fantasies, their agendas towards what? World domination. And many people willfully carry this out just by you know willfully uh, ignoring these sciences while submitting to and supporting all the awful things that these dominators do to, to the people and the other two ways of manipulation are emotion and belief emotion being straight from the limbic part of the brain and the reactive part of us that doesn't look at things rationally. So reacting rather than envisioning or being rational, being in the moment. And then there's belief. What destroys or stagnates our vision to see further. And that belief may be based in someone else using your imagination. And it's about overcoming the authority that's been indoctrinated into us since birth. When your education limits your imagination, 
It's called indoctrination. A very powerful quote by Nikola Tesla, and it's extremely true. We are living in what's known as the Maya matrix. Maya meaning the illusion of reality and matrix meaning complex system of living inside that illusion we call life. So the phrase, the Maya matrix means reality as we know it, as we think we know it, which is a perception of life and not life itself. Now I'm, I'm going to cover many ways that our imagination is being manipulated. So whether we are aware of this or not, the ignorant masses are being force fed useful, useful garbage for the sole purpose of control. And as long as the masses stay in ignorance and obedience to these dominators, then they have them right where they want them. A suppressed human mind will explore only what it has come to know while struggling to think outside the box. There's the controlled opposition. This is where both sides, both dialectics, buy into one of the dialectics while endlessly imposing their will on each other through violence and the religion of authority. The political spectrum is a constant war zone and always has been. A conditioned, sorry, a condition of mind control that stifles consciousness is what that is. It keeps the masses spiritually bereft and in fear of one another. And this is taking place constantly and it is really really sad um, but it's because we don't know this information we don't understand the dialectics we don't understand the aspects of the light the left and right uh, hemispheres in consciousness and how else do they continue keeping the masses in a constant state of fear well one major way is selling the perpetual boogeyman or, you know, for, for more security, a.k.a. more enslavement. This is done through the Hegelian dialectic, a.k.a. problem-reaction-solution. They create and manipulate actual problems, which causes the reaction, the outcry, which generates the usual proxy solution. And some of the examples are the Muslims of 9-11, the bank collapse of 08, the 2012 Mayan calendar, you know, the end of days, and among many other things, the more recent coronavirus. This is what makes people allow this to happen. The worship of authority this is the monster destroyer of imagination actually and here is what keeps the masses in fear more than anything and it is the driver of a delusional life and that is money money makes a man act funny really and not really in a good way Money is most people's one true God, and people sure can use their imagination when it comes to what they do with the money that they would get or the money that they have, but can't imagine what they do without it. And that's a shame. You know, it's really sad. Many people will argue that, you know, that's just life. But actually, it's mind control. And by the way, the last five slides are screenshots I took from the film, the short film, In Shadow, created by Lubomir Arzov, who is brilliant. He's a brilliant animator and uh, 
brilliant mind. And this animation has so much true reflection of our society and how dark it has become. And of course, there's a beautiful, deep, positive spiritual solution, which makes it much more, um, much more awesome. Definitely check out that video if you haven't already. So what are many of the major destroyers of the imagination? Let's look at the abuse of entertainment, the ab use of entertainment. I'm pretty sure everyone watching this knows the mainstream news is a brainwashing session. More importantly, its purpose is to push and pull our imagination in all directions, north, east, west, and south. And each first letter of each direction spells the word news, anagrammatically. So it's an anagram. It's a word spell, broad cast. So the spell and the cast. To cast a spell because they are casting spells through the tell a vision with a news compass to keep the ignorant masses confused. And they do a really good job of it. And then there's the abuse of porn, where people are imagining themselves as the people on the screen. And I'm not saying it's wrong to watch other people fornicate, you know, but we have to understand how this addiction or easy route is used as a weapon. When it's abused, not only does it exhaust the brain of the important chemical called dopamine, but it disconnects the viewer from reality and degrades the potential strong relationships between men and women, making it much easier to be controlled. It really harms the imagination more than most of us know, actually. Then there's the abuse of video games. And I love playing video games, especially with friends and family. And, you know, I know it brings us together in a really fun, unique way. And it can, you know, definitely get addictive for sure. Many will argue that video games stimulate the qualities of imagination. And I, I don't completely agree. But it's about understanding that video games are a simulation that, when abused, keep the mind running away from reality. It's a way to run away from true purpose. And believe me, I know this very well. I was highly addicted. You couldn't get me to, to stop playing video games or, you know, get the controller out of my hand. I played... Madden and Halo and GTA all day, every day. And a little anecdote I'd like to share is I'm also a caricature artist and I wanted to make a caricature book. So I sat on that idea for over a year because I was too busy being glued to the game or the games and, and uh, you know, Halo and Madden and GTA and then I got you know the 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 ring of death on the Xbox so if you're not familiar with what that means my Xbox broke but it was the beginning of my new relationship with um, without video games and it was the best thing that ever happened to me at that time and I ended up finishing and publishing that caricature book so the other form of abuse is what we watch and how much of it we watch, like movies, TV shows, and sports. So watching all this is more than, you know, like when we're, you know, watching all these things and doing this more than working on ourselves, this is about autopiloting the true power of imagination. It's about allowing others um, it's about, uh, you know, allowing other forms of entertainment to run our mind and manifest what we absorb. You know, just th think of all the useless, trivial things we learn from these forms of entertainment. And yes, there is value in some of it. And 
yes, it's fun to use specific sayings for movies, and yes, sports is awesome to follow. But what's the worth in spiritual currency? What are where's where's the growth at in ourselves? The other forms of destruction upon the imagination is through forced radiation and chemicals. Anything that slows the mind and body down slows the imagination down. We are surrounded by 5G radiation towers now. We are sprayed with aerosols, you know, chemicals sprayed out of airplanes such as barium and strontium and aluminum. And those unevaporated lingering trails also literally block the sun, which is very wrong. But it also symbolically blocks out the light. The light to see with. So, literally and symbolically, cutting down our vision of the luminaries at night is what it also does. And our weather is modified by cloud seeding and the HARP program. We are also each destroying our imagination by large amounts of toxins we put into our bodies. We consume synthetic foods and drink lots of drinks that keep our body in a coma-like state where we aren't healthy. You know, we're not health conscious enough, you know, and becoming health conscious improves the imagination greatly as it generates an awareness of what's going in or on our body. Genetically modified foods or GMOs are very toxic, filled with hormone disruptors and covered in glyphosate, which is a dangerous cancer-causing agent. The, the, the word alcohol is derived from the word Alcool, known as a body eating spirit. This really slows you down and it destroys your liver, your kidneys, and memory over time. Now, even knowing that, I still love some good mezcal or bourbon, you know, but again, it, in healthy small amounts, not, not abused. People can put whatever they want into their body. It's their body, but no one has the right to force or bully shots into anyone else or limit food or travel to those who refuse to be inoculated. Besides, our inherent immune systems are highly badass and way more intelligent than, you know, what's in a needle. If, you know, someone, and, you know, um, and if someone is immune deficient, it's usually because of poor diet, too many shots from an early age, and not enough playing in the dirt. You know, being around lots of germs. And let's not forget the one ingredient that is the very destroyer of the physical organ associated with the imagination. And that is fluoride. Fluoride is the neurotoxic chemical added to tap water that, along with many other disastrous issues, calcifies the pineal gland, which then weakens the, the function that it has in connection to the imagination. It makes the mind numb. It makes it fogged and docile. And here's an esoteric piece of art called fluoride. Obviously, we see the play on the word fluoride as a pun, but it's not just a pun. It's a deeper truth, as fluoride is a revealing word in green language. Whether a moral phonetic message from the universe or mockery by the dark occult, it is clear that when consumed, fluoride directly calcifies the pineal gland, the, the third eye, which corresponds to the spiritual bereavement of man. Symbolically, the collective eye has wested into pure hell and chaos and materialism. Physically and spiritually, it is the mind docile 
and weakened for complete submission to dominators. The enormous destruction of the imagination is the fear of chaos as a result of no government. And a society that fears chaos more than losing freedom is a society that will lose 100% um, of... Sorry. And a society that fears chaos more than losing freedom is a society that will 100% fall into complete enslavement. I hear people say things like, you know, without government, people would be more dangerous and it would be a more chaotic environment. Or if there wasn't government, it would be boring and people would be too giddy and happy and, uh, and uh, utopia just isn't realistic. Well, first of all, I don't believe in any such thing as a utopia. And I also don't agree with the new agey idea of kumbaya. And saying it, you know, would be dangerous without government is illogical because government itself is dangerous. Very dangerous. Just look at the history of government and you'll quickly learn how dangerous it really is. With the power of imagination, one can envision or manifest a different condition than what's currently in place. The principle of mentalism helps us realize that for a different state or condition to manifest in the physical realm, it must first exist in the mind. And this is impossible when, one, when one's mind is in fear or their imagination is stagnated or used and manipulated by others. And here is the bane of freedom right here. Order followers. They carry out orders which manifest the order givers, ideas, and control structure. All order followers are bereft of their own imagination. They are pure conduits of all orders, whether moral or immoral, which is why it's impossible for them to employ conscience and do the right thing in the face of doing that which is wrong. And here is the rep, uh, representation of a top-down compart compartmentalized control system which is comprised of authority types in lockstep who take orders and give orders under the rulership of the hierarchy which consists of the dark occultists who hold a power differential over the rest because they possess the highest level of occult knowledge and a full understanding of how the control, stru control structure operates. We have to see the control structure for what it really is. A disease. A disease of the mind. A disease of the heart. And a disease of the soul. They control others in fear. Out of fear. It has nothing to do with looking out for, you know, the best interests of others. Not at all. It never has been that way. It's, it, you know, it's, it's not operating from the neocortex of the brain where higher learning and higher thinking takes place, where there's actual order. And it's not aware of what's happening within the self and around the self in which it operates. It's not conscious. The mind is not conscious. And, you know, like I've said before, if we are operating in fear and confusion, then we are operating out of the R complex, the lower reptile part of the brain. And staying in fear and confusion keeps us in survival mode where we don't critically think. We're just in fight or flight. We're in fight or flight mode. Completely right where we are wanted for these control structures to function. And, you know, 
just becoming conscious of this information is the start of having the power to tear these structures down in the mind because that's where they are that's where they're planted and conditioned and they want them to be kept there and grown you know what prevents us from realizing the control structure and understanding the hidden knowledge that it that it works through is mind control we've been conditioned to not care to not love to hate to not think for ourselves to only imagine what they want us to see and this is all due to being separate in the mind it's a conditioned illusion of being separate it's division separate from nature separate from source separate from true self-love the dominators who erect the dark pyramid control structures around our world are only able to do so by manipulating and controlling how we think and how we feel through mind control that's how they get their agendas done it's about hijacking um, you know the imagination to the point where one never questions anything and they comply with and obey authority authority and you know and has no vision of how things could be other than how and what they are right now it's about keeping those who don't use their imagination comfortable and where they're wanted at in the mind for as long as they're wanted there this is ultimately what mind control is all about so no one has the right to control others and this is what needs to deeply be understood we have to understand our rights in nature and that's what this next part is really all about the intelligent measurement of human behavior one of the many reasons most people won't imagine a real solution to the suffering of this world or won't imagine a world without government is because they either don't know about natural law or they willfully ignore this science like gravity natural law is an unseen condition that we can really only understand by its effects and I'm only going to briefly explain this it's one of the most if not the most important pieces of information anyone could ever learn and align with it is the governing dynamic that intelligently measures all behavior of in, of beings with the capacity of understanding the difference between harmful and non harmful behavior that's humans this so so this cosmic or moral law this non man made eternal and immutable condition governs consequences of these harmful and non-harmful behaviors it is the binding conditions of behavior and all humans are bound to this condition yes we have the random component of free will choice to do as we please but we do not escape the determined consequences of our free will actions imagination used in conjunction with the hermetic principles retrospect and pattern recognition helps one to understand how the whole human behavioral system is governed it's about understanding that every action we take is intelligently measured and reflected back unto us individually and collectively with it within a certain intelligently timed period what we admit is what we attract and this includes supporting something that is good or something that is bad does the action we individually initiate cause harm or does it not natural law or moral law is what governs and measures these actions if we didn't have moral law we could do whatever we wanted and get away with it with the most evil harmful actions known to man with no consequences obviously everybody knows that's not true 
but we are bound by natural law, whether we believe this to be so or not. This is how we learn our life lessons. It's exactly why it's there, why it exists. It's mechanized perfectly to help us learn our lessons. I'm going to paint a simple mathematical equation to help your mind of the way in which we find out what inherent rights are by re recognizing what wrongdoings are. And this is something I feel anyone who understands natural law can use to paint a picture in people's minds in a simple way. I've made this slide to help with this equation. Rights can be known by understanding what wrongdoings are through the apoph apophatic method, affirmation through negation. So we can look at it like this. Think about nearly an infinite amount of pizzas, right? And they pretty much all have red sauce only. But seven of them also have pineapple. Well, if there are seven red sauce pizzas with pineapple, then that suggests that all the rest of the pizzas are red sauce pizzas only. Right? Okay, so seven of those are pineapple. It's the same idea when using the apophatic method to discover rights, simply by understanding what wrongdoings are, or, you know, uh, what, what pizzas are covered in pineapple. But obviously, in the case of rights, there's nearly infinitely way more red sauce pizzas. There are seven transgressions, or wrongdoings, and then all the all the other actions in the universe are rights. So the understanding of natural law is centered upon bringing our own conscience into alignment with objective morality. So choosing right behavior over wrong behavior, which means definitely knowing which behaviors are rights because they do not cause harm to other sentient beings. And then understanding that behaviors that are wrong are the behaviors that do cause harm to other sentient beings, which are, you know, like I just showed, you know, murder, rape, trespassing, coercion, theft, uh, assault, and willfully lying. Not understanding this is why most people are being manipulated, why most people's imaginations are being used to usher in world domination. Any societies of humans, human beings that believes there isn't a natural objective difference between right and wrong behavior and believe that human beings are arbitrarily or can arbitrarily create or decide or dictate what right and wrong are for themselves and others is a society that can never truly be free. This is a society that embraces moral relativism. And this is why moral relativism is the destroyer of all freedom. Symbolically, from the ancient Egyptian priest class, morality is all about acting on the square. This is why an angle of a 90 degree square is a right angle. So it's to act rightly, to act justly and truthfully, or to act according to Ma'at, the goddess of law, the goddess of justice and truth. Ma'at is founded on the Masonic square. So, looking at the papyrus, the square is the seat of Osiris, the god of the dead and underworld, in the judgment hall, where all are judged from the past, and must be found perfect before they could proceed further towards bliss. This is, this is just a scientific expression of the workings of moral law through archetypes from our, you know, ancient Egyptian brethren. Symbolically, this shows the seat 
for judgment of objective right from wrong, to bring the material into perfect form and to reject that which is not perfect and to build on the square forever as a fourfold foundation. In other words, I look at this as meaning to build on a firm foundation of the, you know, the, the understanding of natural law and then working outwardly aligned in thought, emotion, and action. And that which is not perfect is the immoral transgressions of natural law, moral law. So now we're moving on to reillumination of, or sorry, just reillumination. And reillumination is also rebirth of the sacred feminine, aka generative principle, aka restoring the lost knowledge of the ancient Egyptian mythos. And all of this can be summed up in what's known as the lost principle. The generative principle, which is the eighth hidden principle, symbolic of true care. This principle encapsulates or contains all seven of the hermetic principles. The symbol for this is the circle that encompasses the seed of life. The seed is the generator. It creates. So the, gener the generative principle governs creation. It is the causal factor that goes into effect and generates the result of what we focus on and give our inner G to, give our time and attention to. This is the equivalent to true care. I've tried to, you know, talk about these subjects with many people and, you know, what's going on in the world. And you know what most of them say? I don't care. And it's one of the saddest things I've ever heard. But what's interesting is most of these types of people have no problem being told what to care about by their tell-lie vision and local authorities. And what physical body, body part is symbolic of care? It's the heart, right? So we have to fix reignite or rekindle our collectively broken, scattered, dismembered heart back together, back to fire in the middle, balance. And the more we individually focus our attention on this, the more we s that we'll see a huge shift in the overall collective consciousness, a shift towards what we say we want, which is truth and freedom. And this takes courage, courage to look, to listen, to research, to talk, and, you know, write about what truly matters on a day-to-day -day basis, which acts as a driving force of our thoughts, emotions, and actions, which manifests into our reality. This is a huge, important part of reilluminating the imagination. The generative principle is associated with the sacred feminine. Therefore, when we realize that the sacred feminine energy, our care of the world has, has and still is being systematically destroyed, then we come to understand the importance of restoring that care back into our lives, back into our hearts. And this, is, this isn't to say the sacred masculine isn't being brought to its knees either. It's equally important to understand, but I'll explain that in a, uh, another episode on the podcast. So the sunrise is a big part in understanding the relumination symbol. The ancient Egyptian solar messiah archetypal god Horus rises from the horizon into midday and, and or Midsummer, converting into the god Ra. The ancient Egyptian solar god Ra represented the sun and the Most High, or the uh, Imperium, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, Imperion, whose symbol was the solar disk as well as the circle with the dot in the middle. 
This took place during the early phases of, of the solar mythos around 40,000 years ago, 40,000 BC. Symbolically, Ra represented fully raised or fully enlightened, which is what a human can only strive for. So the aspects in the circle dot symbol of Ra is really important to pay attention to. When, when we look at the word pyramid, we know that when broken down etymologically, it comes from the Greek pyra, which means fire, and then mid, meaning in the middle. So the middle fire or fire in the middle. And this corresponds to the heart. It corresponds to the Anahata heart chakra, the middle chakra. And it corresponds to the middle pillar. This is the symbol of care. The fire in the middle needs restored. Care needs restored. Knowledge of what comes with the pyramids and all that is stored in them is about reigniting, reilluminating the fire in the middle. This takes the higher imagination to understand, especially because so much of this vital knowledge has been lost or occulted on purpose. Okay, now there's also some green language here that actually leads to some science and math regarding the, the Great Pyramids. And that is, you can also say, Pyramid is pi ra mid. Pi as in the, the Greek number, the 16th number, as in the mathematical constant or infinite. And what is pi? We know it's the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. So this means the circumference of a circle is a little tiny bit more than three times as long as as its diameter the base of the great pi ra mid is a square whose perimeter is equal to the circumference of a circle with a radius that's equal to the height of the great pyramid so two times pi or uh, 3.14 times the radius which is 481 feet equals the circumference, which is 3020.68. Also, keep in mind the ancient Egyptians measured in cubits, or, yeah, cubits, <clears throat> not inches like what we see here. Ra is also the symbol of the arch as pi. Pi is also referred to as Archimedes, constant. So, what the great Pi Ra Mids really are is a corresponding temple to the human soul, the unfoldment of the human soul. And this is greatly what I mean with the title of this presentation. The archway is the solar path of the sun, east to west. So, um, <clears throat> I would postulate this is symbolically about being balanced and fully raised and aligned in the heart to the mind. It's about the restoration of true care because it brings us back to fertility rights with our ultimate responsibility as stewards of this planet. When one cares enough to begin to understand why the, pyra the Great Pyramids were built, there will be great inspiration to restore the higher knowledge that was lost because it holds very powerful keys to human sovereignty, a.k.a. freedom. And there's way more to that, of course. We have to keep in mind that this is all dealing with the solar mythos, doctrine, post-stellar and lunar mythos. <clears throat> And in my honest opinion, some of the most important knowledge of ourselves that we could ever learn about is found in the mystery of astrotheology, 
the science of the esoteric zodiac wheel. This wheel is a correspondence to seasons, to the earth cycle, to the cycles of the earth, to some powerful allegories, including the flight of Horus, the cross of Jesus, King Arthur's round table, Hiram Abith, and it corresponds to fertility and especially to human evolution and consciousness. There's a reason why our ancient ancestors recorded the day sky and the night sky and then created archetypes to help humanity understand light and dark, to help us recognize how to survive through understanding cycles. So corresponding the zodiac with our consciousness is key to reilluminating the imagination because it is about seeing the parallels of coming up in consciousness to higher degrees to be able to see and understand the sciences of our ancient brethren who were masters at understanding and aligning with it and who lived harmonious. Way more harmonious than us in these days. So aligning to this wheel was an alignment to the cycles of the inner and outer life. And of course, in a really fragmented way, we still are, and, but you know, with no real understanding of it. And some people might say, well, isn't it just you know, people aligning to something man-made? No, because we're actually aligning to a science of nature. We have to understand the difference between what is man-made that aligns in nature and what is man-made that is solely to benefit man's ego. So aside from all the other important allegorical sciences regarding the zodiac, there's one in particular that has everything to do with reilluminating, and it's when we think of the Easter holiday, it's, it's what many people believe is an actual historical event where a dead Messiah named Jesus rose from the dead out of a tomb. And I find it interesting that not too many pe people question this as, you know, you know, uh, not too many people question this as well as wonder why these theories or why there's no specific date for this event, even though it's specifically in April. So first, I think it's important to lay some important foundations regarding this science. The ancient Egyptians courted the circle with a cross to create the four seasons to better understand the nature of a full earth cycle around the sun. Of course, they also understood this was in direct correspondence to the hero myth, going from ignorance, you know, death, darkness, or birth, and then springing on to growth and illumination, which is about enlightenment or light, the sun's peak in the day sky of the summer solstice, like the, the, like the god Ra, also like, you know, what I was telling you about the hero's journey. Then on to the autumn equinox, which is fall or falling asleep or back down to coldness, decay, and or eventually death. When it comes to astrotheology, it's important to pay attention to numbers, to seasons, to zootypes, solar, uh, stellar, and lunar positions, and how, it's, how it corresponds to allegories, like the hero's journey of Jesus or Horus. It's about morality, and how symbols help us understand the inner and outer world. It's about the solar ecliptic path of the sun and how it moves through each zodiacal house to help understand um, agriculture better. The ecliptic is an imaginary line on the sky that marks the annual path of the sun. It's the projection of Earth's orbit onto the celestial sphere. It's about the sun seemingly moving through each constellation of each house of the zodiac, the zodiac. It's a it's how we understand agriculture through knowing the seasons of when to plant and when to harvest. It's about fertility, seeing patterns naturally when it comes to 
time to plant. So the sun is the principal symbol of deity and represents order, life, resurrection, fertility, and inward illumination of the soul. And, um, you know, of course, the archetypal Jesus and Horus are venerated as the sun in the zodiac. The spring equinox represents birth and rising out of the dark or dead from the horizon or Horus zone or Horus risen. The rising sun or light. It's about regeneration, when to plant and the beginning of the spiritual journey. It's important to know about the about December 21st as the following three days are shortest in sunlight and the longest in darkness. This is when it is said that the sun, the S-U-N or S-O-N, dies upon the cross of the zodiac. Then as many of us know, the sun is born on the 25th where it is visibly noticeable that the sun is born and has risen again in the north the northeastern hemisphere you could also say the three days following this following his death are cor correlating the three houses uh following the the winter solstice including capricorn aquarius and pisces and Aquarius being the water bearer with the child about to break the, the water out of the womb. And Pisces being all about the birth canal, which you, you should be able to, you know, clearly make the connection in the drawing. It's the symbol of the yoni or vagina. And it's important to note that... Easter Sunday, East Star Sun Day, occurs on the Sunday in April after the first full moon in the spring, symbolizing the lunar goddess Isis, a.k.a. Mother Mary, is full because she's pregnant with her son, her, the S-U-N. The, so, the light, she's pregnant with the light. Jesus, a.k.a. Horus which is born in Aries, the, you know, the ram symbol, symbolizing the female reproductive organs. He then springs or rises again into the northeastern hemisphere out of his tomb or womb, either way, out of darkness. This is 100% also about reilluminating. This is the time of the year when we are recharged, we're replenished, we're recycled, and when we are able to generate the most energy to be able, you know, to be our liveliest in the summer. And the more we care to know this science, the more creatively charged we become. The, the imagination becomes more developed. It's like the symbolic nature of the seed conference. And, you know, there's a symbolic reason Brandon has these conferences at this time of the year. We are planting seeds for growth at a time when planting seeds works best because it's spring. And this holiday ritual of East Star Sunday, the rising sun from east this ritual happens to fall within a 40-day time period between March 19th to May 1st, what's known as the season of sacrifice, expressed by the dark occult ruling class, basically, who run this world. And these dark occultists, these sorcerers, are high-level, selfish, psychopathic dominators who do wicked levels of sorcery, dark magic, generating and manipulating horrific events during this time period as a symbolic way of preventing rebirth of light, of fertility, of illumination. It's about symbolically cutting off any rebirth or rising from the dead. 
And these acts are to keep the consciousness of the people in a low vibration of fear. It's pure evil. But they know as long as we don't understand the mysteries, the my stories, we will always buy their his stories and their base desirables. Those who don't know the esoteric sciences of self are easily manipulated and stay confused in perpetual bondage. One last thing about relumination I want to add before I go to the next topic is the importance of taking notes. We must care enough to take notes. And that's something I can't stress enough. And, it, and, it, and it's really, it's really important because it really does fuel the imagination. So to align with truth automatically aligns us with those who are aligned as well. And this has nothing to do with groupthink. There is no authority higher than truth. This is why you can't believe me or anyone else. You have to do your own research. You have to see for yourself. We have to remember that we're not here to live according to his story. We're here to unveil and unfold the my story, the mystery. Each one of us is solely the authority, the authority of our own individual self. No one has the right to rule over another or be ruled by another. We are the authors who write our own lives with our own imagination, bound by the laws within, within creation. We are all naturally and inherently sovereign beings, and that's the truth in nature. And I know it doesn't seem that way, but it's true. The ruling class of this world have really done a great job at making most of us believe the contrary, which is why there's so much suffering. To have authority of self is about being the internal monarch not a ruler over others, and not ruled by others. The state in which one controls only one's own thoughts, emotions, and actions, and doing this by bringing them into alignment and non-contradiction accomplishes mastery of one's own consciousness being unified and not living dualistically. It's about having control. It's about having mastery and ownership over self and recognizing we're not here to be ruled. We're not here to be owned or a slave by someone else. So to be sovereign, which we are, means not a slave. So allowing our faith, trust, and imagination in the hands of the authority of man never works, never works out well, and can never bring about true freedom. Imagination, um, sorry, imagine a selfless world that you want to live in within the laws of nature a world not inspired by selfish ego. Things that I imagine that I find to be very realistic and based in natural law are, well, and, you know, this is not everything that I imagine, but I imagine way more people understanding and aligning to natural law. You know, no slavery of any kind. That's what I imagine, you know, more pineal glands activating at their highest potential, order followers quitting their jobs, their cults, more bartering, free Tesla energy, hemp used to make many, 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 many things, cultivating much of our own food, collectively, you know, um, 
collective cur uh, courage to defend what's right, making more time and attention for the self, more you know, reading and healing esoterically, volunteering, no more slaughterhouses, logical conversation, balance, and restore the pyramids into our hearts. And like I said, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more that I imagine. So that is, that concludes my presentation. And I deeply thank you for making it all the way through. And I highly hope that it has brought uh, clarity into your mind and into your heart. Much love, much agape. Thank you. If you're looking to further understand the mind, consciousness, the occult, symbolism, the ancient Egyptian mythos, philosophy, and truth discovery, make sure to tune in to the Cubbyhole podcast hosted by myself, Nate Cap, and co-hosted by Brandon Martin. The Cubbyhole podcast is a repository of critical knowledge that deals with and covers the many facets of the human condition, especially what causes most of the suffering going on in this world. Make sure to start at podcast number one and work your way forward for maximum value and understanding. The Cubbyhole podcast is found on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple, TuneIn Radio, Simplecast, and Cubbyhole.com. That's C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. The intention of Natural Freedom League is to expand the understanding of natural law, which is based on objective morality, and to expose the illegitimacy of the belief in authority, and thus the inherent immorality of all government. We be the Natural Freedom League, cause we become no longer unbegun, we seek in the wisdom, and that's why we did come to this prison of prism, and that's why the beat thumps, and that's why we speak up, we be the Natural Freedom League. Cause we become no longer unbegun We seek in the wisdom And that's why we did come to this prison A prism And that's why the beat thumps And that's why we speak up We beat up
Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to a little mid-afternoon meditation today. So glad you're here, and I'm honored and grateful to be part of this amazing group of people uh, ready to go out and change the world and make it a better place. So thank you so much for joining today. I uh, wanted to do a little meditation to help integrate and embody our spirits back in. Uh, one of the things that I have found over time, my name is Regina Zwilling, I should probably tell you that part. One of the things that I found over time is um, that trauma right, uh, tends to disconnect us from our So we don't have time to go into all the reasons and all the ways that that's happened over, over the years. But it is something that affects us all uh, one to one degree or another. So in our meditation today, I wanted to go into bringing our spirit back in, right? connecting our spirit back into our bodies, embodying that feeling of knowing that comes right? when we're really connected uh, deeply integrated with our spirits. And one of the ways we can do that is through breath. Uh, over the years, uh, over the many, many cultures, the words breath and spirit have often been the same or very closely related. So let's go ahead and start by taking some deep breaths. You can make yourself comfortable, comfortable seated position or lying down, whatever feels best to you. And gently close your eyes, just getting comfortable. Noticing, just noticing your breath, noticing the inhale and the exhale. Not trying to change anything just yet, just feeling it, just noticing. And just feeling the Breath coming in, following it in through your nose, feeling the cool air as it comes in. And as you exhale, feeling the warmth of the air as it weaves right through your nostrils. Really tuning in to the sensations of breathing. And now go ahead and bring your hands on your belly and chest. So one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest, no matter which one goes where. Eyes still gently closed. And start to feel, whichever hand is on your belly, feel that hand start to rise as you inhale. And then notice how the hand on your chest starts to rise as you deepen the breath. And at the top of your inhale, take a little pause. And with your exhale, feeling the hand on your chest starting to gently go back down, followed by the hand on your belly. And again, inhaling, feeling the hand on your belly rise. Hand on your chest rises as you continue the in-breath. And with your exhale, the hand on your chest starts to gently go down, followed by the hand on your belly. Another breath like that, inhaling, hand on your belly rises. Hand on your chest, lifts up. And exhaling. Hand on your chest goes down, hand on your belly goes down. And if you find it helpful to keep your hands there to stay connected to that deep, deep breathing, please uh, do that. If it feels more comfortable, place your hands, palms up on your legs or by your sides or just whatever feels comfortable. And go ahead and 
place your hands in whatever is the most comfortable position for yourself. But keep that deep breathing, keep that full inhale. And that soft exhale. And notice, just after a few simple deep breaths, notice the difference in your body and your mind. Your body starting to feel a little bit more relaxed just by focusing on the breath. Maybe your mind is starting to quiet down, the thoughts are slowing. And it's one of the beautiful things about breath is it's always there for us no matter what the situation no matter what's going on we always have the breath with us to calm our bodies soothe our nervous systems quiet our minds there's in that calm place where we can think clearly now keeping your breath going Start to bring your awareness down to your tailbone, at the very tip of your spine. This is our connection to earth, our root chakra. As you breathe, feel for bringing your breath now all the way down to the tailbone. We are, as humans, we are both matter made of earth and spirit. We are that combination. So connecting here to the root chakra, that, that connection to earth, connection to Mother Gaia that sustains us, that gives us life. And feeling that connection and start to draw the energy from your tailbone down into the heart of the earth, down into that fiery center of Mother Gaia. And connecting to that energy, the groundedness, the strength. That Mother Gaia always is ready to offer to us. As you breathe and strengthen that connection, send your love and gratitude down to the earth for all that she provides for us. And feel, maybe you can start to refine your awareness, focus your awareness to feel the energy of, of earth, of Mother Gaia. Right, reaching back to you, feeling her love come back to you as you breathe down, offer your love and gratitude, and she's offering that same back to you. And with each inhale, feeling that connection growing, feeling the strength of the, of the energy building. And with each exhale, feeling your body soften, feeling muscles relax, and the mind continue to quiet and slow down. And this is where we can really focus our awareness internally. Well, this root chakra at the base of our spine is our connection to earth. It's our connection to groundedness, our connection to security, our connection to strength. And keep that connection and then start to breathe into your second chakra located just below your belly button. This is our place of creativity, our place of sexuality. And feeling that space just below your belly button expanding as you inhale. And so many of us are 
disconnected from our creativity, our imagination. Use this opportunity to feel the energy in the center. Feel how your deep breathing, when you draw the breath all the way down into the center, helps to wake it up, helps to enliven it. And our creativity is our ability to literally create. What do we want to create in the world? What did you come here in, in human form to create in this lifetime? Connecting to that, feeling the breath. Opening up this area, bringing energy, bringing life, bringing awareness. And staying connected now to both root chakra and the second chakra, it's the chakra of creativity and sexuality. And now to the third chakra, the solar plexus, located about an inch or two just below the breastbone. This is our place of personal power. our place of making our way in the world with confidence, with knowing. And another place where we get very disconnected in terms of being able to manifest our reality, manifest our desires, manifest the creations that we've come here to, to make in this world. looking around at the world around us and what we've created and saying, no, this isn't what I want. And so here's your opportunity to connect to what it is you do want, connect to the strength, connect to the, the power, the energy within to create the life in the world that you want to see. And we do that by connecting right, to our creativity, and connecting to our roots to have the have the strength to manifest what we desire in this world because it's up to us right? we are the ones who get to choose so taking that power back into our own hands to choose every day every moment every breath Keep that deep breath going, inhaling fully. Exhaling, softening. And using the breath to create space and opening around these energy centers in our body. And we create this space around the energy centers for spirit, for our spirits to come in and inhabit. So feel the breath swirling in these centers, feel the energy waking up here. And then bringing your awareness now to the fourth energy center, fourth chakra, it's our heart. Our heart right in the middle of our lower three and upper three chakras. Our heart is the integration point of our physical and our spiritual. 
and breathe into it here. Really feel the expansion in your chest as you take a deep breath in. If you put your hands down, now's a good time. We create layers of protection around our hearts. And as we go through life, protecting the tenderness, the openness that we come in with. When we're little babies, trusting, open, loving, with no shields. And as we go through life, we learn to armor up our hearts out of protection. Protecting ourselves when we're not protected by those around us. Use this opportunity to breathe into these layers of protection and find out if they're ready to let go. Find out if they're ready to loosen up a little bit. And with your exhale, let some of the protection go if it feels ready, if it feels safe. And breathe into the back of your heart here as well. We put a lot of our, a lot of our traumas, a lot of our broken dreams, a lot of our disappointments in the back of our heart, out of sight, out of mind, as they say. And bring your awareness space between your shoulder blades and breathe so that you feel the expansion there and the area just behind your heart opening up and expanding When our root chakras are firmly grounded and rooted and we feel safe, when our second chakra of creativity is, is open and we're creating and using our personal power of the ego to create the life we want, our, our hearts tend to open up. As you breathe here, feel this connection, these first four energy centers in your body. Feeling the energy moving up and down from the base of your spine, all the way up the spine to your heart center here. And bring your awareness up to the throat chakra. And our fifth chakra. It's our place of speaking our truth. And many of us hold our voices back and we don't speak our truth because we're, we're afraid, we're scared of what others might think. We're scared of being judged, not wanting to rock the boat, not sure we know enough to speak from a place of authority. we connect to our heart and speak our truth from that place of, of love and openness, the words flow and they just come. And when we stand in our power and our third chakra, we know that when we speak from a place of love and truth and openness, that we need to speak those words, regardless of how another may take them, may understand them. Notice if there's blockages, notice if there's tightness, or if there's something feels stuck in your throat here.
And use your breath once again to open up, create space. A little bit of opening here for spirit to come in. Spirit to come in and inhabit. A place of speaking our truth. And when we start to focus on this fifth chakra, our throat, there's a tendency for our jaws to tighten. So feel for letting your jaw soften and maybe even letting it hang heavy a little bit here. Consciously choosing to allow a little bit of softness, a little bit of space. And that can sometimes take courage. The energy of our hearts, make that courage to open up and speak our truth. As you take an inhale here and connect all of these energy centers, and bring the energy of the heart up into your throat chakra, the energy of courage. Courage to speak your truth. Now bringing your awareness up to the third eye center. In place of the pineal gland, our place of intuition, our place of knowing, our place of imagination, our inner sight. Take a deep breath up into your forehead now and soften the muscles in your forehead. Soften the muscles around your eyes. And our imagination is our ability to imagine a new world. Imagine what it is we want to create. Imagine how we want to use our personal power in the world. Our imagination may be our greatest gift as humans. Whatever we can imagine or we can create, we have that ability. Breathe into your third eye. Opening it up. Opening up that intuition, that knowing. It is always available to us when we, when we focus our awareness there. Keep the breath flowing full and deep. Inhaling, feeling the expansiveness in your belly and your ribs and your lungs. And softly exhaling. Notice as you continue this deep breathing and this connection, this focus and awareness on each of these energy centers, what comes up, letting any energy that comes up, any emotions, letting them flow freely and maybe exhaling out whatever's ready to be released. And we don't pay attention to our emotions or when we just stuff them down, we don't speak our truth, we armor our energy centers 
that stuck energy can lead to confusion, lead to disease, lead to all sorts of things that hold us back. So here's an opportunity to let whatever is ready to go, go. Let it release if it's ready. Take a few more deep breaths. Knowing that it's a process. Being grateful for whatever is ready to be released and move on. And grateful for the experiences that have brought you to this point here today. And now, bring your awareness up to the crown of your head. This is our seventh chakra. This is our connection to source energy, source creator. Whatever that means to you. You can use the word God, creation, source. This is our connection to our spirits. Taking a deep breath and bringing your awareness, your focus of attention into that space at the crown of your head. And as you take these deep breaths, notice how the energy can flow up to the crown of your head. You're really feeling it, directing it up there. You may feel a warmth or a tingling or a, you know, a vibration, an electrical sensation, whatever it is, deepen your breath and focus your attention even more. Notice how that helps it to grow and strengthen. And just as you Brought your energy down to the heart of Mother Gaia. Keeping that connection. Now start to draw your energy up to source. This place of unconditional love and acceptance. As you feel your energy reaching up to source, feel source reaching back to you. Feel this energy pouring down from source into the crown of your head. Filling you up. And keep your breath flowing deep to draw this energy in. And letting the energy pour down from source all the way down through your spine down through your root chakra, down into the earth. And then feeling the energy from earth, like reaching back up through the root chakra, up through your spine, out through the crown of your head, back up to source. And this is the truth of who we are. We are the conduit between earth and source. And that's powerful. I feel that energy, feel that power flowing through you here as, as earth, as matter, mother, Gaia, and source flow through you. Mixing, joining, flowing through. 
And the place where they join together and flow together is in your heart center. Now using your breath, drawing this energy into your heart center, into the space you've created around your heart. And drawing it in. And feeling as your heart beats, feeling this energy expand outwards, soaking into every cell of your body, right down to your DNA. Filling you up. And now this energy as you inhale, feel the energy expand beyond the confines of your physical body. And starting to fill the space around your skin. Growing stronger, growing brighter, growing bigger. And it's growing so strong that it's, it's reaching out into the space around you. Reaching out 10 feet around your body. Reaching out 50 feet around your body. Until this energy starts to gain speed and momentum. And reaching out and connecting with all the other people who are listening in and joining in on this meditation today. And joining the strength of our energy. Growing it together. Building it, strengthening it, feeling that energy grow. Right? This, this is the truth of who you are, of who we are right, as humans. this connection with our spirits, this connection with each other. And this is the power that we, that we hold within ourselves. We breathe it in, feel it. And feel the energy in your body, feel the energy in your hands. This is the energy of spirit filling you. Your spirit filling up, filling up your physical body, your physical matter. And spirit is always always waiting for us, always here, ready, ready to be with us, ready to guide us, ready to work with us, to create, create together. Now starting to draw your energy back into your own, your own space, your own body, and keeping the connection, keeping the connection with the earth, with source, with your spirit, and with all the others that you've touched here today. Nice your hands back over your heart both hands and tuning back into the energy and notice how it's shifted. Notice how it's changed since starting this meditation just a few short moments ago. Feeling the energy of your hands pouring into your heart and the energy of your heart pour back into your hands.
And then taking this energy and placing your palms together at the center of your chest. Bowing our heads for a moment of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to be here together. Gratitude for the opportunity to be here in human form, right, in a physical body with all the joy, all the challenges right, that that entails. Because really the two are the same, the joys and the challenges. And gratitude to each and every one of you for taking the time to join me here today. From my heart to yours, I say thank you so much. Much love, many blessings.